No other book of the New Testament evokes the same fascination as the book of Revelation. Attempts at its exposition are almost without number, yet there continues the widest divergence of interpretation. Because the book reveals truth relative to every important fundamental of Christian theology, it is inevitable that its interpretation be influenced by the contemporary confusion in biblical scholarship, especially in the realm of eschatology. In some sense, the book is the conclusion to all previous biblical revelation and logically reflects the interpretation of the rest of the Bible. The expositor is faced with innumerable hermeneutical decisions before beginning the task of understanding the peculiar contribution of the book of Revelation, an undertaking made more difficult by the fact that his decisions not only color the exposition of the book itself, but also in a sense constitute an interpretation of all that precedes it in the scriptures. Even a casual reader of the book of Revelation is impressed with the tremendous scope of its prophecies. Here is obviously an important book one intended by God to be a final word to man. The great truths treated are the termini for lines of revelation beginning in some cases in the book of Genesis and continuing throughout scripture. Most important is the revelation concerning Jesus Christ, introduced as the major theme of the book in the first verse. If for no other reason, the book is important as the final chapter in scriptural self-disclosure of God through Jesus Christ. In earlier books of the Bible, Christ is introduced in the Messianic prophecies and the activities of the angel of Jehovah in the Old Testament. The revelation of Jesus Christ is advanced in the Gospels and the Acts, which unfold the birth, life, ministry, death, resurrection, and ascension of the Son of God. The epistles add the theological interpretation of the person and work of Christ. To all of this dramatic and tremendously significant revelation, the last book of the Bible provides the capstone. It is indeed the revelation of Jesus Christ not only as the Lamb that was slain, a familiar portrayal in the book, but as King of kings and Lord of lords who is certain to return to the earth in power and glory to judge the wicked and reward the righteous. The book of Revelation is the counterpart of the Gospels, Christ in his glory in contrast to Christ in his humiliation and death. It is implicit in any Orthodox Protestant approach to the scriptures to hold that the Bible was intended to be understood. What is true of other scriptures is also true of the book of Revelation. However, it is too much to assume that the book, like the Old Testament apocalyptic books and prophecy generally, was intended to be comprehended fully by believers in the early church. As history unfolds and as prophecy is fulfilled in the future, much will be understood that could be only dimly comprehended by the first readers of the book. But even to early Christians, the main facts were clear. The climax of human history was to involve a period of great suffering which would be worse than any of the trials which afflicted the church previously. The ultimate triumph of the saints and the final victory of our Lord Jesus Christ are plainly written in the book of Revelation for all to comprehend. Saints of all ages can be assured of the certainty of their hope which today shines brighter than ever in view of the approaching end of the age. The book of Revelation, like all other unfulfilled prophecy, provides particular instruction to the generation which will see its fulfillment, and it constitutes general exhortation and encouragement for those who await the coming day. The expositor of the Revelation is inevitably forced to choose one of the systems of interpretation which have emerged in the history of the church as a proper approach to this last book of the Bible. The author has assumed that this book should be interpreted according to the normal rules of hermeneutics rather than as a special case. The prophetic utterance of the book has therefore been taken in its ordinary meaning unless the immediate context or the total revelation of the book indicates that terms are being used in a symbolic sense, as they frequently are in apocalyptic writings. Instead of assuming that the interpretation should be non-literal unless there is proof to the contrary, the opposite approach has been taken, namely, that terms should be understood in their ordinary meaning unless contrary evidence is adduced. Hence stars are stars, earthquakes are earthquakes, etc., unless it is clear that something else is intended. The result has been a more literal interpretation of prophecy and revelation in general and a clearer picture of end-time events than is frequently held by expositors. 
To avoid constant quotation of scripture in the exposition, the authorized version of the Bible has been inserted before each section. Although the received text on which the authorized version is based has more textual problems than any other section of the New Testament, no other translation based on improved texts has achieved the stature of being used by the majority of Bible students. Therefore, it was considered adequate to introduce textual changes where these affect the meaning, surprisingly few instances in comparison to the many variations in the text of Revelation. The Nestle Greek text was used with its critical apparatus unless otherwise indicated. In definition of words and in author's translations, though other lexicons were consulted, a Greek-English lexicon of the New Testament by W. F. Arndt and F. W. Gingrich was generally followed. While many expositions of the Book of Revelation and volumes providing collateral material were used, the bibliography was limited to works actually cited. Acknowledgement is given for gracious permission of the publishers to quote copyrighted materials. The author is indebted to Drive S. Lewis Johnson for a careful critical reading of the manuscript and for many suggestions which have been incorporated in the text. The editors of Moody Press have also been most helpful. In offering this new exposition of the Book of Revelation, an attempt has been made to provide a norm for premillennial interpreters of the Bible. In many cases, alternative views are offered even though they differ from the interpretation of the author. It is too much to hope that the interpretation will persuade all readers. But if added light is cast upon the Word of God, and the Christian hope is enriched thereby, the author's expectation will have been realized. Most of all, may the Lord Jesus Christ, the subject of the revelation of the book, be glorified in this attempt to understand what John saw and heard on the Isle of Patmos. Authorship, Occasion, and Date The opening verses of the book of the Revelation plainly claim the book was written by John, identified almost universally in the early church as the Apostle John. The apostolic authorship of the book has, nevertheless, been questioned ever since the time of Dionysius of Alexandria in the 3rd century. Dionysius challenged the traditional view that John the Apostle was the author on the ground that the book of Revelation had numerous cases of bad grammar. Dionysius said, I perceive that the dialect and language is not very accurate Greek, but that he uses barbarous idioms, and in some places solecisms which it is now unnecessary to select. 1. Beginning with Dionysius, those who object to Johannine authorship or to inclusion of the Apocalypse in the canon have tended to magnify the problems of grammar and alleged inaccuracies. Impartial scholarship has admitted that there are expressions in the book of Revelation which do not correspond to accepted Greek usage, but this problem is not entirely confined to this book of the Bible. Conservative scholarship has insisted that infallibility in divine revelation does not necessarily exclude expressions which are not normal in other Greek literature and that such instances do not mar the perfection of the truth that is transmitted. Sweet, after acknowledging that the Apocalypse of John stands alone among Greek literary writings in its disregard of the ordinary rules of syntax, goes on to say that it does so without loss of perspicuity or even of literary power. The book seems openly and deliberately to defy the grammarian, and yet even as literature it is in its own field unsurpassed. Two, it is important to note, however, that some of the supposedly bad grammar in Revelation was used in contemporary Koine literature, as is revealed by discoveries in the papyri. When due allowance is made for the character of the book, as H. B. Sweet has noted, there are remarkable similarities in some respects between the fourth gospel and the book of Revelation, and that fact creates a strong presumption of affinity between the fourth gospel and the apocalypse, notwithstanding their great diversity both in language and in thought. 3. The arguments for rejecting the apostolic authorship stem largely from the theological climate of the third century. At that time, the Alexandrian school of theology, including Dionysius, opposed the doctrine of the millennial kingdom, which is plainly taught in chapter 20 with its reference to the thousand years. An attack by them on the authorship of John tended to weaken the force of this prophecy. Another early objection to the view that John the Apostle was the author of this book was occasioned by the fact that he never describes himself as an apostle, but rather as a servant. 
Many scholars, motivated by other reasons, have advanced the theory that the John of the Book of Revelation is another person known as John the Presbyter or John the Elder, mentioned by Papias in a statement preserved in the writing of Eusebius. Another author considered but rejected by Dionysius of Alexandria was John Mark. The substantiating evidence for any other author than John the Apostle, however, is almost entirely lacking. While notable scholars can be cited in support of divergent views, the proof dissipates upon examination. It seems clear that the early church attributed the book to John the Apostle. Justin Martyr quotes John's view that Christ would dwell a thousand years in Jerusalem. Point four Irenaeus quotes every chapter of the book of the Revelation. Point five in like manner, Tertullian cites the author as the Apostle John and quotes from almost every chapter of the book. Point six Hippolytus quotes extensively from chapters 17 and 18. Attributing them to John the Apostle, point seven, many other early fathers can be cited in similar fashion, such as Clement of Alexandria and Origen. The latter not only quotes from the book, but confirms that John the Apostle was on the Isle of Patmos. Point eight. The first commentary on the book of Revelation to be preserved, written by Victorinus, regards John the Apostle as the author. Though the book of Revelation was not commonly received by the church as canonical until the middle of the second century, it is most significant that the Johannine authorship was not questioned until the strong antichiliastic influence arose in the Alexandrian school of theology at the end of the second century. The evidence for the Johannine authorship is based first on the fact that four times the writer calls himself by the name John, 1 colon 1, 4, 9, 22 colon 8. Describing himself as a servant, one colon one, and your brother, and companion in tribulation, and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, one colon nine, John never states that he is an apostle. Taking into consideration, however, that in the fourth gospel there is a similar anonymity, this does not seem to be strange. Most conservative expositors regard the name John as genuine rather than a pseudonym as is common in non-scriptural apocalyptic books. There is really no solid evidence against accepting John the Apostle as the author, and there is much that confirms it. In fact, it may be argued that the reference to John without further identification would presume a familiarity on the part of the readers which would make naming him unnecessary. The evidence for John the Apostle hangs largely on the question whether the Apostle John actually was exiled on the Isle of Patmos, as the author of this book claims, 1 colon 9. There is good historical evidence in support of this claim. Clement of Alexandria refers to the Apostle John as returning from the Isle of Patmos. Point nine. Eusebius not only affirms John's return from the Isle, but dates it immediately following the death of Domitian, which occurred in A.D. 96.10. Irenaeus adds his confirming word when he states that John lived in Ephesus after returning from Patmos until the reign of Trajan. Point eleven. Though the scriptures do not dogmatically confirm that John the Apostle is the author, the existing evidence is heavily in favor of this conclusion. Related to the total problem is the question of date of the book. Though the tendency among conservative scholars has been to regard the date as A.D. 95 or 96, some have contended for an earlier date, such as 68 or 69, a conclusion supported by such worthies as Westcott, Lightfoot, Hort, Salmon, and others. Point 12. The early date is supposedly supported by a statement attributed to Papias to the effect that John the Apostle was martyred before the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70. Sweet in his thorough discussion of this point feels that if the statement of Papias is to be considered genuine, it disposes of the apostolic authorship of the Apocalypse. 13. Accordingly, Sweet concludes that if the evidence of Papias be acknowledged, the probability is that John the Elder is the John referred to in the book of Revelation. The evidence for the early date, before A.D. 70, which depends both upon the genuineness of the quotation from Papias and the question whether Papias knew what he was talking about, has been challenged by many conservative scholars. The majority opinion seems to be that the traditional date of 95 or 96 has better support. The historical evidence previously cited from Clement of Alexandria, Eusebius, and Irenaeus would be left without any explanation if John the Apostle actually suffered martyrdom before the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70. 
As previously noted, Irenaeus placed the writing of the book in the reign of Domitian, which ended A.D. 96. The weight of evidence is against accepting the testimony of Papias as valid and is for setting the date as 95 or 96. In any case, there is little tendency among scholars who accept the inspiration of the Apocalypse to place the date later as some liberal scholars have attempted to do. It is most significant that in many cases the theological bias against the Kiliastic teaching of the Book of Revelation seems to be the actual motive in rejecting the apostolic authorship. Based on the historical evidence, the date, therefore, must be before the death of Domitian, who was assassinated in A.D. 96, as the apostle was apparently released from his exile shortly after this. Interpretative problems, such as those raised by the identification of the seven kings of Revelation 17 verse 10, are not of sufficient weight to challenge the historical evidence for the traditional date. The contents of the book fit this time. In contrast to other apocalyptic books, the revelation recorded by John the Apostle is presented as having a solid historical basis in his exile on the Isle of Patmos. It was there these visions were given to him and in obedience to the command to write them and send them to the seven churches, John recorded the prophecies of the book. It would seem entirely reasonable that in the midst of persecution the church should be given a book of such assurance as that embodied in the content of the revelation, which holds before them not only a realistic explanation as to why persecution is permitted, but also a promise of ultimate triumph and reward. Inspiration and Canonicity because the book of Revelation was addressed to seven different churches, it would be only natural that each of these churches would want its own copy, and thus the circulation of the entire book would be given a good start. Some believe that Ignatius 110-17 to and the early epistle of Barnabas contained allusions to the book though Sweet considers it uncertain. Point fourteen In the literature of the second half of the second century, evidence begins to reveal wide circulation of the apocalypse. Andreas quotes Papias about Revelation 12 verse 7 FF 15 Irenaeus refers to old copies of the book and to people who knew John.16 Other early authors who mention the book are Justin, Eusebius, Apollonius, and Theophilus the Bishop of Antioch.17 It is referred to a number of times in the Epistle of the Churches of Vienne.18 Other references to the book abound. Tertullian, according to Sweet, quotes from 18 out of the 22 chapters of the book, and cites it as scripture.19 Some literature from the period seems to refer to the book using similar phraseology, example, the Shepherd of Hermas, which refers to the Great Tribulation, and the Acts of Perpetua and Felicitas, which according to Sweet abounds in imagery similar to the book of Revelation.20 The circulation and wide use of the book as scripture are evident by the beginning of the third. Century it is true, nevertheless, that Revelation was slow in gaining universal recognition as scripture. Important in the reasons for this is opposition to the Kiliasm which is expressly taught in Revelation 20. Other theological objections arose from various sects which for the most part were heretical. The more orthodox churches seem to have had less difficulty in accepting it as scripture. The reasons for a slower reception arose principally from the unusual character of this book, the only apocalyptic book in the New Testament. As previously noted, critics also were quick to point to grammatical difficulties and to cite apparent discrepancies. Sweet in his thorough discussion of the vocabulary, grammar, and style demonstrates that most of these objections have a suitable explanation and do not have real weight against acceptance of the book as inspired scripture.21. As Thiessen has shown, most of the objections and difficulties dissolve upon study and do not militate against either apostolic authorship or the inspiration of the book itself. Point 22 The fact is that the early church, in spite of certain objections, generally accepted the book of Revelation by the end of the 2nd century and the Eastern Church soon followed suit. Among conservative scholars, there is little disposition to exclude the book of Revelation from the canon, even though Luther, Zwingli, and Erasmus considered it non-apostolic. Point 23. For the purpose of the present study, the inspiration of the book is assumed. Interpretation. Blunt, in his preface, like a number of others, comments on the fact that Joseph Scaliger, a 16th-century French critic, 
complimented John Calvin thus, he has shown his sense as much by not commenting on the book of Revelation as he had by the manner in which he had commented on the other books of the Bible. 24. Most of the difficulty in the interpretation of this last book in the scriptures has come from treating it as an ordinary piece of literature produced by a variety of human authors. With such presuppositions, the book becomes a literary monstrosity devoid of any real revelation from God. Simcox points out, many orthodox readers are content to leave at least the bulk of the book absolutely uninterpreted. 25. When approached as divinely inspired and to be interpreted by the phraseology and symbolism of other portions of the Bible, the depth and breadth of revelation become immediately apparent. The book offers knowledge far beyond the investigating power of man and claims revelation not only in relation to spiritual and moral truths, as in the letters to the seven churches, but revelation extending to visions of heaven and earth and prophetic revelation of the future, including the eternal state. If a human invention, the book is of little value. If divinely inspired, it is an open door into precious eternal truth. If the inspiration of the book and its apostolic authorship be accepted, there still remain, however, serious exegetically problems illustrated in the variety of approaches found in conservative scholarship. These have often been divided into four categories. 1. The non-literal or allegorical approach. This point of view, originating in the Alexandrian school of theology represented in Clement of Alexandria and Origen, regarded the book of Revelation as one great allegory going far beyond the natural symbolism which is found in the book. They understood in a non-literal sense much of what other expositors interpreted literally. They were motivated by their antichiliastic premises, which led them to take in other than literal sense anything which would teach a millennial reign of Christ on earth. They claimed that their view was the true spiritual interpretation as opposed to the literalism of their opponents. Though the Alexandrian school in the early church is generally regarded as heretical, its leaders undoubtedly influenced such men as Jerome and Augustine and were responsible for turning the early church from its previous chiliastic position. The interpretative method of the Alexandrian school in its entirety has found little favor with modern interpreters, but there is a persistent tendency to return to some use of this method to avoid the premillennial implications of the Book of Revelation, if understood more literally. Katie H. Allen, like many others, regards the book only as a form of spiritual encouragement and assurance of the ultimate triumph of Christianity to those of the first century, but he feels the book is not intended to predict the future point 26. The more moderate form of allegorical interpretation, following Augustine, has achieved respectability and regards the book of Revelation as presenting in a symbolic way the total conflict between Christianity and evil or, as Augustine put it, the city of God versus the city of Satan. The modern liberal point of view expressed by Niles emphasizes a contemporary meaning of the book, averring that even the final consummation of the triumph of righteousness has already begun. Niles states, But there is a distinction between prophecy and apocalypse, for whereas prophecy is a thrust of the word of God into the present, apocalypse is also an unveiling of the meaning of the present in the light of the final end. Christian Apocalypse is written from the standpoint of the contemporaneousness of the church to the Christ who is risen and who will come again. Point 27. Though the book is still regarded as somewhat prophetic, its specific character as prophesying definite future events is thus dissipated. Linsky in the introduction to his exposition of the Revelation denies that any chronology is intended in the book. As far as the writer is able to see, the visions, from the first to the last, present lines or vistas. These start at various points, but like radii or rays, all focus upon the final judgment and the eternal triumph. The final visions, chapters 21 and 22, present the triumph at length. All history is covered, but not as we read history, only as God sees it. The veiling clouds open now and again, allowing us to see vision after vision, till at last our eyes behold and vision the holy city itself. Times and seasons are not for us, Acts 1 verse 7, but the sure triumph, glorious over and amid them all, is point 28. 2. The Preterist Approach 
In general, adherents of this point of view hold that the book of Revelation is a record of the conflicts of the early church with Judaism and paganism, with the closing chapters, 20-22, to constituting a picture of the contemporary triumph of the church. Though similar in some ways to the allegorical method, it considers Revelation as a symbolic history rather than prophetic. Though some in the early church may have had similar views, credit is usually given to the Jesuit Alcacer, died in 1613, as originating this view, which was held also by Grotius, famous theologian of the Netherlands. A variation of this is the idea that Revelation is descriptive rather than predictive. David Brown writes concerning the design of the Apocalypse, there are but two possible theories of what the Apocalypse is written for. It is either essentially predictive or purely descriptive. In keeping with his post-millennial viewpoint, he follows almost completely the descriptive interpretation point 29. Hendrickson dismisses both the historical and the futurist interpretations of the book of Revelation on the assumption that the book was intended for the use of first-century Christians to whom a detailed prophecy of the entire church age would have been meaningless. Hendrickson instead seems to follow the view that the book is a symbolic word of encouragement to early Christians suffering persecution and a general assurance of ultimate triumph in Christ, 30 hence he is only partially a preterist. The preterist view, in general, tends to destroy any future significance of the book, which becomes a literary curiosity with little prophetic meaning. Contemporary liberal works usually follow a combination of the preterist and symbolical methods of interpretation, disregarding the strictly historical interpretation as well as the futurist. Illustrative of this tendency is Lehman's work, The Book of Revelation, which significantly does not include a single premillennial work in its bibliography. Point 31 Even Universalists have attempted commentaries on the Book of Revelation in which they explain away all judgment upon sin and make all future judgment contemporary. As in the work of Whitmore written over a century ago, point 32 Milligan regards the apocalypse as a statement of principles with no time periods or specific events in view. While the Apocalypse thus embraces the whole period of the Christian dispensation, it sets before us within this period the action of great principles and not special incidents. 3. The Historical Approach Adherents to this theory consider Revelation as a symbolic presentation of the total of church history culminating in the Second Advent. Though it had earlier disciples, Joachim, a Roman Catholic scholar, is largely responsible for this as he was also the originator of the first forms of postmillennialism. This method of interpreting the book of Revelation achieved considerable stature in the Reformation because of its identification of the Pope and the papacy with the beasts of Revelation 13. Thiessen cites Wycliffe, Luther, Joseph Mead, Sir Isaac Newton, William Whiston, Eliot, the Tringa, Bendel, and Barnes as adherents of this approach. It has undoubtedly influenced a large number of subsequent expositors, especially those of the postmillennial point of view. Point 34. The historical method of interpretation has achieved the status of respectability and in some ways is superior to the other two methods in that it provides a profound philosophy of history as well as a guide to the general principles of divine providence. Its major difficulty is that its adherents have succumbed to the tendency to interpret the book as in some sense climaxing in their generation. As many as 50 different interpretations of the book of Revelation therefore evolve, depending on the time and circumstances of the expositor. Moses Stewart wrote more than 100 years ago of the distress engendered in his day by the historical interpretation of the book of Revelation with its many conflicting theories resulting in the opinion that the book is impossible of plain exposition. Stewart raised the question, Must this state of things always continue? This is a question of great interest to those who believe that the apocalypse rightfully belongs to the canon of scripture. Hitherto, scarcely any two original and independent expositors have been agreed, in respect to some points very important in their bearing upon the interpretation of the book. So long as the Apocalypse is regarded principally as an epitome of civil and ecclesiastic history, this must continue to be the case. 
Different minds will make the application of apocalyptic prophecies to different series of events, because there is something in each to which more or less of these prophecies is seemingly applicable. Such has always been the case, in past times, whenever this method of interpretation has been followed, and why should anything different from this be expected for the future? 35. The very multiplicity of such interpretations and identifications of the personnel of Revelation with a variety of historical characters is its own refutation. If the historical method is the correct one, it is clear until now that no one has found the key. As Gimmon has pointed out, in the historical interpretation of Revelation, variations exist in an almost endless stream, touch every aspect of the book, and, even on major themes there is little agreement, the inescapable conclusion is that historical interpreters are on the wrong highway of interpretation. Point 36. Abraham Kuyper in his last work, written after he was 76 years of age, interprets the book of Revelation in a devotional and spiritual sense. The translator, John Hendrick de Vries, in his introduction has this interesting criticism of the historical method of interpretation of Augustine that both he and Kuyper reject. He who has made a serious study of the marginal notes of Revelation has been impressed of necessity with the uncertainty into which Augustine's method brings him. He is told again and again that this one finds this and the other one that in it. As the several figures present themselves the expositor cannot make up his mind whether one king is meant or another, this pope or another, or whether the writer refers to a persecution of the past or to one that is still to come. Moreover, it breaks the thread of devotional reading when the mind is continually diverted by historical and numerical calculations of dates, which as pawns on a chessboard are moved back and forth, and in any case lie outside the horizon of the devout among God's people. Again, this method of interpretation leads to results which reflect the time in which the expositor lives. S. Augustine, who knew nothing of the papal hierarchy, is reminded of the early persecutors of the church and of the great heresies of those early days, while the writers of the marginal notes, who were reared in the heat of the struggle with Rome, had in mind almost exclusively what had gone out from Rome's seat against God's counsel. All this breeds uncertainty and confusion. It turns exegesis into an artful play of ingenuity. And when men of such eminent piety as Bindle devote years of their life to the calculation that the final period was to begin in 1836, or locate the end of the world in a year that is long past, we realize that such exegesis cannot meet what God's church expects from this particular part of Scripture. Point 37 Kuiper attempts to combine the historical and the idealistic, and in his spiritual interpretation, the book of Revelation is considered primarily a message of comfort to a suffering church. Typical of contemporary amillennialism is the viewpoint of McDowell equating the millennium with the present age and more particularly to the intermediate state to which martyrs go after death. McDowell writes, The binding of Satan, 20 colon 1-3, for a thousand years represents the cosmic result of the defeat of Satan in history. The defeat of the beast and his allies is a defeat for Satan and signalizes the limitation of his power for a long, indeterminate period of time, 1,000 years. The reign of the martyrs and saints begins in this period of struggle. Those who are faithful to Christ in this struggle go from this earth at their death to reign with Christ for a long, indeterminate period of time, 1,000 years. This is the first resurrection, 20,4-6.38. McDowell's point of view is a combination of the historical and the spiritual interpretation of the book of Revelation, characteristic of contemporary amillennialism. 4. The Futuristic Approach Limited to conservative expositors who are usually premillennial, this point of view regards Revelation as futuristic beginning with chapter 4 and therefore subject to future fulfillment. Some have attempted to make even chapters 1, 2, and three futuristic in the seven churches as future assemblies, but the great majority of futurists begin with chapter 4. Under this system of interpretation, the events of chapters 4 through 19 relate to the period just preceding the second coming of Christ. This is generally regarded as a period of seven years with emphasis on the last three and one-half years, labeled the 
Great Tribulation Chapter 19, therefore, refers to the second coming of Christ to the earth, chapter 20 to the future millennial kingdom which will follow, and chapters 21 and 22 to events either contemporary or subsequent to the millennium. In contrast to the other approaches to the book of Revelation, the futuristic position allows a more literal interpretation of the specific prophecies of the book. Though recognizing the frequent symbolism in various prophecies, the events foreshadowed by these symbols and their interpretation are regarded as being fulfilled in a normal way. Hence, the various judgments of God are actually poured out on the earth as contained in the seals, trumpets, and vials. Chapter 13 is considered a prophecy of the future world empire with its political and religious heads represented by the two beasts of this chapter. The harlot of chapter 17 is the final form of the church in apostasy. In a similar way, all other events of Revelation relate to the climax of history contained in the second coming of Christ. Objections to the futuristic view often stem from the claim that it would rob the early church of practical comfort. Summers expresses a common point of view when he states, I do not believe that any interpretation of Revelation can be correct if it is meaningless and if it fails to bring practical help and comfort to those who first received the book. To start from any other view ointment is to follow the road which leads away from the truth of the okay rather than the road which reveals the marvelous message of truth here given to troubled hearts. Point 39. It is questionable whether any view, even the most extreme futuristic view, denies that there is a present value to the study of the book of Revelation. Summers is adroitly begging the question. The point is that portions of the book of Revelation can be appreciated and understood now. Other portions will not be understood until they are fulfilled. The general tenor of the book, even in unfulfilled sections, however, is the assurance that God will ultimately triumph, the saints will be blessed, and sin will be judged. To use the argument that the book must be understood by the first generation of Christians completely as a refutation of the futuristic position is not reasonable nor backed by the study of prophecy and scripture in general. Summers himself adopts the combination of the preterist and historical views which obviously gives the interpreter a great deal of freedom but leaves his results mostly subjective. Point forty. Milligan makes a similar objection to the futuristic system that, if the main body of the book deals with the period immediately preceding the second coming of Christ, it robs the reader of immediate blessing. Point 41 it is. Strange that such an objection should be considered weighty. Much of the prophecy of the Bible deals with the distant future, including the Old Testament promises of the coming Messiah, the prophecies of Daniel concerning the future world empires, the body of truth relating to the coming kingdom on earth, as well as countless other prophecies. If the events of chapters 4 through 19 are future, even from our viewpoint today, they teach the blessed truth of the ultimate supremacy of God and the triumph of righteousness. The immediate application of distant events is familiar in Scripture, as for instance 2 Peter 3 verses 10 to 12, which speaks of the ultimate dissolution of the earth. Nevertheless, the succeeding passage makes an immediate application. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent. 2 Peter 3 verse 14. Milligan's substitution of the spiritual interpretation of the book of Revelation in effect robs it of its prophetic character. Though the premillennial conclusions of the futuristic view seem to have been held by the early church, the early fathers did not in any clear or consistent way interpret the book of Revelation as a whole in a futuristic sense. In fact, it can be demonstrated that the principal error of the fathers was that they attempted to interpret the book of Revelation as being fulfilled contemporaneously in the trials and difficulties of the church. Subsequent history has shown that the events which would have naturally followed did not come to pass, and the assumption of contemporaneous fulfillment was thereby discredited. The futuristic school has gained a hold upon a large segment of interpreters of prophecy in conservative evangelicalism largely because the other methods have led to such confusion of interpretation and have tended to make revelation a hopeless exegetically problem. 
The futurist approach is rejected by most millenarian and postmillenarian scholars, but is normally held by contemporary premillenarians who tend to follow the futuristic form of interpretation. Though many difficulties and obscurities remain, the futuristic school has the advantage of offering a relatively clear understanding of the principal events of future fulfillment and tends to treat revelation as a more normative piece of literature than the other interpretative principles. One of the common assumptions of those who reject the futurist position is that the apocalypse is the creation of John's thinking and was understandable by him in his generation. Moses Stewart expresses this. The original and intelligent readers of this book, beyond all reasonable doubt, could understand the meaning of the writer, else why should he address his work to them? Their acquaintance with the circle of things in which he moved, and their familiarity with the objects to which he refers, superseded the use of all the critical apparatus which we must now employ. Point 42. The difficulty with this point of view is twofold. One, prophecy, as given in the scripture, was not necessarily understandable by the writer or his generation, as illustrated in the case of Daniel, Dan 12 to 4, 9. It is questionable whether the great prophets of the Old Testament always understood what they were writing, see F. 1 Peter 1 verses 10 to 12. 2. It is of the nature of prophecy that often it cannot be understood until the time of the generation which achieves fulfillment. The assumption, therefore, that the book of Revelation was understandable in the first generation or that it was intended to be understood by that generation is without real basis. The second and third chapters of the book, however, are primarily a message to the seven historic churches of Asia. Inasmuch as these exhortations are set in the prophetic context of the chapters which follow, the book of Revelation is therefore seen to be designed for the church at large. If it were not for the book of Revelation, the New Testament canon would have ended with an obviously unfinished character. The book of Revelation is in many respects the capstone of futuristic prophecy of the entire Bible and gathers in its prophetic scheme the major themes of prophecy which thread their way through the whole volume of Scripture. The scope and plan of the book as contained in the opening phrase to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass, 1 colon 1, indicate that the primary intent of the book was to prepare the way for the second coming of Christ. The book, therefore, has a special relevance for the generation which will be living on earth at that time. Because that event is undated, it constitutes a challenge to each succeeding generation of believers. Apocalyptic Character the book of Revelation, beginning as it does with the Greek word apocalypsis, by its very title is apocalyptic in character, that is, a book which claims to unfold the future, the unveiling of that which would otherwise be concealed. The nature of such a revelation requires a supernatural understanding of future events. Although the book of Revelation is the only apocalyptic book of the New Testament, many other apocalyptic works preceded its appearance, and there were others which followed. A sharp distinction should be observed between apocalyptic works outside the Bible and apocalyptic works which are scripture, whose writing was guided by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Apocalyptic literature outside the Bible can be classified as pseudepigrapha. There were works pretending to emanate from characters of the Bible who are cast in the role of predicting the future. The actual authors, however, often lived long after the character to whom the work is ascribed. Among the most important pseudepigrapha are Ascension of Isaiah, Assumption of Moses, Book of Enoch, Book of Jubilees, the Greek Apocalypse of Baruch, Letters of Aristides, Three and Four Maccabees, Psalms of Solomon, Secrets of Enoch, Sibylline Oracles, the Syriac Apocalypse of Baruch, and Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs. These works are usually dated as beginning about 250 BC and as continuing into the period following the Apostolic Church. A great many other apocalyptic works are sometimes cited as of lesser importance, such as the Apocalypses of Adam, Elijah, and Zephaniah, and Testament of Abram, Isaac, and Jacob. It is characteristic of apocalyptic literature outside the Bible to have a pessimistic view of the contemporary situation and to paint the future in glowing terms of blessing for the saints and doom for the wicked. The real author's name is never divulged in apocalyptic works outside the Bible. 
Apocalyptic portions of the scriptures are in sharp contrast to these pseudepigrapha. The more important apocalyptic works of the Old Testament are Isaiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Joel, and Zechariah. Liberal scholars have sometimes drawn unfair comparisons between the apocalyptic writers outside the Bible and those within the canon. For instance, a common assumption is that the book of Daniel was not actually written by Daniel, as the book purports to be, in the 6th century BC, but rather in the period of the 2nd century when much of the book of Daniel would have been history. This, however, has been refuted by adequate conservative scholarship, and the apocalyptic character of scriptural books is not a just ground for denying the historical content or the authorship indicated. It is an unwarranted assumption to conclude from the pseudo-authorship of apocalyptic writings outside the Bible that the same principle also applies to Scripture. H. B. Sweet, although making unwarranted concessions, 43 such as the late date of Daniel, points out that the Apocalypse of John is a new departure from former apocalyptic writings in the following particulars. 1. The Jewish apocalypses are without exception pseudepigraphic. The Christian apocalypse bears the author's name. This abandonment of a long-established tradition is significant. By it, John claims for himself the position of a prophet who, conscious that he draws his inspiration from Christ or his angel and not at second hand, has no need to seek shelter under the name of a biblical saint. 2. In contrast to the pseudepigrapha whose actual dates are often impossible to determine, sweet states. The Apocalypse of John, on the contrary, makes no secret of its origin and destination. It is the work of a Christian undergoing exile in one of the islands of the Aegean, and it is addressed to Christian congregations in seven of the chief cities of the adjacent continent under circumstances which practically determine its date. 3. The Apocalyptist differs from his Jewish predecessors in that he has produced a book which, taken as a whole, is profoundly Christian and widely removed from the field in which Jewish apocalyptic occupied itself. The narrow sphere of Jewish national hopes has been exchanged for the life and aims of the society whose field is the world and whose goal is the conquest of the human race. In the Apocalypse of John, the presence of the spirit of revelation is unmistakably felt, and the Christian student may be pardoned if he recognizes in this book a fulfillment of the promise of a paraclete who shall declare the things that are to come. The Apocalypse of John stands in sharp contrast not only to apocalyptic writings outside the Bible which preceded it, but also to the Christian apocalypses which followed, such as Anabaticon and Pauli, the revelations of St. Stephen and Thomas, the decree of Gelasius, the Apocalypse of Peter, which for a brief time in the early church seems to have been considered genuine, the Apocalypse of Paul, a spurious Apocalypse of John, the Apocalypse of Cedric, and the Apocalypse of the Virgin. The reverent student, however, has little difficulty distinguishing the superlative and inspired character of the genuine Apocalypse of John from these apocalyptic writings which followed. Symbolism Symbolisms occur throughout Scripture as a vehicle for divine revelation, but it is undoubtedly true that the final book of the New Testament because of its apocalyptic character contains more symbols than any other book in the New Testament. Point 45 In this particular it is similar to the book of Daniel to which, in many respects, it is a counterpart, and also to Ezekiel and Zechariah in the Old Testament. Many apocalyptic books appeared prior to as well as contemporary with the book of Revelation. The fact that Revelation was included in the canon and all other contemporary apocalyptic books were excluded is in itself a testimony to the unusual character of Revelation. Among the apocalyptic books produced in the early church were the Apocalypse of Paul, the Apocalypse of Peter, the Apocalypse of Zechariah, and others like them, which though similar in style are not inspired and are far inferior as vehicles of conveying truth. These writings should not be confused with the genuine Pauline and Petrine epistles and the book of Zechariah in the Old Testament. Apocalyptic books in general are so designated because they reveal truth expressed in symbolic and guarded language. The symbolism of the book of Revelation has been explained on many principles. 
one of the most probable and popular, however, is that it was necessary to state opposition to the Roman Empire during the persecutions of Domitian by expressing the revelation from God in symbolic terms which would not be easily apprehended by the Roman authorities. Ethelbert Stauffer explains the need for symbolism in the Apocalypse in this way. We may read the book of Revelation with new understanding when we see it as the apostolic reply to the declaration of war on Christianity by the divine emperor in Rome. And when we realize the perilous political situation in which the book was both written and published, 2210, we understand the reason for its mysterious and veiled pictorial language and its preference for words and pseudonyms from the Old Testament, point 46. The exposition of this point of view is expressed by Stauffer in his account of the developments during the reign of Domitian, A.D. 81-96. As Stauffer notes, Domitian gradually applied to himself all the attributes of God and established a form of religion which was anti-Christian. As Stauffer states, Domitian was also the first emperor to wage a proper campaign against Christ, and the church answered the attack under the leadership of Christ's last apostle, John of the Apocalypse. Nero had Paul and Peter destroyed, but he looked upon them as seditious Jews. Domitian was the first emperor to understand that behind the Christian movement there stood an enigmatic figure who threatened the glory of the emperors. He was the first to declare war on this figure, and the first also to lose the war, a foretaste of things to come. Point 47. Stauffer traces the development of Domitian's opposition to Christianity and his claim of divine attributes on the coins which were issued during the reign of Domitian and which were used as an important propaganda vehicle to communicate to the people Domitian's assumption of divinity. Almost every aspect of nature is used as well as grotesque non-natural forms as a vehicle of the symbolism of the Book of Revelation. Hence, from the animal world, frequent symbols appear, such as the horses of Revelation 6, the living creatures seen in heaven, Christ as the lamb, and the calf, the locust, the scorpion, the lion, the leopard, the bear, the frog, the eagle, the vulture, birds, fish, as well as unnatural beasts, such as those in Revelation 13. There is also allusion to the botanical world, and trees and grass are mentioned in a context of reference to earth, sky, and sea. The sun, moon, and stars in the heavens, the thunder, lightning, and hail of the atmospheric heavens, as well as rivers and seas on earth often form a vehicle of divine revelation. Various forms of humanity are also mentioned, such as the mother and child of Revelation 12, the harlot of Revelation 17, and the wife of Revelation 19. Weapons of war such as swords are named as well as reapers with their sickles. Trumpeters with their trumpets are introduced as well as the flute and lyre. In many cases John had to use unusual expressions to describe scenes in heaven and in earth which transcend normal human experience. Some items allude either to biblical background or to the geography of the Bible, but much of the imagery found in the book of Revelation is familiar also to students of Daniel, Ezekiel, and Zechariah. The golden lampstand of the churches of Asia has some correspondence to the lampstand of the tabernacle and temple. Allusions to the heavenly tabernacle and temple, to the altar, ark, and censer, all have Old Testament background. Geographic descriptions refer also to Old Testament names and places such as the River Euphrates, Sodom, Armageddon, the Hill of Megiddo, Jerusalem, Babylon, Egypt, and to Old Testament characters such as Balaam and Jezebel. In many cases there are indirect allusions to Old Testament ideas and situations. A fair analysis of this compilation of symbols furnishes proof of frequent allusion to the Old Testament. In the center is Christ as the Lamb and Lion of the tribe of Judah and the Root of David. The twelve tribes of Israel are mentioned. As Snell states, In the Revelation, the Lamb is the center around which all else is clustered, the foundation on which everything lasting is built, the nail on which all hangs, the object to which all points, and the spring from which all blessing proceeds. The Lamb is the light, the glory, the life, the Lord of heaven and earth, from whose face all defilement must flee away, and in whose presence fullness of joy is known. 
Hence, we cannot go far in the study of the Revelation without seeing the Lamb, like direction posts along the road, to remind us that he who did by himself purge our sins is now highly exalted, and that to him every knee must bow, and every tongue confess. It is nevertheless true that much of the imagery of the book of Revelation is new, that is, it is created as a vehicle for the divine revelation which John was to record. To attempt as many writers have done, to consider this symbolism as allusion to extra-biblical apocalyptic literature is to press the matter beyond its proper bounds. It is also true that some items, while partially symbolic, may also be intended to be understood literally, as in numerous instances where reference is made to stars, the moon, the sun, rivers, and seas. While there will never be complete, Agreement on the line between imagery and the literal, the patient EXE geek must resolve each occurrence in some form of consistent interpretation. Very prominent in the book of Revelation is the use of numbers, namely, two, three, three and a half, four, five, six, seven, ten, twelve, twenty four, forty two, one forty four, six hundred sixty six, one thousand, one thousand two hundred sixty, 1,600, 7,000, 12,000, 144,000, 100 million, and 200 million. These numbers may be understood literally, but even when understood in this way, they often carry with them also a symbolic meaning. Hence the number 7, used 54 times, more than any other number in the book, refers to seven literal churches in the opening chapter. Yet by the very use of this number, which speaks of completion or perfection, the concept is conveyed that these were representative churches which in some sense were complete in their description of the normal needs of the church. There were not only seven churches, but seven lampstands, seven stars, seven spirits of God, seven seals on the scroll, seven angels with seven trumpets, seven vials or bowls containing the seven last plagues, seven thunders, seven thousand killed in the earthquake of chapter 12, a dragon with seven heads and seven crowns, the beast of chapter 13 with seven heads, seven mountains of chapter 17, and the seven kings. Next in importance to the number 7 and in the order of their frequency are the numbers 12, 10, and 4. Some of this stems from the fact that there are 12 tribes of Israel. 12,000 were sealed from each of the 12 tribes. The elders of chapter 4 are twice 12 or 24. The New Jerusalem is declared to be 12,000 furlongs wide and long, and its wall 12 times 12, or 144 cubits in height. From these indications it is clear that the use of these numbers is not accidental. Though the symbolism is not always obvious, the general rule should be followed to interpret numbers literally unless there is clear evidence to the contrary. The numbers nevertheless convey more than their bare numerical significance. Of special importance is the reference to 42 months or 1,260 days, describing the precise length of the Great Tribulation. This is in keeping with the anticipation of Daniel 9 verse 27 that the last half of the seven-year period would be a time of unprecedented trouble. Endless speculation has also risen over the number 666, describing the beast out of the sea in Revelation 13 minutes and 18.49 seconds. The most natural and simple explanation of this number, however, is that the beast is characterized by the number 6, just falling short of the number 7 and signifying that he is only a man after all. Possibly the threefold occurrence of the number six is in vague imitation of the trinity formed by his association with the devil and the false prophet. The wide use of symbols is attended, however, by frequent interpretations in the book of Revelation itself either by direct reference or by implication. Symbols can often be explained also by usage elsewhere in scripture. The following list may be helpful. The seven stars, 116, represent seven angels, 120. The seven lampstands, 113, represent seven churches, 120. The hidden manna, 217, speaks of Christ in glory, cf Exodus 16 verses 33 to 34, Hebrews 9 verse 4. The morning star, 228, 
refers to Christ returning before the dawn, suggesting the rapture of the church before the establishment of the kingdom, cf Revelation 22 verse 16, 2 Peter 1 verse 19. The key of David, 3 colon 7, represents the power to open and close doors, Isaiah 22 verse 22. The seven lamps of fire represent the sevenfold spirit of God, 4 colon 5. The living creatures, 4 colon 7, portray the attributes of God. The seven eyes represent the sevenfold spirit of God, 5 colon 6. The odors of the golden vials symbolize the prayers of the saints, 5 colon 8. The four horses and their riders, 6 colon 1 ff, represent successive events in the developing tribulation. The fallen star, 9 colon 1, is the angel of the abyss, probably Satan, 9 11. Many references are made to Jerusalem, the great city, 11 colon 8, Sodom and Egypt, 11 colon 8, which stand in contrast to the new Jerusalem, the heavenly city. The stars of heaven, 12 colon 4, refer to fallen angels, 12 colon 9. The woman and the child, 12 colon 1 dash 2, seem to represent Israel and Christ, 12 colon 5 dash 6. Satan is variously described as the great dragon, the old serpent, and the devil, 12 colon 9, 20 colon 2. The time, times, and half a time, 12 14, are the same as 1260 days, 12 colon 6. The beast out of the sea, 13 colon 1 dash 10, is the future world ruler and his empire. The beast out of the earth, 13 colon 11 dash 17, is the false prophet, 1920. The harlot, 17 colon 1, variously described as the great city, 1718, as Babylon the great, 17 colon 5, as the one who sits on seven hills, 17 colon 9, is usually interpreted as apostate Christendom. The waters, 17 colon 1, on which the woman sits represent the peoples of the world, 1715. The ten horns, 1712, are ten kings associated with the beast, 13 colon 1, 17 colon 3, 7, 8, 11 to 13, 1 and dash 17. The lamb is lord of lords and king of kings, 1714. Fine linen is symbolic of the righteous deeds of the saints, 19 colon 8. The rider of the white horse, 19 colon 11 dash 16, 19, is clearly identified as Christ, the king of kings. The lake of fire is described as the second death, 2014. Jesus Christ is the root and offspring of David, 2216. In many instances, where symbols are explained in the book of Revelation, they establish a pattern of interpretation which casts a great deal of light upon the meaning of the book as a whole. This introduces a presumption that, where expressions are not explained, they can normally be interpreted according to their natural meaning unless the context clearly indicates otherwise. The attempt to interpret all of the book of Revelation symbolically ends in nullifying practically all that entails the book and leaving it unexplained, as in the work by Lilge, written during the early days of World War II and completed while the author was in prison in Germany. Point fifty. The problems of interpretation of Revelation have often been made far greater than they really are. They frequently yield to patient study and comparison with other portions of Scripture. The linguistic study of Revelation is an endless task but offers rich rewards to the patient student. Theology Few books of the Bible provide a more complete theology than that afforded by the book of Revelation. Because of its apocalyptic character, the emphasis of the book is eschatological in the strict sense of dealing with last things. Note the word of this prophecy, Revelation 1 verse 3. More specifically, however, it is Christological, as the material of the book relates to the revelation of Jesus Christ. The objective is to reveal Jesus Christ as the glorified one in contrast to the Christ of the Gospels, who was seen in humiliation and suffering. The climax of the book is the second coming of Jesus Christ. Events preceding the second coming constitute an introduction, and all events which follow constitute an epilogue. 
The wide range of Revelation, however, deals with many subjects not specifically eschatological or Christological. In all important fields of theology, there are major contributions, and, though written with the imagery and Hebraisms of the Old Testament, the Revelation is definitely New Testament. Bibliology The doctrine of Scripture of the Apocalypse is deduced mostly by implication in that there are frequent allusions to other books of the Bible. One does not proceed more than a few verses, however, before a special blessing is pronounced upon the reader and hearer in a context which refers to the book as the Word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ, Revelation 1 verse 3. John claims divine authority and inspiration both for the book itself and for the revelation it contains. The book of Revelation, however, is not only scripture itself, but is saturated with Old Testament references. Sweet cites Westcott and Hort to the effect that of the 404 verses of the Apocalypse, there are 278 which contain references to the Jewish scriptures, 51. Sweet submits a table demonstrating the richness of Old Testament reference which proves that most of the books of the Old Testament including all of its three major divisions are referred to with emphasis on the Psalms, Isaiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. With Daniel having the greatest number of references, point 52, the fact that the Apocalypse is saturated with Old Testament references in itself tends to tie the book to the rest of Scripture and makes it a fitting climactic volume, a terminal for major. Lines of Scripture Revelation Theology Proper Apart from its eschatology, the Apocalypse contributes more to the doctrine of God than to any other field. The study of its contribution to the doctrine of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit would in itself merit a volume of considerable proportions. God is presented in all the majesty of the Jehovah of the Old Testament, who is holy, true, omnipotent, omniscient, and eternal. There is emphasis on the righteousness of God and his divine judgment upon sin, with comparatively little mention made of his love and mercy. The character of God is in keeping with the role in which he is presented as the divine judge of men. Though there is reference to both the Father and the Son, the central revelation concerns Christ, in keeping with the title of the book. Many allusions are made to his human origin as coming from the tribe of Judah and the house of David and to his humiliation while on earth as represented in the symbol of a slain lamb. Always, however, Christ is depicted as triumphant over death, the eternal one of infinite power and majesty who is worthy of all honor and adoration. Before his glorified humanity the apostle falls as one dead. The supreme revelation is continued in chapter 19 where he is described as descending from heaven as king of kings and lord of lords to slay the wicked, to deliver the righteous, and to accomplish his righteous purpose in the earth. Though the apocalypse contains no defense of the deity of Christ, no book of the Bible is more plain in its implications, for here indeed is the eternal God who became man. This is, of course, confirmed by his relationship to God the Father described in 4 colon 2 dash 3 and 5 colon 1, 7. Complementing the revelation of Christ is that of the Spirit through whom John received the revelation, 1 10, and who appears frequently in various symbols, as in the seven horns and seven eyes. Of 5 colon 6, and the seven spirits of 1 colon 4 and 4 colon 5, and who is seen in the special relationship to Christ in 3 colon 1 and 5 colon 6. It is fitting that the book of Revelation should close with another reference to the Spirit in 2217 climaxing other indirect references to the Spirit throughout the book. Anthropology and Homartiology The emphasis on the doctrines of man and of sin in the book of Revelation is apparent. Man is revealed in his utter need of the grace of God as righteously deserving the judgment of God for sin and partaking, even in his best form, of the limitations of the creature. Few books of the Bible describe man in greater depravity and as the object of more severe divine judgment. The acme of human blasphemy and wickedness is portrayed in the beast and the false prophet who are the supreme demonstration of Satan's handiwork in the human race. Angelology no other book in the New Testament speaks more often of angels than the book of Revelation. They are the principal vehicle of communication to John of the truth which he is recording. 
The holy angels are seen in power and majesty in sharp contrast to the wicked or fallen angels also described in the book. Angels are prominent in the scenes of heaven in chapters 4 and 5, and they reappear to sound the seven trumpets in chapters 8 through 11. The truth of chapter 11 concerning the two witnesses is transmitted to John through an angel, and the warfare against the wicked angels is described dramatically in chapter 12. The seven vials of the wrath of God are also administered by the angels in chapters 15 and 16, and the judgment upon Babylon is related to angelic ministry. Angels apparently accompany the Lord in his second coming in chapter 19. The final message of the book recorded in chapter 22 comes to John through the ministry of angels. Soteriology the redemptive purpose of God is constantly in view in the Apocalypse, beginning with the reference in 1 colon 5 to Christ as the one who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. His crucifixion is mentioned in 1 colon 7, and constant allusions follow as Christ is presented as the slain lamb, as the one who redeemed mankind by his blood out of every kindred, tongue, and nation in 5 colon 9, and the one whose blood can make white the robes of the martyrs in 7 14. It is because of his finished work and sacrifice that the invitation of the spirit and bride of 22 17 can be made to anyone who chooses to partake of the water of life without cost. Salvation is ascribed to God three times, 7, 10, 12, 10, 19, colon 1. Emphasis is on the doctrine of redemption, and the saints are declared to be a redeemed people. Ecclesiology A major section and contribution to ecclesiology is found in the opening chapters of Revelation with the incisive letters to the seven churches. Here the emphasis is on practical truth and holy living, in keeping with their relationship to the head of the church, Jesus Christ. Reference to the New Testament church as the Ecclesia is not to be found in chapters 4 through 18, but the church as the wife of the Lamb reappears in 19 8 and is included in the mention of the apostles in the description of the New Jerusalem, which the church shares with saints of other ages. As in other books of the New Testament, Ecclesia, when used in a religious sense referring to saints in the body of Christ, is nowhere found in Revelation from 3.14 to 22.16. Rather, the general word hagios, saint, is used to include the saved of all ages. This tends to support the concept that the church as the body of Christ is raptured before events pictured in the book of Revelation beginning in chapter 4. The true church is in contrast to the harlot of chapter 17, and it is to be distinguished from the saints described as Jews or Gentiles. The peculiar hope of the church, in contrast to that of other saints, is alluded to only obliquely and is not the main substance of the revelations in chapters 4 through 19. Eschatology Undoubtedly, the principal contribution of the book of Revelation is in the realm of eschatology. Here is presented not only the eschatology of the church and a few scattered references to the doctrine of the rapture of the church, 225, 3,10-11, but the majestic completion of the prophetic program of the times of Gentiles and Daniel's program for Israel, both culminating in the second coming of Christ. Nowhere else in scripture is there more detailed description of the period just before the second coming with special reference to the great tribulation. The events immediately preceding and following the second coming are also spelled out in detail. Here alone the millennial kingdom is declared to be 1,000 years in length, and a clear distinction is made between the millennium and the eternal state which follows. Emphasis in the book is on the second coming of Christ itself, which stands in sharp relief against the sphere of humiliation depicted in the Gospels. Prominent also are the doctrine of divine judgment upon sin, the doctrine of resurrection, and the doctrine of reward. No book of scripture more specifically sets before the believer in Christ his eternal hope in the new heaven and earth and gives greater assurance of God's triumph over wickedness, rebellion, and unbelief. In a word, the book of Revelation is the eschatological section of the New Testament. Every major theme of prophecy is treated to some extent in this book, with special attention to completion or fulfillment of the prophetic program of God. For this reason, the book of Revelation cannot be understood apart from the 65 books which precede it, although it is in itself a Bible in miniature. 
Prolog, 1 colon 1 dash 3. 1 colon 1 The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to shew unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass, and he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. The opening verse of the first chapter introduces immediately the central theme of the book of Revelation, namely, Jesus Christ in his present and future glory. The futuristic and prophetic character of the book is indicated in the words the revelation of Jesus Christ in which God will declare to John things which must shortly come to pass. The word revelation is the translation of apocalypsis without the article, meaning a revelation, disclosure, or unveiling. It is a revelation of truth about Christ himself, a disclosure of future events, that is, his second coming when Christ will be revealed. It is as well a revelation which comes from Christ. The common title of the book, The Revelation of John, merely identifies the human author. The subject actually is a revelation of Jesus Christ, described as given by God the Father to Christ the Son and then revealed unto his servant. The revelation of the Father to the Son is previously mentioned in John 3 verses 34 to 35, 5 verses 20 to 24, 7 verse 16, 8 verse 28, 12 verse 49, 14 verses 10 and 24, 16 verse 15, 17 colon 8. The substance of the revelation is described as things which must shortly come to pass. CF a similar expression in Dan 2 colon 28 dash 29, 45 and Revelation 4 verse 1, 22 colon 6. That which Daniel declared would occur in the latter days is here described as shortly, gr, in tachii, that is, quickly or suddenly coming to pass, indicating rapidity of execution after the beginning takes place. The idea is not that the event may occur soon, but that when it does, it will be sudden. CF Luke 18 verse 8, Acts 12 verse 7, 22 verse 18, 25 verse 4, Romans 16 verse 20. A similar word, tachys, is translated quickly seven times in Revelation, 2 colon 5, 16, 3 11, 11 14, 22 colon 7, 12, 20. The channel through which the revelation comes from Christ is by his angel unto his servant John. The communication spoken of is signified, while often meaning revelation through symbols, as in this book, includes also revelation through words which communicate the meaning. The name of the angel is not given, though Gabriel has been suggested, C.F. Dan 816, 9 colon 2, 21 to 22, Luke 1 verses 26 to 31. John is declared to be the recipient of the revelation, his name occurring four other times in this book, 1 colon 4, 9, 21 colon 2, 22 colon 8. The best explanation is that the writer is the Apostle John, see introduction. That John should be called a servant, gr, doulos, rather than an apostle is not strange in view of common usage of the term in reference to the apostles in the New Testament, cf Romans 1 verse 1, philosophy 1 colon 1, Titus 1 verse 1, James 1 verse 1, 2 Peter 1 verse 1, Jude 1. The opening verse of this chapter therefore sets forth the basic scheme of the entire book, its subject matter, purpose, angelic channel, as well as its human writer. 1 colon 2 who bear record of the word of God, and of the testimony of Jesus Christ, and of all things that he saw. The expression bear record in verse 2, gr, immartyr sin, occurring three times in this chapter, means to bear witness or to testify. The book of Revelation is not only the word of God, that is, originating in God, but John bears witness of his reception of it. It has the added weight of being the testimony of Jesus Christ, G.R., Martyria, and the record of John is a complete recital of all things that he saw. John is an eyewitness. 1 colon 3 Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. An unusual feature of the opening verses is the special threefold blessing which is invoked in verse 3, 1, blessed is he, singular, that readeth, 2, blessed are they, plural, that hear the words of this prophecy, 3, blessed are they that keep those things which are written therein. 
As all would not have a copy of the book, a special blessing attends the one who reads. Those who hear, however, are also blessed, but for both reader and hearer it is most important that they keep, that is, fulfill, observe, or pay attention to, what is written. All three participles are in the present tense, implying continued reading, hearing, and observing. The book of Revelation is the only book of Scripture containing such a direct promise of blessing. The blessing here pronounced is the first of seven Beatitudes in the book, 1 colon 3, 14 13, 16 15, 19 colon 9, 20 colon 6, 22 colon 7, 14. It seems to anticipate that many would neglect this book or ignore its prophetic revelation. It is singular that the one book in the New Testament which invokes a special blessing on the reader should be often left unread. The book of Revelation is described by the phrase the words of this prophecy, implying that the book as a whole is prophetic. The importance of the prophecy is emphasized by the phrase for the time is at hand, the time, gr, Kairos, referring to a period of time. Daniel mentions this time of the end five times, Dan 8, 17, 11, 35, 40, 12, colon 4, 9. The time is also declared to be at hand in Revelation 22, verse 10, and there are five other references to time, using Kairos, 11, 18, 12, 12, 14, three occurrences in V, 14. A season of time indicated by Kairos is to be contrasted to our, gr, ho, r, a, and time in general, gr, chronos. The expression at hand indicates nearness from the standpoint of prophetic revelation, not necessarily that the event will immediately occur. Salutation, 1 colon 4 dash 8. 1 colon 4 John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you, and peace from him which is, and which was, and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. Having introduced the content and general character of the book which follows, John addresses what he writes to the seven churches which are in Asia, that is, the province of Asia in Asia Minor described as proconsular Asia, including at this time Phrygia, Mysia, Curia, and Lydia. All the seven churches were located in the western half of Asia Minor. The customary invocation of grace and peace common to Paul's letters is used by John here and in his second epistle. These two words capture the richness of the Christian faith, grace embodying God's attitude toward the believer coupled with his loving gifts, and peace speaking of relationship, here especially the peace of God. Grace represents standing, peace represents experience. The eternal God, the source of all grace and peace, is introduced as the one which is, and which was, and which is to come. Because of subsequent references to Christ and the Holy Spirit, this is considered as relating to God the Father. The truth is presented in an unusual grammatical construction which occurs with variations for other times, 1 colon 8, 4 colon 8, 11 17, 16 colon 5. The concept of past, present, and future corresponds to the threefold chronological division of the book itself, 119. Joining the Father in salutation are the seven spirits which are before his throne. Some have considered the term an allusion to the Holy Spirit, cf. Isaiah 11 verses 2-3. Others believe these were seven angels in places of high privilege before the throne of God, cf. 3 colon 1, 4 colon 5, 5 colon 6. The word spirit, gr, pneuma, is commonly used of evil spirits, that is, demons or fallen angels, of the human spirit, cf Mark 8 verse 12, and occasionally of holy angels, cf Hebrews 1 verses 7 and 14. Angels are contrasted to spirits in Acts 23 verses 8 to 9. Those who favor the seven spirits as referring to the Holy Spirit find justification in Isaiah 11. The message originates in God the Father and the Spirit. 1 colon 5 dash 6 and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth. Unto him that loved us, and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion for ever and ever. Amen.
The salutation, according to verse 5, also climactically comes from Christ in his character as the faithful witness, CF 314, the first begotten or, better, the firstborn of the dead, referring to his resurrection, and as the prince or ruler of the kings of the earth. As the faithful witness he fulfilled the role of a prophet, John 18 verse 37. In contrast to those who were previously restored to life only to die again, Christ is the firstborn, the first to receive a resurrection body, which is immortal, CF Acts 26 verse 23. As Christ is the firstborn of every creature, Colossians 1 verse 15, indicating that he was before all creation in time, so Christ was first also in resurrection. His resurrection is out of the mass of men who died. Some manuscripts use ek, out of. Compare a similar selective resurrection for the church, philosophy 311. As Christ is first, cf first fruits, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 20, so others are to follow Christ in his resurrection. Christ and all the righteous dead are included in the first resurrection, Revelation 20 verses 5 to 6. The wicked dead are raised last, after the millennium, 20 colon 12 dash 13. His witness and his resurrection are now past. His fulfillment of the role of ruler of the kings of the earth is future, to be achieved after his victory over the beast and the false prophet, Rev 19, fulfilling Isaiah 9 verses 6 to 7 and many other verses such as Psalm 72 verse 11 and Zechariah 14 verse 9. Special emphasis, however, is given to what has already been accomplished for believers, mentioned in the form of ascription of praise. Christ is the one who keeps on loving us, present tense, and who loosed us, heirs tense, once for all, in or by his own blood. Point 53. Just as Christ has the right to rule, though he is not exercising this right over the kings of the earth now, so believers are made kings 54 and priests, or, better, a kingdom, priests unto God and his Father. Believers form both a priesthood and a kingdom, cf. 1 Peter 2 verse 9, Revelation 5 verse 10. The full manifestation and exercise of prerogatives of this royal priesthood are subject to future manifestations. To such a Savior and Lord the right to everlasting glory and dominion is attributed, cf. Dan 7.14, and John's benediction of worship and praise. To this the apostle adds, Amen, so be it. 1 colon 7 Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, Amen. Introduced by the first of many instances of behold or see, announcement is made in verse 7 of the glorious second coming of Christ, one of the central revelations of the book. The present tense of he cometh has been interpreted by some as the prophetic foreview out of place chronologically, but it can be simply understood as the futuristic use of the present in which a future action is stated as already coming to pass. It is an emphatic form of declaration, CF I will come again, lit, I come again, John 14 verse 3. As Christ was received by a cloud in his ascension, Acts 1 verse 9, so he will come in the clouds of heaven, Matt, 2400 hours 30, 26 colon 64, Mark 13 verse 26, 14 verse 62, Luke 21 verse 27. Clouds are also mentioned in Daniel 7 verse 13, but this seems to be a scene in heaven rather than on earth. In Revelation 14 verses 14 and 16, the Son of Man is pictured sitting on a cloud. In contrast to the event of the ascension, when clouds removed Christ from sight, at his second coming every eye shall see him, C.F. Matt, 2400 hours 30, Mark 13 verse 26, Luke 21 verse 27. There is no indication that the world as a whole will see Christ at the time of the rapture of the church. At his coming to establish his kingdom, however, all will see him. Especially mentioned is the fact that they who pierced him will behold his coming. This creates a problem in that those who crucified Christ are now dead. 
The difficulty is solved by reference to Zechariah 12 verse 10 where Jehovah declares, And I will pour upon the house of David, and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and of supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him, as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him, as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. Not only Israel as a nation shall behold him, but also all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. This expression is almost identical to that found in Matthew 24 verse 30, where it states, Then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. To this John adds, Even so, Amen. The Greek word Amen is a transliteration of a Hebrew word of similar sound meaning truth or faithfulness, hence the meaning be it true or so be it. An Old Testament illustration of its use is found in Isaiah 65 verse 16 in the twice-repeated phrase, the God of truth. Christ is called the Amen in Revelation 3 verse 14, with the added description, the faithful and true witness. In John 14 verse 6, Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. 1 colon 8, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is, and which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. In concluding the salutation in verse 8, Christ is quoted as declaring himself to be the Alpha and the Omega, the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet, and the beginning and the ending, that is, the Eternal One. The eternity, present power, and future glory of Christ are in view. The description of the Father given in verse 4 is then repeated concluding with the title the Almighty, G.R. Pantocrato R., a word which occurs ten times in the New Testament, nine instances being in Revelation. It is probable that verse 8 applies to Christ and the ascription of eternity of verse 4 to the Father. There is no reason, however, why eternity should not be ascribed to Christ as well as to the Father. C.F. Revelation 1 verses 10 to 18. 22.12-13 Jesus Christ is the central figure of the opening eight verses of Revelation. As the source of Revelation he is presented in verse 1. As the channel of the word and testimony of God he is cited in verse 2. His blessings through his revealed word are promised in verse 3. In verse 5 he is the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. He is revealed to be the source of all grace who loves us and cleanses us from our sins through his shed blood. He is the source of our royal priesthood who has the right to gather in himself all glory and dominion forever. He is promised to come with clouds, attended with great display of power and glory, and every eye shall see the one who died for men. He is the Almighty One of eternity past and eternity future. If no more had been written than that contained in this introductory portion of chapter 1, it would have constituted a tremendous restatement of the person and work of Christ such as found in no comparable section of Scripture. The Vision of Christ Glorified, 1.9-18 1.9 1 First John, who also am your brother, and companion in tribulation, and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos, for the word of God, and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. The important facts which form the background for the revelation are introduced at this point. Though John mentions his name twice before, this is the first of three instances of the expression 1 John, CF 21 2, 22:8. In the Gospel of John, he refers to himself as the disciple which testifieth of these things, John 21 verse 24. In his epistles, John describes himself as an elder, 2 John 1, 3 John 1. Here, John describes himself only as brother and companion of the seven churches in their trouble. He was, of course, well known to the churches to whom the book is addressed. He was bound by ties of spiritual life and kinship and therefore was a companion, partaker or sharer, with them in their time of tribulation. He snared not only trouble, however, but their place in the kingdom and patience in Jesus. In the Greek text, the expression is more compact by omission of prepositions, hence reading, brother and companion in tribulation, kingdom, and patience in Jesus. 55 The word patience, gr, hypomon, connotes the hope of faith which issues in endurance. 
the best texts omit the word Christ. John himself is in trial, being in exile on the Isle of Patmos because of his active preaching of the word of God and his testimony concerning Jesus Christ, cf. 1 Peter 4 verses 12 to 19. The exile of John to the Isle of Patmos is in itself a moving story of devotion to Christ crowned with suffering. This small island, rocky and forbidding in its terrain, about 10 miles long and 6 miles wide, is located in the Aegean Sea southwest of Ephesus just beyond the island of Samos. Early church fathers such as Irenaeus, Clement of Alexandria, and Eusebius state that John was sent to this island as an exile under the ruler Domitian. See Introduction According to Victorinus, John, though aged, was forced to labor in the mines located at Patmos. Early sources also indicate that about A.D. 96, at Domitian's death, John was allowed to return to Ephesus when the Emperor Nerva was in power. It was in these bleak circumstances, shut off from friends and human fellowship, that John was given the most extensive revelation of future things shown to any writer of the New Testament. Though men could circumscribe his human activities, they could not bind the Spirit of God nor the testimony of Jesus Christ. John's experiences paralleled those of the Old Testament prophets. Moses wrote the Pentateuch in the wilderness. David wrote many psalms while being pursued by Saul. Isaiah lived in difficult days and died a martyr's death. Ezekiel wrote in exile. Jeremiah's life was one of trial and persecution. Peter wrote his two letters shortly before martyrdom. Thus in the will of God the final written revelation was given to John while suffering for Christ and the gospel. 1 colon 10 11 I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying I am Alpha and Omega the first and the last and what thou sayest write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. John's statement in verse 10 that he was in the Spirit refers to his experience of being carried beyond normal sense into a state where God could reveal supernaturally the contents of this book. Such was the experience of Ezekiel, Ezekiel 2 verse 2, 3 verses 12 and 14, etc., Peter, Acts 10 verses 10 to 11, 11, 5, and Paul, Acts 22 verses 17 to 18. The expression on the Lord's day has been taken by some to refer to the first day of the week, by others to the day of the Lord. The word Lord in this passage is actually an adjective used in the sense of Lord in. Though today the expression is used commonly of the first day of the week, it is nowhere so used in the Bible. The day of Christ's resurrection is consistently referred to as the first day of the week and never as the Lord's day, Matt 28 1, Mark 16 verses 2 and 9, Luke 24 verse 1, John 20 verses 1 and 19, Acts 20 verse 7, 1 Corinthians 16 verse 2. It is true that the same adjective, gr, kyriakos, is found in 1 Corinthians 11 verse 20 referring to the Lord's Supper characteristically observed by the early church on the first day of the week. Moulton and Milligan also call attention to the fact that the word is frequently used outside the Bible in the sense of imperial and sight dicemen, that the distinctive title Lord's Day may have been connected with the conscious feelings of protest against the cult of the emperor with its emperor's day. There is no solid evidence, however, that the expression used by John was ever intended to refer to the first day of the week. It is rather a reference to the day of the Lord of the Old Testament, an extended period of time in which God deals in judgment and sovereign rule over the earth. Point 57 The adjectival form can be explained on the ground that in the Old Testament there was no adjectival form for Lord, and therefore the noun had to be used. The New Testament term is therefore the equivalent to the Old Testament expression, the day of the Lord. On the basis of the evidence, the interpretation is therefore preferred that John was projected forward to the future day of the Lord. It is questionable in any case whether the amazing revelation given in the entire book could have been conveyed to John in one 24-hour day, and it is more probable that it consisted of a series of revelations. 
Although John was far removed from fellow Christians and the possibility of spiritual fellowship, he was given instead the transcending experience of seeing the Lord in glory and the unique revelations contained in the book he wrote. Point 58. While in the Spirit, John heard a great voice as of a trumpet. The speaker is identified in verse 11 as the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. This is undoubtedly a reference to Christ, CF 1 colon 8, 17. Some texts omit this description of Christ and begin immediately with what thou sayest. John is given the command to write what he sees in keeping with 1 colon 2. The command to write, found 12 times in the book, indicates that John was to write after seeing each vision, in contrast to 10 colon 4, where he is told not to write. The message of the entire book is to be sent to each of the seven churches along with the particular message to the individual church. The seven churches are mentioned in the order of the letters of chapters 2 and 3, based on their location geographically. There seems to have been no superintending organization over these seven churches at this time, and Christ deals directly with the local church. For the location and characteristics of each of these seven churches, see chapters 2 and 3. One twelve, And I turned to see the voice that spake with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. The unusual expression, I turned to see the voice that spake with me, in verse 12 is obviously a figure of speech meaning that he turned to see the one who spoke. Having turned, he sees the seven candlesticks. John then records the vision, I saw seven golden candlesticks, more accurately translated, seven golden lampstands. In the tabernacle and in the temple one of the items of equipment was a seven-branched lampstand, a single stand with three lamps on each side and one lamp in the center forming the central shaft. It would seem from the description here that instead of one lampstand with seven lamps there are seven separate lampstands each made of gold and arranged in a circle. The symbolism of the lampstands is explained in verse 20. The seven lampstands represent the seven churches and are significant symbols of the churches in their principal function of giving forth light. The golden medal, as in the tabernacle and Solomon's temple, represents the deity and glory of Christ, and the implied olive oil is symbolic of the power of the Spirit issuing in witness. 1 colon 13 dash 16 and in the midst of the seven candlesticks one like unto the son of man clothed with a garment down to the foot and girt about the paps with a golden girdle his head and his hairs were white like wool as white as snow and his eyes were as a flame of fire and his feet like unto fine brass as if they burned in a furnace and his voice as the sound of many waters and he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. Christ is portrayed in verse 13 as in the midst of the lampstands, that is, in the midst of the seven churches. The title assigned to him is that of the Son of Man, a frequent title in the Gospels, but infrequent in Revelation, being found only once more, 1414. The title emphasizes his humanity and messianic character. The description which follows is a symbolic representation of the attributes of Christ in special relationship to the events which are portrayed in the book of Revelation. His being clothed with a garment to his feet is best explained by the clothing of a priest and judge, like Aaron's robe being designed for glory and beauty, Exodus 28 verse 2. The golden girdle corresponds to that used by the high priest to bind his garments higher on the body than at the loins. Josephus explains this as being in keeping with the dignity and majesty of the high priest and as being designed to allow greater freedom in movement. The golden girdle corresponds to the girdle of the high priest which has golden thread in it, but here it is made entirely of gold. The somber presence of Christ in his role as judge and priest in the midst of the churches is a significant introduction to chapters 2 and 3. The graphic description of Christ given in verse 14 and following verses portrays various aspects of his deity. The fact that his head and his hair are as white as snow corresponds to the vision of God described in Daniel 7 verse 9, where the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. The reference to the fact that his eyes were as a flame of fire, 
and his feet unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace corresponds to Daniel's description, his throne was like the fiery flames, and his wheels as burning fire. The Ancient of Days in Daniel's vision, Dan 7 colon 13 dash 14, is represented to be the father or the first person of the Trinity to whom the Son of Man, that is, Christ, comes to receive power and authority over the entire world. The attributes of the Father, however, are also attributes of the Son to whom power and authority have been given and who with the Father possesses all the attributes of God. The fact that his head and his hair are white like snow seems to have the primary significance of complete purity rather than age, but may imply also the eternity of the Son of Man in his divine nature. His eyes as a flame of fire speak of the searching righteousness and divine judgment upon all that is impure. This is further emphasized in verse 15 where his feet are described like unto fine brass burning in a furnace. The metal described as brass or, more properly, bronze, a copper alloy, symbolizes divine judgment as embodied in the Old Testament types of the brazen altar and other items of brass used in connection with sacrifice for sin, cf. Exodus 38 verse 30. The burning brass, which may be taken as highly refined brass, represents Christ standing in the midst of the churches on the basis of divine and righteous judgment portrayed both in the fire and in the metal mentioned. Representation of his attributes is completed by the declaration that his voice boomed as the sound of many waters. The scene which John saw is accompanied by the tremendous sound of many waters used to describe the thundering voice of the Son of God revealing the majesty and power before which human authority must bow. Three additional aspects of the revelation are mentioned in verse 16. John records that in the right hand of the Son of God were seven stars. Stauffer relates the seven stars to a gold coin minted in A.D. 83 by Domitian, picturing the dead child of Domitian, sitting on the globe of heaven, playing with the stars. The legend runs Diva Caesar Imp Domitiani F., the divine Caesar, son of the emperor Domitian. The seven stars indicate the seven planets, a symbol of heavenly dominion over the world. Point 59. The symbolism of the seven planets originated in Crete where the mythical god Zeus was born. On Cretan coins he is shown playing on a heavenly globe, symbolizing a rule over the world from heaven. Stauffer further observes, In the context of Domitian's whole coinage this means that the imperial Zeus child, who has been exalted to be lord of the stars, ushers in the age of universal salvation which is to come point sixty. The mystery of the seven stars is defined in the scriptures, however, in verse 20, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. The heavenly messengers ordinarily indicated by the word angel seem here to refer to messengers from the seven churches rather than to the seven stars on Domitian's coins. It is possible that these messengers had come actually to the Isle of Patmos, but it is more probable that they refer to the leaders in these churches to whom the messages primarily are addressed. The spiritual significance is that these angels are messengers who are responsible for the spiritual welfare of these seven churches and are in the right hand of the Son of Man, indicating possession, protection, and sovereign control. As the churches were to emit light as a lampstand, the leaders of the churches were to project light as stars. Christ is described as having a sharp two-edged sword proceeding out of his mouth, representing divine judgment corresponding to that given in Revelation 19 verse 15 where it is recorded, And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. As Vegetia stated, the Romans were accustomed to using the sword as a principal weapon of offense. They were instructed to use it in such a way as not to expose themselves to a thrust from their enemy. They were to employ the sword in a stabbing action, as a stroking movement with its edge would seldom kill an enemy. The objective was to kill, not merely to wound. Hence, as used here in Revelation, it implies slaying the wicked point 61 the particular word used for sword, gr, romphea, here refers to a long and heavy sword mentioned five other times in the book of Revelation. By contrast, a different word for sword is used in Hebrews 4 verse 12 where it speaks of the word of God as quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. 
The sword mentioned in Revelation has the character of a sword of devastating judgment rather than a sword uncovering unbelief as in Hebrews 4 verse 12 and indicates the omnipotence and sovereignty of the Son of Man. The concluding reference in verse 16 is to the brilliant glory of his countenance represented by the sun shining in his strength. The bright light which seems to attend the glory of God was that which blinded Paul on the road to Damascus and that which is the terror of the sinner as well as the assurance of the saint. In their glorified body, saints will be able to see the glory of God. The assurance is given in 1 John 3 verse 2, We know that, when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. In this revelation of the Son of Man are seen the attributes of omnipotence, righteousness, sovereignty, majesty, truth, and love. 1 colon 17-18 And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last, I am he that liveth, and was dead, and, behold, I am alive for evermore, amen, and have the keys of hell and of death. The majesty and the glory of the vision as seen by John were such that he records in verse 17, And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. In contrast to those periods of intimate fellowship which characterized John's relationship with Christ in his earthly life when frequently John laid his head upon the bosom of the Savior and had intimate fellowship with him, John is now in the presence of the glorified Son of God whose power and majesty are no longer veiled and whose righteousness is revealed to be a consuming fire. The revelation of God and his glory on other occasions in the Bible had a similar stunning effect, as illustrated in the case of Abraham, Genesis 17 verse 3, Manoah, Judges 13 verse 20, Ezekiel, Ezekiel 3 verse 23, 43 verse 3, 44 to 4, Daniel, Dan 8 17, 10 to 8 dash 9, 15 to 17, and the disciples on the Mount of Transfiguration, Matt 17 to 6. Those who do not fall down before God at the revelation of His glory and majesty are brought to immediate self-judgment and reverent fear as illustrated in the case of Gideon, Judges 6 verses 22 to 23, Job, Job 42 verses 5 to 6, Isaiah, Isaiah 6 verse 5, Zacharias, Luke 1 verse 12, and Peter, Luke 5 verse 8. In compassion toward the disciple whom he loved, Christ laid his right hand upon John and assured him, Fear not, I am the first and the last. Revelation 1 verse 17 The very sovereignty of God revealed in the earlier verses, though the terror of the wicked, is the comfort of the saint. In verses 17 and 18 the eternity of Christ is described in the expression the first and the last found in some texts in verse 11. As the eternal one, he is the one who lives, present tense, i.e., lives continually, who in time died, and in resurrection is alive forevermore. As the one who conquered death, he has the keys of hell and of death. The expression was dead as literally became dead, the state of death, in contrast to his being alive from eternity past and living on into eternal future. The statement that he has the keys of hell and of death implies that he is sovereign over physical death, which terminates life in this world as well as over hell, gr, Hades, the life after death. The Greek word Hades commonly translated hell refers to the intermediate state and is to be distinguished from the lake of fire or Gehenna, which refers to the eternal state. To avoid confusion, it is better to transliterate the word Hades and to use the word hell as referring to the eternal state only. The confusion is in the translation, not the original. In his death and resurrection, Christ wrested from Satan any authority the devil may have had over death. Cf. Hebrews 2 verses 14 to 15. In some texts, the order is reversed to read and have the keys of death and hell. As Christ possesses the key or authority over death, no man can die apart from divine permission even though afflicted by Satan and in trial and trouble. As the one who is in authority over Hades, Christ is sovereign over the life to come. John commissioned to write 1 colon 19-20 1 colon 19-20 Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter, the mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. 
The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. John, restored to normal activity, is commanded in verse 19, Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. Though many outlines have been suggested for the book of Revelation, none seems to be more practical or illuminating than the threefold outline given here. Point 62 The things referred to as having already been seen are those contained in chapter 1 where John had his preliminary vision. This vision, of course, introduces the main subject of the entire book, Jesus Christ the Glorious Coming King. The second division, the things which are, most naturally includes chapters 2 and 3 with the seven messages Christ delivered to the churches. This contemporary situation gives the historical context for the revelation which follows. The third division, the things which shall be hereafter, would naturally include the bulk of the book which was to be prophetic as anticipated in 1 colon 3 in the expression the words of this prophecy. The advantage of this outline is that it deals in a natural way with the material rather than seizing on incidentals as some expositors have done or avoiding any outline at all, as is true of other expositors. It is not too much to claim that this outline is the only one which allows the book to speak for itself without artificial manipulation and which lays guidelines of sufficient importance so that expositors who follow this approach have been able to establish a system of interpretation of the book of Revelation, namely, the Futurist School. It is significant that practically all other approaches to the book of Revelation yield widely differing interpretations in which there is little uniformity when one interpreter is compared to the next. The Futurist School at least agrees on some of its main lines of interpretation. The decision to follow this outline is a major one and can only be supported by the self-consistency of the interpretation of the book as a whole to which it gives rise. Further support will also be found in the exposition of chapter 4 with its evidence for prophecy of future events. Criswell, commenting on the threefold outline here, states, Is there a key to this book from God? Does God have an analysis of it? Does God have an interpretation? Is there something from heaven by which we can study the meaning of these visions? Yes, there is. When I was a student in school, I remember some lecturers saying that there was a key to the interpretation and the meaning of the revelation possessed in ancient times, but that key has been lost and we do not possess it today. Therefore, those lecturers concluded, the book is an enigma to us. I have learned just the opposite of that as I have studied the book. The same key that those first and primitive Christians had in the Roman province of Asia to whom the letters were addressed, we have today because the key is written here in the first chapter of the book itself. This is the grand foundation. This is the great starting point. This is the key to the meaning of this vast outline of God's future point 63. Baines, while accepting the threefold division of Revelation based on verse 19, notes that the things which thou hast seen is by nature of introduction, the things which are is properly the first division. The second division relates to judgments falling on the earth before the second advent, followed by the third division dealing with the reign of Christ, the millennium, and the eternal state. Point 64. The concluding verse in chapter 1 gives the key to the symbolism of the preceding revelation. The mystery of the seven stars is revealed to be a representation of the messengers to the churches, and the seven golden lampstands are the churches themselves. It is significant as indicated in this verse that the revelation embodied in this book, though often in symbols, is designed to reveal truth, not to hide it. Though all the symbols are not explained, in the great majority of cases the symbols are interpreted in one way or another in the Word of God. The first chapter, emphasizing as it does the glory of Christ, is in essence the theme of the entire book moving progressively to the climax, the second coming of Christ in power and glory to the earth, and chapter 19. The spiritual significance of the person of Christ and his coming to judge the world is applied in chapters 2 and 3 to the spiritual problems of the contemporary church, and forms the second major division of the entire book. Introduction in the second chapter of the book of Revelation, the second major division of the book begins. 
As previously mentioned, chapter 1 seems to fulfill the command of 119, write the things which thou hast seen. Beginning in chapter 4, the material deals with the things which shall be hereafter, 119. In chapters 2 and 3 the messages to the seven churches are referred to as the things which are, cf 119. These messages, therefore, contain divine revelation and exhortation pertaining to the present age, and, having special pertinence in the present situation in the church, they constitute one of the most incisive and penetrating exhortations in the entire New Testament in relation to church doctrine and Christian living. It is remarkable that so little attention has been paid to the importance of these two chapters. Archbishop Trench is cited by Cease as lamenting that the Church of England omits reference to any of the material in these two chapters in portions selected for use in public services. Trench writes, It is, to be regretted that while every chapter of every other book of the New Testament is set forth to be read in the Church, and, wherever there is daily service, is read in the Church, three times in the year, and some, or portions of some, oftener, while even of the Apocalypse itself two chapters and portions of others have been admitted into the service, under no circumstances whatever can the second and third chapters ever be heard in the congregation. Point 65. In the revival of interest in eschatology in the twentieth century, there has been a partial remedy of the previous neglect of the Book of Revelation including special attention to the messages to the seven churches. Recent studies such as the Postman of Patmos by C. A. Hagi Antonia have helped to dramatize the living character of these letters in the modern church, and the attention to their contribution has been duly given by competent New Testament scholars. It remains true, however, that many casual worshippers in Christian churches today who are quite familiar with the Sermon on the Mount are not aware of die existence of these seven messages of Christ. Their incisive character and pointed denunciation of departure from biblical morality and theology have tended to keep them out of the mainstream of contemporary theological thought. Many of the evils and shortcomings which exist in the church today are a direct outgrowth of neglect of the solemn instruction given to these seven churches. There has been some debate concerning the theological significance of these seven churches. It is obvious as there were many churches located in the area where these churches were found, that God divinely selected seven and seven only, and did not send messages to other churches that conceivably might have been more important. Sweet states that there were from 500 to 1,000 townships in the province of Asia in the first century, some of them far larger than the cities of Thyatira and Philadelphia and undoubtedly a number of them had Christian churches. Point 66. He suggests that the answer to the problem of selection is found in the geographical location of the seven churches in the form of a gentle arch and located on a circular road connecting the most populous part of the province. The messages directed to these seven churches should therefore be considered as sent to the rest of the province and other churches as well. The geographical order of presentation is followed beginning at Ephesus, moving north to Smyrna, then farther north to Pergamos, then east to Thyatira, south to Sardis, east to Philadelphia, and southeast to Laodicea. However, other churches in the area were ignored, such as the church at Colossae and the churches at Magnesia, Manisa, and Trollis. It is understandable that the number of churches should be limited to seven as this is the number of completeness or universality in the scripture, but there undoubtedly were other principles which determined the selection. First of all, each church needed a particular message, and the spiritual state of each church corresponded precisely to the exhortation which was given. The selection of the churches was also governed by the fact that each church was in some way normative and illustrated conditions common in local churches at that time as well as throughout later history. The messages to the seven churches therefore embody admonition suitable for churches in many types of spiritual need. Along with the messages to the churches were exhortations which are personal in character constituting instruction and warning to the individual Christian. Each of the messages as given to the churches therefore ends in a personal exhortation beginning with the phrase, He that hath an ear, let him hear. 
Many expositors believe that in addition to the obvious implication of these messages, the seven churches represent the chronological development of church history viewed spiritually. They note that Ephesus seems to be characteristic of the apostolic period in general and that the progression of evil climaxing in Laodicea seems to indicate the final state of apostasy of the church. This point of view is postulated upon a providential arrangement of these churches not only in a geographical order but by divine purpose, presenting also a progress of Christian experience corresponding to church history. As in all scriptural illustrations, however, it is obvious that every detail of the messages addressed to these particular churches is not necessarily fulfilled in succeeding periods of church history. What is claimed is that there does seem to be a remarkable progression in the messages. It would seem almost incredible that such a progression should be a pure accident, and the order of the messages to the churches seems to be divinely selected to give prophetically the main movement of church history. Milligan is quite opposed to the idea that the seven churches represent chronological periods. If we examine the tables of such a period drawn up by different inquirers, we shall find them so utterly divergent as to prove fatal to the principle upon which they are constructed. No one has been able to prepare a chronological scheme making even an approach to general acceptance. The history of the Church cannot be portioned off into seven successive periods marked by characteristics to which those noted in the seven epistles correspond. Besides this, the whole idea rests upon that historical interpretation of the Apocalypse which is simply destructive both of the meaning and influence of the book.67. The prophetic interpretation of the messages to the seven churches, to be sure, should not be pressed beyond bounds, as it is a deduction from the content, not from the explicit statement of the passage. It is fully in keeping with the futurist point of view rather than the historic, as Milligan claims. It is not necessary to hold, as some have, that without the second and third chapters of the book of Revelation the Church would be left without instruction regarding its progress in the present age. Other passages such as 1 Timothy 4 and 2 Peter 2-3 give information on this subject. Much additional light, however, is given by a study of the messages to the seven churches, and the general trend indicated confirms other scripture that, instead of progressive improvement and a trend toward righteousness and peace in the church age, it may be expected that the age will end in failure as symbolized in the church of Laodicea. This is taught expressly in passages describing the growing apostasy in the professing church culminating in the apostate Christendom of the time of the Great Tribulation. Simultaneous with this development in the church as a whole, there will be fulfillment of the divine plan of God in calling out a true church designed to be a holy bride for the Son of God and a promised translation from the earth before the final tragic scenes of the tribulation are enacted. Each message addressed to the seven churches of Asia has its own distinctive characteristics, but there are also many similarities. Each message begins with the expression, I know thy works. Each offers a promise, to him that overcometh. Although there is variation in the order, each has the same concluding sentence, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Each of the messages begins with an introduction in which the Lord Jesus is described, but in each message the description differs in keeping with the message addressed to the church. Most of the letters to the churches contain words of warning as well as promise to those who hear and respond. In general, these messages are letters of reproof, rebuke, and reassurance. The letter to Ephesus, the church without love, 2 colon 1 7. 2 colon 1 unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Christ the Sovereign Judge. The first letter is addressed to the angel or messenger of the Church of Ephesus. The Greek word agalos, which has been transliterated in the English word angel, is frequently used in the Bible of angels, and this seems to be its principal use as noted by Arndt and Gingrich.68. However, it is often used also of men in Greek literature as a whole, and in several instances this word referred to human messengers in the Bible 
Matt 11 10, Mark 1 verse 2, Luke 7 verses 24 and 27, 9 52. It is properly understood here as referring to human messengers to these seven churches. These messengers were probably the pastors of these churches or prophets through whom the message was to be delivered to the congregation. The messenger of the church at Ephesus, which at that time was a large metropolitan city, was undoubtedly an important person and a leader in Christian testimony at that time. When the book of Revelation was written, Ephesus, the most prominent city in the Roman province of Asia, had already had a long history of Christian witness. Paul had ministered there for three years as recorded in Acts 19. The effectiveness of his ministry is stated in Acts 19 verse 10, All they which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. The preaching of the gospel had affected the worship of Diana, in whose honor the temple of Diana had been built in Ephesus, a structure considered one of the seven wonders of the world. The reduction in the sale of idols of Diana and the Christian teaching that these idols were not worthy of worship resulted in the riot recorded in Acts 19 verses 23 to 41. Demetrius, a leader among the silversmiths in Ephesus, called a meeting of his fellow craftsmen and addressed them in these words, Sirs, ye know that by this craft we have our wealth. Moreover ye see and hear, that not alone at Ephesus, but almost throughout all Asia, this Paul hath persuaded and turned away much people, saying that they be no gods, which are made with hands, so that not only this our craft is in danger to be set at naught, but also that the temple of the great goddess Diana should be despised, and her magnificence should be destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worship. Acts 19 verses 25-27 The resulting riot forced Paul's departure from Ephesus, but the incident is a remarkable testimony to the power and effectiveness of early Christian witness in this important city. After Paul's ministry at Ephesus came to a close, Evidence indicates that Timothy for many years led the work as superintendent of the churches in the area. There is reason to believe that the Apostle John himself, now exiled on Patmos, had succeeded Timothy as the pastor at large in Ephesus. It was to this church and to Christians living in Ephesus at the close of the first century, some thirty years after Paul, that the first of the seven messages is addressed. Christ is introduced in the message to Ephesus as the one who holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. This portrayal of Christ corresponding to that given early in the first chapter of Revelation is a symbolic presentation of the fact that Christ holds the messengers of these churches in his right hand, a place of sovereign protection as well as divine authority over them. The word for hold, gr, kraton, means to hold authoritatively. The messengers, therefore, are held in divine protection and under divine control. Earlier, John had written of the security of the believer in the hands of an Almighty God in John 10 verses 28 to 29, And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. The same truth is presented symbolically in this vision of Christ. 2 2-3 I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles, and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne, and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast labored, and hast not fainted. Commendation of Doctrine and Diligence The second important fact in this vision, Christ walking in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks or lampstands, gr, lichnio n, symbolizes his presence and observation of the testimony of the churches of Asia. His message to the church is based on his knowledge of their notable and commendable works. He mentions their labor or toil, their patience or steadfastness, their abhorrence of those who were evil, and their ready detection of false teachers who claimed to be apostles, but who were not. These remarkable characteristics are sorely needed in the church today where too often there is failure to serve the Lord patiently, and the tendency is to compromise both with moral and theological evil. 
The Ephesian church is therefore commended for abhorring that which is morally bad as well as that which is theologically in error. In contrast to the fact that they could not bear those who were evil, he commends them for continuing to bear their proper burdens, repeating again the fact that they have patience, literally, that they keep on having patience, which is an advance on the statement in verse 2. Likewise it is noted that their labor is motivated as work for my name's sake and that they have not fainted or grown weary. These remarkable characteristics establish the fact that the church had served the Lord well, and few modern churches could qualify for such commendation. 2 4-5 Nevertheless I have something against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. Indictment for lack of devotion. In spite of these most desirable traits Christ declared that the church at Ephesus had failed in one important matter, namely, thou hast left thy first love. In the Greek, the order of the words is especially emphatic in that the object of the verb is before the verb, thy first love thou hast left. The word for love, gr, agape, n, is the deepest and most meaningful word for love found in the Greek language. Though they had not departed completely from love for God, their love no longer had the fervency, depth, or meaning it once had had in the church. The spiritual problem of the church at Ephesus can best be seen in the perspective of the threefold nature of man's spiritual poverty. Some spiritual needs stem from lack of faith in God so that the individual either falls short of salvation itself, or, if saved, he lacks an abiding dependence on God and the promises of his word. This constitutes a defect in the area of the intellect or in theology. The second problem of spiritual experience is in the exercise of human will. Many who have trusted in God have never yielded themselves completely to God, and as a result have not been filled with the Spirit. There is no indication that the Church had seriously fallen short in either of these two spiritual areas. Their defect was a matter of heart rather than of head or will. The ardor which they once had had grown cold. In the letter to the Ephesians, written some thirty years before in the early days of the history of this Church, Paul commended them for their love for all saints. He wrote at that time, Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Ephesians 1 verses 15-16 The church seems to have fulfilled the same commendable qualities found in the apostolic church in Jerusalem. The period following Pentecost, described in Acts 2, was characterized by love and devotion for Christ himself a love for the Word of God, a love manifested in fellowship with the saints and in their prayer to God, and a love expressed in commendation to Timothy of all them also that love is appearing, 2 Timothy 4 verse 8. The church at Ephesus was now in its second generation of Christians, those who had come into the church in the thirty years since Paul had ministered in their midst. Though they continued to labor faithfully as those who had preceded them, the love of God which characterized the first generation was missing. This cooling of heart which had overtaken them in relationship to God was a dangerous forerunner of spiritual apathy which later was to erase all Christian testimony in this important center of Christian influence. Thus it has ever been in the history of the Church, first a cooling of spiritual love, then the love of God replaced by a love for the things of the world, with resulting compromise and spiritual corruption. This is followed by departure from the faith and loss of effective spiritual testimony. In other portions of Scripture the danger of fading love for God is described. In Paul's first letter to Timothy he wrote, For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith, and pierced themselves through with many sorrows, 1 Timothy 6 verse 10. In similar vein the Apostle John wrote in one epistle, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him, 1 John 2 verse 15. The danger of substituting love for idols for love for God is stated in the closing verse of the same epistle, 
Little children, keep yourselves from idols, 1 John 5 verse 21. Even loved ones can stand between the child of God and his love for his heavenly Father. Christ himself said, He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me, Matt 1037. Even the God-given institution of marriage can stand in the way of a true love for God. As Paul wrote to the Corinthians, the unmarried woman careth for the things of the Lord, that she may be holy both in body and in spirit, but she that is married careth for the things of the world, how she may please her husband, 1 Corinthians 7 verse 34. Whatever the object of love, anything which hinders a true love for God may cause a Christian to lose his first love even as was true of Ephesus so long ago. To correct the spiritual declension into which they had fallen, the Lord directs three urgent exhortations. First he commands, Remember, therefore from whence thou art fallen. To correct any departure from God the first step is to go back to the place of departure. Ephesian Christians were therefore exhorted to remember the ardor which once gripped their hearts, the causes for it, the wonder of their newfound salvation, and the joy and satisfaction that were theirs in Christ. So often spiritual defection, whether of mind or heart, comes from forgetting that which once was known. The second aspect of his exhortation is embodied in the word repent, gr, mennozen, meaning, to change the mind. They were to have a different attitude toward Christ and should resume that fervent love which once they had. In keeping with these first two exhortations, the final one is embodied in the words, do the first works. A true love for God is always manifested in the works which it produces. Though the Ephesian church had been faithful in many appointed tasks, these did not in themselves reflect a true love for God. They were not merely bond slaves of Jesus Christ bound by legal obligation, but they were those whose hearts had been given to the Savior. The Ephesian Christians were also sharply warned that if they did not heed the exhortation, they could expect sudden judgment and removal of the candlestick. As Alfred comments, this is not Christ's final coming but his coming in special judgment is here indicated, 69 the meaning seems to be that he would remove the church as a testimony for Christ. This, of course, was tragically fulfilled ultimately. The church retained its vigor for several centuries and was not only the seat of eastern bishops, but also the meeting place of the Third General Council, which took place in AD 431 and was held in the Church of St. Mary, whose ruins are still extant today. Ephesus declined as a city, however, after the 5th century, and the Turks deported its remaining inhabitants in the 14th century. The city, now uninhabited, is one of the important ruins in that area, located seven miles from the sea due to accumulation of silt which has stopped up the harbor of this once important seaport. 2 colon 6 But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitanes, which I also hate. Commendation of Hating the Enemies of Truth Coupled with the exhortation to repent is the final word of approbation in verse 6 in which the Ephesian church is commended for hating the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Much scholarly speculation has arisen concerning the precise nature of this group's error. Point seventy: The Nicolaitans apparently were a sect, and some have interpreted their name as meaning conquering of the people from Nikkeo, meaning to conquer and Laos, meaning the people. This view considers the Nicolaitans as the forerunners of the clerical hierarchy superimposed upon the laity and robbing them of spiritual freedom. Others have considered them as a licentious sect advocating complete freedom in Christian conduct, including participation in heathen feasts and free love. Alfred states, the prevailing opinion among the fathers was that they were a sect founded by Nicholas, the proselyte of Antioch, one of the seven deacons, 71 Alfred believes that this is substantially correct, and that it is supported by the statement which I also hate, v. 6, concerning which Alfred states, This strong expression in the mouth of our Lord unquestionably points at deeds of abomination and impurity, cf. Isaiah 61 verse 8, Jeremiah 44 verse 4, Amos 5 verse 21, Zech 8 colon 17, 72 that which was hated by. The Ephesians was embraced by the church at Pergamos according to Revelation 2 verse 15. 
Whatever the precise nature of this sect, it is noteworthy that a true love for God involves a fervent hate of that which counterfeits and distorts the purity of biblical truth. David raised the same question when he wrote, Do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee? And am not I grieved with those that rise up against thee? I hate them with perfect hatred, I count them mine enemies, Psalms 139 verses 21-22. Though the Christian, like God, should love the world in the sense of desiring to extend to it the benefits of salvation, like David he should hate those who are the enemies of God. 2 colon 7 He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches, to him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. The Invitation and Promise The letter to the Ephesians, like the other six letters, closes with an invitation and a promise, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Though the message is directed to the church as such through its pastor, the individual is urged to respond to the exhortation and warning. So it is ever that God speaks to the ones who will hear. Similarly to the closing messages to other churches, the message to the church at Ephesus contains a promise given to those who overcome, to him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. The promise here mentioned for overcomers is not a message to a special group of Christians distinguished by their spirituality and power in contrast to genuine Christians who lack these qualities, it is rather a general description of that which is normal, to be expected among those who are true followers of the Lord. The Apostle John in his first epistle asks, Who is he that overcometh the world? 1 John 5 verse 5 He answers the question, he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. In other words, those in the Ephesian church who were genuine Christians and by this token had overcome the unbelief and sin of the world are promised the right to the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. This tree, first mentioned in the Garden of Eden in Genesis 3 verse 22, is later found in the midst of the street of the New Jerusalem, where it bears its fruit for the abundant health and life of the nation. Revelation 22 verse 2. It is especially appropriate that those who hate the evil deeds of the world and the idolatrous wicked worship are given that spiritual recompense of abiding in the abundant life, which is in Christ in the eternity to come. The gracious nature of the promise is designed to restore and rekindle that love of Christ known in the early fervent days of the church and to be realized without diminishing in the eternity to come. The Letter to Smyrna the Church in Suffering, 2, colon 8-11 The Church of Smyrna was singled out by our Lord for the second of the seven letters. If one traveled from Ephesus to Smyrna, he would cover a distance of about 35 miles to the north, entering Smyrna by what was called the Ephesian Gate. Smyrna was a wealthy city, second only to Ephesus in the entire area and, like Ephesus, a seaport. Unlike Ephesus, which today is uninhabited, Smyrna is still a large city and contains a Christian church. Unger states, Anciently it was one of the finest cities of Asia, and was called the lovely, the crown of Ionia, the ornament of Asia. It is now the chief city of Anatolia, with a mixed population of 200,000 people, one-third of whom are Christians.73. In this large and flourishing commercial center was the little church to which this message was sent. Smyrna is mentioned only here in scripture, but from other literature it is evident that this city was noted for its wickedness and opposition to the Christian gospel in the first century. 2 colon 8 And unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead, and is alive. Christ the Eternal One to this church our Lord is introduced as the one who is the first and the last, which was dead, and is alive. In describing himself as the first and the last Christ is relating himself to time and eternity. He is the eternal God who has always existed in the past and who will always exist in the future. In keeping with this attribute, he is also portrayed as the one who was dead, literally, the one who became dead, referring to his death on the cross. 
He is also the one who is alive, literally, who lives, referring to his resurrection as the eternal and resurrected one. He is not only the eternal one in relation to time, but the resurrected one in relation to life. In his person, he therefore is presented as the eternal one, a description which is prominent in the first chapter in the Revelation as given to John on the Isle of Patmos. The church at Smyrna is told that the one who was eternal became incarnate and died, a reminder that even the eternal Son of God willingly became subject to the rejection and persecution of man. Like Christ, the church at Smyrna should anticipate ultimate victory. Even as the grave could not hold Christ, and he is now described as the one who lives, symbolizing his triumph over death, rejection, and mistrial, so they too could anticipate their ultimate victory. These features of the person and work of Christ are especially adapted to constitute words of encouragement to the church at Smyrna, which was undergoing great trial and affliction. The word Smyrna itself means myrrh, a sweet perfume used in embalming dead bodies, and included in the holy anointing oil used in the tabernacle worship in the Old Testament, Exodus 30 verse 23. It was also a common perfume and is mentioned as used by the bridegroom in the Song of Solomon 3 verse 6 where the question is asked, Who is this that cometh out of the wilderness like pillars of smoke, perfumed with myrrh and frankincense, with all powders of the merchants? Likewise in Psalm 45 verse 8, the heavenly bridegroom is described as using myrrh as perfume, all thy garments smell of myrrh, and aloes, and cassia, out of the ivory palaces, whereby they have made thee glad. The fragrance of Christ as the bridegroom is thus represented typically by the myrrh. 2 colon 9 I know thy works, and tribulation, and poverty, but thou art rich, and I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews, and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Commendation of Faithfulness in Trial In the best manuscripts the expression, thy works is omitted, making the statement much more direct, I know thy tribulation, and poverty. In referring to their tribulation, he assures them that he knows of their oppression by their enemies and its resulting affliction. The word used for poverty, gr, pto, chayin, is the word for abject poverty. They were not just poor, gr, penia. It may be that they were drawn from a poor class of people, but it is more probable that their extreme poverty is explained by the fact that they had been robbed of their goods in the process of their persecution and affliction. He quickly reminds them, however, but thou art rich. In the same spirit James refers to the poor of this world rich in faith, James 2 verse 5, using the same Greek words for poverty and riches. Paul used the verb forms of the same words in his statement as poor, yet making many rich, 2 Corinthians 6 verse 10. It would seem that their persecutors were not only pagans, who naturally would be offended by the peculiarities of the Christian faith, but also hostile Jews and Satan himself. Recognition of the opposition of Jews is made in verse 9 where Christ said, I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews, and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. As Alfred observes, these slanderers were in all probability actually Jews by birth, but not, see Romans 2 verse 28, Matt 3 colon 9, John 8 verse 33, 2 Corinthians 11 verse 22, Phil 3 colon 4 ff, in spiritual reality, the same who everywhere, in St. Paul's time and afterwards, were the most active enemies of the Christians.74. Alfred confirms this interpretation by the account of the martyrdom of Polycarp in which the Jews were active. Point seventy-five. Thus it has always been in the church, false religion has been most zealous in opposing that which is true. The Smyrna Christians found few friends in the hostile world around them. 2 10-11 Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried and ye shall have tribulation ten days, be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches, he that overcometh shall not be heard of the second death. The Exhortation and Promise Their present persecution, however, was only the forerunner of that which was to come. 
Christ predicted that the devil would cast some of them into prison, doing all in his power to stamp out this testimony in the midst of his domain. Christ indicated that they would be cast into prison and would be tried and would have tribulation ten days. He exhorted them, Nevertheless, fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer, be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Scholars have pondered the allusion to the ten days. If the church at Smyrna is taken as representative of the church in persecution in the second or third century, ten days may be representative of this period. W. A. Spurgeon, assuming that the seven churches correspond to church history as a whole, states, Is it not obvious that the ten days of persecution during which Satan would cast some of this church into prison refers to one of the seven church epochs to which the seven churches correspond? Then the ten days of persecution must refer to the ten persecutions of secular history during which great numbers of Christians were imprisoned and slain. Over these martyrs, the second death will have no power. Point 76. Some have found ten specific periods of persecution in these centuries. Walter Scott, who does not hold this view, quotes White in itemizing ten pagan persecutions as follows. The first under Nero, AD 54, the second under Domitian, AD 81, the third under Trajan, AD 98, the fourth under Adrian, Hadrian, AD 117, the fifth under Septimius Severus, AD 193, the sixth under Maximin, AD 235, the seventh under Decius, AD 249, the eighth under Valerian, AD 254, the ninth under Aurelian, AD 270, the tenth under Diocletian, AD 284.77. The date mentioned is the beginning of the reign of each emperor, not necessarily the beginning of the persecution. Some have applied the ten days to the ten years of persecution under Diocletian. Most commentators such as Sweet and Walter Scott take the reference to ten days as a symbolic representation of a specific period of time. Walter Scott writes for instance, The expression ten days signifies a limited period, a brief timing consistent with the length and period of pagan persecutions, covering 250 years. The following reference to ten days will confirm the meaning of the term as implying a brief and limited time, Genesis 24 verse 55, Nehemiah 5 verse 18, Daniel 1 verse 12, Acts 25 verse 6, Jeremiah 42 verse 7, etc. Likewise, Alfred states, the expression is probably used to signify a short and limited time. 79 Alfred cites scriptural support in the following references, Genesis 24 verse 55, Numbers 11 19, Daniel 1 verse 12, see also Numbers 14 22, 1 Samuel 1 verse 8, Job 19 verse 3. Acts 25 minutes and 6.80 seconds it is clear, in any case, that the church at Smyrna could expect further persecution including imprisonment for some of their number. The problem of human suffering raised in the message to the church at Smyrna has occupied the minds of men through the centuries. For those of the Christian faith it is not difficult to understand why the ungodly should suffer. The question remaining, however, is why the godly should suffer, as in the case of the Smyrna Church. The answer to this question is largely bound up in the doctrine of the sovereignty of God. The will of God, however, is holy, just, and good. An explanation is given in Scripture for varied aspects of Christian suffering. In some cases, suffering in the life of a child of God may be disciplinary as indicated in God's dealings with the church at Corinth, 1 Corinthians 11 verses 30-32, cf. Hebrews 12 verses 3-13. In other cases, it may be preventative as illustrated in Paul's thorn in the flesh, 2 Corinthians 12 verse 7. Paul was kept from exulting above measure in the divine revelation given to him through the humiliation of his thorn in the flesh. Suffering is also represented in Scripture as teaching the child of God what could otherwise remain unlearned. Even Christ is said to have learned obedience by the things which he suffered, Hebrews 5 verse 8, and for Christians in general the experience of suffering is educative. 
Paul writes in Romans 5 verses 3 to 5, And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience, experience, and experience, hope, and hope mocketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. Still a further reason for suffering is found in the fact that Christians through suffering can often bear a better testimony for Christ. This was true of Paul of whom it was said in Acts 9 verse 16, For I will shew him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. The experience of the church at Smyrna, therefore, though undesired by them, was undoubtedly designed by an infinitely wise and loving God for their good as well as for the better testimony of the gospel. To this suffering church Christ addresses two exhortations, which are his watchword to all in similar circumstances. First, in 2.10, he writes them, Fear none of those things, which literally translated is, Stop being afraid. They had nothing really to fear in this persecution, because it could not rob them of their priceless eternal blessings in Christ. In any case, they were in the hands of God. Whatever was permitted was by his wise design. Second, Christ exhorts them, Be thou faithful unto death, which translated literally is, Become faithful even unto death. Up to this time apparently none of their number had died. They were exhorted to be faithful to the Lord when the test came even if it resulted in their death. Though their own lives might be sacrificed, their real riches were as far removed from this world as the heavens are above the earth. Being faithful unto death, they would be all the more sure that they would receive the crown of life. This is not to be understood as a crown or a reward attending eternal life, but rather that their crown would be life eternal itself. These words of encouragement and exhortation no doubt strengthened John himself as he was enduring the rigors of exile on a bleak island in his aged condition. The persecutions and trials of the church at Smyrna were to be continued as witnessed not only by the prophecy recorded here, but by secular history. According to Ignatius, not long after the book of Revelation was written, Polycarp, the famous early church father, assumed the office of bishop in the church in Smyrna. It may be that he was already pastor of this church, point 81, here he was a minister for many years, finally climaxing his testimony by dying a martyr's death. When asked by his heathen judges to recant his Christian faith, he replied, For score and six years have I served the Lord, and he never wronged me, how then can I blaspheme my King and Savior? 82 The faithfulness of Polycarp to the end seems to have characterized this church in Smyrna in its entire testimony and resulted in this church's continuous faithful witness for God after many others of the early churches had long lost their testimony. The crown of life is apparently the crown of eternal life. The glories of life eternal stand in contrast to the trials of martyrdom and erase the dark shadows of persecution and death. The crown of life may be contrasted to the other crowns promised the child of God, the crown of righteousness for a godly life, 2 Timothy 4 verse 8, the crown of glory for faithful shepherds, 1 Peter 5 verse 4, the crown of gold, the evidence of our redemption, Revelation 4 verse 4, the crown of rejoicing, 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 19, believers in heaven won by Paul, and the incorruptible crown, 1 Corinthians 9 verse 25, for self-control in the race of life. The crown follows the cross. Some would limit the crown of life to martyrs, however, as a crown of abundant blessing, a crown of royal environment, a symbol of victory, and a crown of joy, 83. In concluding the message to the church at Smyrna, the promise is given, he that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. The world in its rejection of the Christian message can inflict martyrdom and terminate life in this world, but those who are faithful in their opportunity to receive Christ in this life are promised that they will not be overcome with the second death. The sad lot of those who depart this life without faith in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. The rich reward of those who are faithful unto death was also the expectation of the Apostle Paul, who wrote as he was facing imminent martyrdom For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith, 
henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing, 2 Timothy 4 verses 6 to 8. Just as the church at Ephesus in large measure is representative of the spiritual state of the Church of Jesus Christ in the world at the close of the first century, the fruit of apostolic ministry and faithful labor, so the trials of the church in Smyrna symbolize the persecution and trials the early church endured until the time of Constantine in the beginning of the fourth century. Though beset by many foes and without the power of wealth which characterized the later church, these years witnessed to the purity and fidelity of those who represented Christ. It is noteworthy that the word of Christ to the church of Smyrna contains no word of rebuke. The very trials that afflicted them assured them of deliverance from any lack of fervency for the Lord and kept them from any impurity or compromise with evil. Such is the recompense for those who endure trial for Christ in this age. The purifying fires of affliction caused the lamp of testimony to burn all the more brilliantly. The length of their trial, described here as being ten days, whether interpreted literally or not, is short in comparison with the eternal blessings which would be theirs when their days of trial were over. They could be comforted by the fact that the sufferings of this present time do not continue forever and the blessings that are ours in Christ through His salvation and precious promises will go on through eternity. The second death, with its reference to the judgment at the great white throne, Revelation 20 verses 11 to 15, was not to be their lot, but they were assured eternal blessings in the presence of the Lord. The letter to Pergamos, the church in compromise, 2 colon 12-17. 212 And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, these saith, he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. Christ the Judge of Compromise To the church at Pergamos, or Pergamum, one of the most prominent cities of Asia, the third message of Christ was directed. Located in the western part of Asia minor north of Smyrna and about twenty miles from the Mediterranean Sea, it was a wealthy city with many temples devoted to idol worship and full of statues, altars, and sacred groves. It was an important religious center where the pagan cults of Athena, Asclepius, Dionysus, and Zeus were prominent. This city was the official residence of the Italic princes. A university was also located there. Among its famous treasures was a large library of 200,000 volumes, later sent to Egypt as a gift from Anthony to Cleopatra. One of the products for which this city was famous was paper or parchment which seems to have originated here, the paper itself being called Pergamina. One of the prominent buildings was the magnificent temple of Asclepius, also spelled Asclepios, a pagan god whose idol was in the form of a serpent. Alfred observes that some, such as Grotius and Wettstein, interpret the expression Satan's seat, v. 13, as referring to this temple. Point 84, as Alfred points out, however, the expression is Satan's throne, not the serpent's throne. 85 Alfred prefers to leave the expression an undefined allusion to satanic power. Others identify it with the great altar of Zeus that once stood in the city and now may be seen in East Berlin. Although the glory of the ancient city has long since vanished, a small village named Bergama is located below the ruins of the old city. A nominal Christian testimony has continued in the town to modern times. In this atmosphere, completely adverse to Christian testimony, was situated the little church to which Christ addressed this letter. As in the messages to the other churches, Christ is introduced in special character. Here is the one who hath the sharp sword with two edges, a description given to him earlier, in 1.16. Here there is added emphasis by the repeated use of the article before the word sword and before each adjective. Christ is described as having the sword, the two-edged one, the sharp one. The sword mentioned is a long spear-like sword, apparently referring to the double-edged character of the Word of God. Reference is made to this spear-like sword seven times in the Bible, Luke 2 verse 35, Revelation 1 verse 16. 2 verses 12 and 16, 6 verse 8, 19 15, 21. The last two references in Revelation 19, 
where it speaks of the sword proceeding from the mouth of Christ in keeping with the introductory description in 1.16, seem to make plain that the sword here refers to the Word of God. Its representation as a double-edged sword indicates on the one hand the sword as the Word of God which separates the ones who are the vessels of grace from condemnation with the world, and which by its promises and message of salvation cuts loose the chains of sin and condemnation which bind the helpless sinner. On the other hand, the same Word of God is the means of condemnation and rejection for those who refuse the message of grace. The Word of God is at once the instrument of salvation and the instrument of death. This twofold character is especially pertinent to the church at Pergamos, which needed to be reminded of the distinct position of those who are true Christians as opposed to those who reject the gospel. 2.13 I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is, and thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. Commendation for Holding Fast In verse 13, Christ extends a word of commendation to the church in Pergamos. He first notes the fact that they were dwelling where Satan's seat is. In the best manuscripts the expression, Thy works is omitted, which gives added emphasis to the fact that Satan's seat is the place of their dwelling. The mention of Satan's seat or throne, referred to again at the end of the verse in the expression where Satan dwelleth, is a reference to satanic power in the evil religious character of the city of Pergamos manifested in persecution of Christians and perhaps epitomized in the worship of Aesculapius, the serpent god. Christ notes that in spite of their evil environment the Pergamos Christians have held fast to his name and have not denied the faith. The reference to my name seems to embody a personal loyalty and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ with all that this represented, in addition to this they have not denied the body of Christian truth which accompanies faith in Christ, to which he refers in the expression my faith. Divine judgment takes into consideration the forces of evil arrayed against the Christian. To those who are found faithful in such circumstances commendation is all the more generous. The faithfulness of the church at Pergamos is a challenge to Christians today to stand true when engulfed by the evil of this present world, the apostasy within the ranks of religion, and the temptation to compromise their stand for the truth. As a symbol of the faithfulness of these saints in Pergamos, one of the early martyrs is here named as Antipas, who is declared to be my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. There has been speculation as to the character of this person, but there is no certain word concerning the nature of his martyrdom. His name means against all, which perhaps symbolizes the fact that he may have stood alone against the forces of evil and was faithful even unto death. The church at Pergamos as a whole was commended for standing unwaveringly for Christ even though one of their members had paid the supreme price. 2.14-15 But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Rebuke for Compromise In spite of these many tokens of faithfulness in a time of temptation and trial, the Lord indicated that all was not well with the church at Pergamos. Two blots on their record labeled them as the compromising church. According to verses 14 and 15, they held the doctrine of Balaam and the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. The reference to Balaam is an allusion to the experience of Balaam recorded in Numbers 22-25 when he was hired by the kings of the Midianites and the Moabites to curse the children of Israel. The sad record of the prophet, who went along with this plan as far as he was able, but without being successful in cursing Israel, is given a large place in the book of Numbers. According to Numbers 31, Moses was angry with the children of Israel for not exterminating the women of the Midianites. Here we learn for the first time that the prophet Balaam had advised King Balak to corrupt Israel by tempting them to sin through intermarriage with their women and the resulting inducement to worship idols. 
Numbers 31, 15-16 records that Moses said to the children of Israel, Have ye saved all the women alive? Behold, these caused the children of Israel, through the counsel of Balaam, to commit trespass against the Lord in the matter of Peor, and there was a plague among the congregation of the Lord. The doctrine of Balaam therefore was the teaching that the people of God should intermarry with the heathen and compromise in the matter of idolatrous worship. This is in contrast to the way of Balaam, that is, selling his prophetic gift for money, 2 Peter 2 verse 15, and the error of Balaam, his assumption that God would curse Israel, Jude 11. Undoubtedly intermarriage with the heathen and spiritual compromise were real issues in Pergamos where civic life and religious life were so entwined. It would be most difficult for Christians in this city to have any kind of social contact with the outside world without becoming involved with the worship of idols or in the matter of intermarriage with non-Christians. Practically all meat was offered to idols before it was consumed, and it was difficult for Christians to accept a social engagement or even to buy meat in the marketplace without in some sense compromising in respect to the meat offered to idols. Intermarriage with the heathen was also a real problem. Social relations with the heathen world would lead in some instances to partaking of the heathen feasts, which in turn led to heathen immorality, which was a part of the idolatrous worship. Apparently, there were some in the Pergamos church who held that Christians had liberty in this matter. Christ's absolute condemnation of the doctrine of Balaam as it related to the church at Pergamos is a clear testimony to the fact that Christians must at all costs remain pure and separate from defilement with the world and its religion and moral standards. In a similar way, they were rebuked for holding the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. That for which the Ephesian church was commended as hating now becomes embraced by some in the church of Pergamos. Nicolaitanism seems to represent moral departure, see discussion at 2, colon 6. The expression which things I hate is not found in the best manuscripts in verse 15, but it does occur in the original reference to this doctrine, 2, colon 6. What God hates the Christian ought to have as well. The modem tendency to blur distinctions of moral and theological character and to manifest unconcern in those areas had its counterpart in the early church of Pergamos. The word of Christ to this church on this point constitutes a stem warning to modem Christians to examine their morality and faith and to demand freedom to follow the word of God with the guidance of the Holy Spirit where this conflicts with the standards of men. The parallel in the history of the church to the temptation and failure foreshadowed at Pergamos is all too evident to students of church history. With the so-called conversion of Constantine the emperor, the time of persecution which the church had previously endured was replaced by a period in which the church was favored by the government. The edicts of persecution which had characterized the previous administration were repealed and Christians were allowed to worship according to the dictates of their conscience. Near the end of the 4th century, Theodosius actually proscribed paganism. Under these circumstances it soon became popular to be a Christian, and the conscience of the church was quickly blurred. It became increasingly difficult to maintain a clear distinction between the church and the world and to preserve the purity of biblical doctrine. Though some benefit was secured by the successful defense of biblical truth by the Council of Nicaea in AD 325 as opposed to the defection from the faith by Aelius and his followers, the history of the three centuries which followed is a record of increasing corruption of the church, departure from biblical doctrine, and an attempt to combine Christian theology with pagan philosophy. As a result the Church soon lost its hope of the early return of Christ, and biblical simplicity was replaced by a complicated Church organization which substituted human creeds and worship of Mary, the Mother of our Lord, for true biblical doctrine. The Church committed the same sin of which Israel was guilty in the Old Testament, namely, the worship of idols and union with the heathen world. The solemn warning of Christ given to the church at Ephesus was forgotten. 2.16 Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Warning to Repent 
In this abrupt command, Christ issued a sharp word to the church at Pergamos and their modern counterparts, Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Even though many in the church at Pergamos had been faithful and one of their number had died as a martyr to the faith, it was nevertheless true that the evil character of those things which were invading the church was so serious in the mind of Christ that it involved fighting against them with the sword of his mouth. There is no alternative to continued impurity and compromise with the truth except that of divine judgment. The apostasy which is seen in its early stage in the church at Pergamos has its culmination in the future apostate church in Revelation 17 which is ultimately brought into divine judgment by Christ, the head of the church. 2.17 He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches, to him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth saving he that receiveth it. Invitation and Promise As in his messages to the other churches, Christ gives a promise and an invitation to individuals. He that hath an ear is invited to listen. To him is given the threefold promise of verse 17, contained in this revelation. First of all, the believer is assured that he will have the benefit of eating of the hidden manna. Just as Israel received manna from heaven as its food in the wilderness replacing the onions and garlic of Egypt, so for the true believer in the Lord Jesus there is the hidden manna, that bread from heaven which the world does not know or see which is the present spiritual food of the saints as well as a part of their future heritage. This seems to refer to the benefits of fellowship with Christ and the spiritual strength that is afforded by that experience. In addition to the hidden manna, those who overcome by faith are promised a white stone, possibly a brilliant diamond. In courts of law, being given a white stone is thought to represent acquittal, in contrast to a black stone which would indicate condemnation. Hagi Antonius suggests several other representations such as happiness, or a symbol of friendship, or a passport to important social events. Point 86 Alford in an extended discussion after listing many divergent views, supports the position of Bengal along with Hengstenberg and Duesterdieck that the figure is derived from the practice of using small stones inscribed with writing, for various purposes, and that, further than this, the imagery belongs to the occasion itself only, 87 Alford believes. That the real value of the stone is the inscription on it rather than the stone's intrinsic worth. The stone's value rests in the new name of the recipient, which is his title, to eternal glory. Point 88. The giving of the white stone to the believer here, then, is the indication that he has been accepted or favored by Christ, a wonderful assurance especially for those who have been rejected by the wicked world and are the objects of its persecution. In addition to receiving the stone, a new name written on the stone is promised them, the name described as one which no man knoweth saving he that receiveth it. In the Old Testament, the high priest had the names of the twelve tribes of Israel inscribed upon the stones carried upon his breast, symbolic of the fact that whenever he appeared before God he was a mediator representing the entire twelve tribes of Israel. Here is a name that belongs to the individual. Some consider it to be that of Jehovah, the unspoken name of God in the Old Testament. Others have regarded it as a personal name indicating their own enrollment in heaven. Whatever its character, the name symbolizes the personal heritage of the glories that are beyond this world and the assurance of eternal salvation. Christians in this modern day, as well as Christians in the church at Pergamos are reminded by this scripture that it is God's purpose to separate them from all evil and compromise and to have them as his peculiar inheritance throughout eternity. However difficult their lot in this life, they are assured infinite blessing in the life to come. The Letter to Thyatira, The Church Tolerating Apostasy, 2 colon 18 29. 2 18 And unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. Christ the Holy One. The fourth message of Christ was addressed to the angel of the church in Thyatira, a small thriving town located about 40 miles southeast of Pergamos, 
The city had been established as a Macedonian colony by Alexander the Great after the destruction of the Persian Empire. Located in a rich agricultural area, Thyatira was famous for the manufacture of purple dye, and numerous references are found in secular literature of the period to the trade guilds which manufactured cloth. Point eighty nine. It is remarkable that Christ should single out a very small church in a relatively obscure city for such an important letter. However, the message reaches far beyond the immediate circumstances in the church at Thyatira. One other mention of Thyatira is found in Acts 16 verses 14 to 15 where the conversion of Lydia is recorded in these words, and a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple, of the city of Thyatira, which worshipped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened, that she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. As there is no record in scripture of any evangelistic effort in the city of Thyatira, it may be that the gospel was first brought to Thyatira through the instrumentality of Lydia. Her role of a seller of purple indicates that she was a representative of the thriving trade in purple cloth originating in Thyatira. Though Lydia was probably already deceased, Christ directed the longest of the seven letters to this small Christian assembly which may have been the fruit of her witness. All was not well in Thyatira and to this little church is addressed one of the most severe of the seven epistles. Christ is introduced in verse 18 as the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. In 1 colon 14-15 a similar description is given where Christ is pictured as the righteous judge who, knowing all things, can ferret out every evil. His sovereign judgment deals with all who fail to measure up to his perfect righteousness. The chief point of distinction in this description of Christ is that he is named the Son of God in contrast to the designation in chapter 1 where he is called the Son of Man. His title here is in keeping with the character of the judgment pronounced upon the church. Their diversion from the true worship of Jesus Christ the Son of God was so serious that it called for a reiteration of his deity. The description of his eyes as a flame of fire speaks of burning indignation and purifying judgment. In a similar way, his feet are declared to be like fine brass, gr, chocolibano. This word, found only here in the Bible, has puzzled scholars. It seems to represent an alloy of precious metal, such as gold, silver, brass, or copper. Its exact character is not known but there is general agreement with the conclusion of Sweet that it is the name of a mixed metal of great brilliance, 90 The point in mentioning it here is in reference not to its quality as metal, but to its brilliant appearance enhancing the revelation of Christ as a glorious judge. 219 I know thy works, and charity, and service, and faith, and thy patience, and thy works, and the last to be more than the first. Commendation of works, faith, and love. In verse 19 Christ commends the church at Thyatira in a remarkable way, considering the severe condemnation, which may be translated freely as follows, I know your works and the love and the faith and the service and your patience and your last works being more than the first. In the commendations of the church at Smyrna and at Pergamos the expression, thy works is not in the best manuscripts which emphasizes the fact that the principal point of commendation in Smyrna was their faithful suffering and in Pergamos the place in which they were giving their testimony. In Thyatira, however, works are mentioned, because their works were prominent, and of these the omniscient Christ was fully aware. It is remarkable that the church was commended first for its charity, or love, especially when none of the three preceding churches was commended for this quality. In addition, mention is made of their service, their faith, and their patience, and of the fact that their last works were greater than the former works, in contrast, for instance, to the case of the Ephesian church. In spite of these most commendable features, the church at Thyatira was guilty of terrible sin, and with this fact Christ deals beginning in verse 20. 2 colon 20 23 Notwithstanding I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication, and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. 
Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. Indictment for Spiritual Wickedness here is a sweeping indictment of the church's toleration of the woman named Jezebel and her teaching and influence which led the church to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed to idols. The expression a few things found in the authorized version is omitted in the best manuscripts, the point being that there is one principal objection to the church at Thyatira, namely, the evil works of the woman called Jezebel. Some manuscripts add so to the word woman, hence meaning thy woman, or thy wife. Alfred favors the interpretation that Jezebel was actually the wife of the pastor at Thyatira on the ground that, on the whole, the evidence for so being inserted in the text seems to me to be preponderant. 91 Alfred is not sure, however, that the phrase should be taken literally, perhaps only symbolically. In any case, it is possible that there was actually a woman leader in the church at Thyatira and that her dominant position may have been derived from the fact that Lydia, another woman, had brought them the message in the first place. This woman, Jezebel, is not a true messenger of divine truth. Though she claimed the right and office of a prophetess, she had urged the Christians in Thyatira to continue their pagan worship of idols, which characterized the unbelievers in the city. They were therefore not only permitted to participate in the idolatrous feasts by eating things sacrificed to idols, but they were also instructed to take part in the immorality which characterized the worship of idols. In promoting these wrongs, the woman prophetess, whose real name was probably not Jezebel, was fulfilling the role of the historic Jezebel in the Old Testament. According to 1 Kings, Jezebel was the wife of Ahab, the king of Israel, and she was the daughter of Ethbal king of the Sidonians. She was one of the most evil characters of the Old Testament, who attempted to combine the worship of Israel with the worship of the idol Baal. She did what she could to stamp out all true worship of the Lord and influenced her weak husband to the extent that it is recorded in 1 Kings 16 verse 33, and Ahab made a grove, and Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. Jezebel herself had a most unenviable record of evil. She was responsible for the killing of Naboth and possession of his vineyard for her husband, 1 Kings 21 verses 1 to 16. She had also killed practically all the prophets of the Lord and did what she could to kill the prophet Elijah, 1 Kings 19 verse 2. So evil was Jezebel's character that she is singled out by Elijah for a special prophecy that she would come to a sudden end and that her body would be eaten by dogs, a prophecy fulfilled in 2 Kings 9 verses 33-35. She is therefore the epitome of subtle corruption and a symbol of immorality and idolatry. The Jezebel in Thyatira had a similar influence upon the church and broke down all boundaries of moral separation from the wicked world. According to verse 21 she was given space or time, gr, cronin, to repent, and she had not done so. A terrible judgment is therefore pronounced upon her that she herself will be cast into the bed of affliction and that those who shared her evil deeds will be cast into tribulation. As Sweet expresses it, in this case, there is a sharp contrast between the luxurious couch where the sin was committed and the bed of pain. 93 In the expression I will cast, gr, ballow, the present tense is used for an emphatic future as if Christ were already in the process of executing his judgment. He describes those who will share her judgment as committing adultery with her. Though fornication referring to sexual immorality in general is frequently mentioned in the book of Revelation, this is the only place where adultery is indicated, with more particular reference to violation of the marriage vow. Those in Thyatira who had sinned in this way had not only violated the moral law of God, but had sinned against their covenant relationship with the Lord which bound them to inward purity as well as outward piety. Christ also predicts that Jezebel's children will be killed with death, an emphatic judgment of such character that all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and the hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works.
The word translated reigns in the authorized version, gr, nephris, literally kidneys, was a reference to the fact that Christ searches the innermost being of the individual. In modern terminology, the term would be minds and hearts. There can be no hiding from Christ of any iniquity whether overt or covert act. These solemn words addressed to the church at Thyatira are applicable to anyone who dares to corrupt the purity of the truth of God and spoil the worship of the Lord with idolatrous and heathen practices. The message to the assembly in Thyatira seems to foreshadow that period of church history known as the Middle Ages preceding the Protestant Reformation. In that period, the church became corrupt as it sought to combine Christianity with pagan philosophy and heathen religious rites, so that much of the ritual of the church of that period is directly traceable to comparable ceremonies in heathen religion. During this period also there began that exaltation of Mary the mother of our Lord, which has tended to exalt her to the plane of a female deity through whom intercession to God should be made, and apart from whose favor there can be no salvation. The prominence of a woman prophetess in the church at Thyatira anticipates the prominence of this unscriptural exaltation of Mary. Along with this, the church experienced spiritual depravity, and idols in the form of religious statues were introduced. Not only gross immorality, but spiritual fornication resulted, much as was true in the church of Thyatira. Like the church in Thyatira, however, many noble qualities can be found in the church in the Middle Ages. Individuals, in spite of the ecclesiastical system of which they were a part, were often characterized by a true love for God and selfless service and faith. Of such God is the rewarder, and due recognition is made of their faithfulness without glossing over the evil that is inherent in the system as a whole. The participation in idol worship and eating of things offered to idols also foreshadows the departure from the scriptural doctrine of the finished sacrifice of Christ. In the Middle Ages the false teaching of the continual sacrifice of Christ was advocated, transforming the observance of the elements of the Lord's Supper into another sacrifice of Christ. This fundamental error of the Church in the Middle Ages has been corrected in modern Protestantism by the recognition of the bread and the cup as symbols, but not the sacrifice itself, which Christ performed once and for all upon the cross of Calvary. In contrast to the false doctrine exalting the Virgin Mary to the role of deity and co-redeemer, Christ introduces himself in this message to the Church of Thyatira as the Son of God, the one to whom alone we owe our redemption and in whose hands alone our final judgment rests. 2 24-25 But unto you I say, and unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan, as they speak. I will put upon you none other burden, but that which ye have already hold fast till I come. Exhortation to the Godly Remnant It is significant that having brought into judgment those who were evil in the church of Thyatira a special word is given to the godly remnant in this church. Here, for the first time in the messages to the seven churches a group is singled out within a local church as being the continuing true testimony of the Lord. The godly remnant is described as not having or holding the doctrine of Jezebel and as not knowing the depths or the deep things of Satan. Here reference is made to the satanic system often seen in great detail in false cults which compete with the true Christian faith. Just as there are the deep things of God, 1 Corinthians 2 verse 10, which are taught by the Spirit, so there are the deep things of Satan which result from his work. The meaning of the expression, as they speak, is debatable. Alfred believes that the subject of the verb speak is a reference to apostolic teaching embraced in the command which immediately follows, I will put upon you none other burden. A parallel is found in Acts 15 verse 28 where the council of Jerusalem determined, it seemed good to the Holy Ghost, and to us, to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. The clause is therefore an introduction to the material which follows rather than a conclusion of the material which preceded. As Alfred summarizes it, this act of simple obedience, and no deep matters beyond their reach, was what the Lord required of them. 94. To the godly remnant, then, Christ gives a limited responsibility. 
The evil character of the followers of Jezebel is such that they are beyond reclaim, but the true Christians are urged to hold fast to what they already have and await the coming of the Lord. It is remarkable that here first in the seven churches there is reference to the coming of Christ for his church as the hope of those who are engulfed by an apostate system. 2 26-29 And he that overcometh, and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father. And I will give him the morning star. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. The Invitation and Promise As in the letters to the other churches, Christ closes his message to the church at Thyatira with a challenge to those who are overcomers. He promises that those who keep his works unto the end will be given a responsible position of judgment over the nations. Closely following the prediction of a second coming is this first reference in Revelation to the millennial reign of Christ, cf. however, 1 colon 6-7. The overcoming Christians are promised places of authority. They will share the rule of Christ over the nations of the world. The word for rule, gr, poimenii, means literally, to shepherd. Their rule will not be simply that of executing judgment, but also that of administering mercy and direction to those who are the sheep as contrasted to the goats, Matt, 25, 31-46. The power to rule in this way was given to Christ by his heavenly Father, John 5 verse 22. To the overcomers also is given the promise of the morning star. While various explanations of this expression have been given, 95 it seems to refer to Christ himself in his role as the returning one who will rapture the church before the dark hours preceding the dawn of the millennial kingdom. The letter to the church at Thyatira closes with the familiar invitation to individuals who have ears to hear. Beginning with this letter this exhortation comes last in contrast to its position before the promise to overcomers in preceding letters. The word of Christ to the church of Thyatira is therefore addressed to any who will hear, who find themselves in similar need of this searching exhortation. Introduction the third chapter of the book of Revelation contains the final three messages of the churches of Asia, those addressed to Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea respectively. The city of Sardis mentioned first in this chapter was located in West Asia Minor about 50 miles east of Smyrna and 30 miles southeast of Thyatira. It was an important and wealthy city located on the commercial trade route running east and west through Lydia. An ancient city with a long history, Sardis had come back into prominence under Roman rule. At one time it was the capital of the kingdom of Lydia. Much of its wealth came from its textile manufacturing and dye industry and its jewelry trade. Most of the city practiced pagan worship, and there were many mystery cults or secret religious societies. The magnificent Temple of Artemis dating from the 4th century BC was one of its points of interest and still exists as an important ruin. The remains of a Christian church building, which have been discovered immediately adjacent to the temple, testify of post-apostolic Christian witness to this wicked and pagan city noted for its loose living. The church to which the letter was addressed continued its existence until the 14th century, but it never was prominent. Today only a small village known as Sardis exists amid the ancient ruins. The letter to Sardis, the church that was dead, 3 colon 1-6. 3 colon 1 And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God, and the seven stars, I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest, and art dead. Christ the possessor of the spirit. The message addressed to the angel of the church of Sardis is notable for several reasons. Like the letter to Laodicea it is an unmixed message of rebuke and censor. It is almost devoid of any word of commendation such as characterized the word of Christ to the other churches. The reason for the sad condition in Sardis was that the people were surrounded by the grossest form of idolatry. As Andrew Tate states, The people of Sardis were idolaters, they worshipped the mother goddess, Sibylle. The fragments of the temple that was erected to her honor still remain and there are two stately columns, with ionic capitals, 
which are fully 60 feet high and about 6 and 1 third feet in diameter, whose bases are deeply embedded in the rubbish that has fallen down from the citadel. Her worship was of the most debasing character, and orgies like those of Dionysus were practiced at the festivals held in her honor. Sins of the foulest and darkest impurity were committed on those occasions, and when we think of a small community of Christians rescued from such abominable idolatry, living in the midst of scenes of the grossest depravity, with early associations, and companionships, and connections, all exerting a force in the direction of heathenism, it may be wondered that the few members of the church in Sardis were not drawn away altogether, and swallowed up in the great vortex. Point 96. G. Campbell Morgan observes that there is a change in approach beginning with this letter. There is a marked change in our Lord's method of address to the church at Sardis. Hitherto he has commenced with words of commendation. Here, he commenced with words of condemnation. In the other churches, evil had not been the habit, but rather the exception, and therefore it was possible first to commend. Here the case is reversed, and no word of commendation is addressed to the church as a church. Point 97. In relation to Sardis Christ is introduced in verse 1 as the one that hath the seven spirits of God, and the seven stars. This reference to the fact that Christ has the seven spirits of God is similar to the description given in 1 colon 4. Alfred notes that in 1 colon for the seven spirits are declared merely to be before the throne. In both cases, however, the Holy Spirit is in view. Point 98 here there is an apparent allusion to the sevenfold character of the Holy Spirit as resting upon Christ according to the prophecy of Isaiah 11 verses 2 to 5. There the Holy Spirit is described thus, the Spirit of the Lord, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. There also he is described as coming from God and resting upon Christ. A similar description is found later in Revelation 5 verse 6. This portrait of Christ points out the qualities which ensure the righteous judgment of the wicked, and it is in this character that Christ is introduced to the church of Sardis. In addition to having the sevenfold Spirit of God, Christ is revealed as the one who has the seven stars, interpreted in 120 as the angels or messengers of the seven churches. The fact that the leaders of the church represented by these messengers belong to Christ makes their leadership and transmission of the message all the more authoritative and responsible. The same description of Christ as holding the seven stars in his right hand was given in relation to the letter to the church at Ephesus in 2 colon 1 to make clear that the leaders of the church are responsible to no human representative of Christ and must give account directly to the Lord himself. Of the church at Sardis he declares, I know thy works. As in the case of the other churches, the actions and testimony of the church at Sardis are an open book to the omniscient Lord, and nothing is hid from his searching gaze. That which is not visible to man is perfectly apparent to him, and he defines that which he sees in the closing part of verse 1 in a word of sharp condemnation, Thou hast a name, that thou livest, and art dead. The church at Sardis evidently had a reputation among the churches in the area and was considered a spiritual church and one that had an effective ministry and testimony for God. From the divine standpoint, however, it is considered as a church that had only a name of being alive and actually was dead as far as spiritual life and power were concerned. This searching judgment of Christ as it relates to the church of Sardis is one to be pondered by the modern church, which often is full of activity even though there is little that speaks of Christ and spiritual life and power. Barclay observes that a church is in danger of death when it begins to worship its own past, when it is more concerned with forms than with life, when it loves systems more than it loves Jesus Christ, when it is more concerned with material than spiritual things. Point 99. 3 2-3 Be watchful, and strengthen the things which remain, that are ready to die for I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast, and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Indictment and Warning Though the church at Sardis was classified as being dead in the sight of God, it is obvious from verse 2 that there were some in the church who still had true life and spirituality. Otherwise, it would not have been possible to strengthen the things which remain. On the other hand, a full restoration of the will of God was also impossible. 
In the best manuscripts, the article is omitted before works, hence, literally, not any of your works have I found perfect before God. They are therefore exhorted to be watchful lest a further invasion of spiritual deadness come upon them. The previous history of Sardis should have warned them concerning the possibility of sudden and unexpected judgment. Although the situation of the city was ideal for defense, as it stood high above the valley of Hermas and was surrounded by deep cliffs almost impossible to scale, Sardis had twice before fallen because of overconfidence and failure to watch. In 549 BC the Persian king Cyrus had ended the rule of Croesus by scaling the cliffs under the cover of darkness. In 214 BC the armies of Antiochus the Great, III, captured the city by the same method. The city of Sardis at the time it received this letter was in fact in a period of decline as compared to its former glory, having been reduced by these invasions. The spiritual history of the church was to correspond to the political history of the city. Point 100 Their works are also declared to be not perfect, literally, not fulfilled, that is, not achieving the full extent of the will of God. Their works were short either in motive or in execution, and they are exhorted to fill to the full the opportunity for service and testimony. Point 101. Not only are they exhorted to be watchful and strengthen the things which remain, but they are also warned to remember the truth that they have received and heard, and to hold it fast and to turn away from any defection from it. If they refuse to heed the exhortation, Christ promises that he will come upon them as a thief, meaning that he will come upon them unexpectedly with devastating suddenness and bring judgment upon them, as he explains, Thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. The same symbolism is used at the second coming of the Lord, but here the figure is not related to that event. The judgment upon the church at Sardis, however, is going to be just as unexpected, sudden, and irrevocable as that which is related to the second coming. 3 4 6 Thou hast a few names even in Sardis which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father, and before his angels. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Invitation and Promise to Godly Remnant To those individuals in the Sardis church who overcome, the promise is given that they shall be clothed in white raiment. In reference to the white robes, Morgan observes. In Scripture the robing of the saint is ever an expression of the saint's own service and character. In the description of the white-robed multitude in Revelation, it is said that their white robes are the righteousness of the saints, not the righteousness of God, but the righteousness of the saints. This is to say, that fidelity of character and of service shall presently have its outward manifestation. Point 102. Sweet suggests that white apparel in Scripture denotes, 1. Festivity, 2. Victory, 3. Purity, 4. The heavenly state. Point 103. The thought seems to be that the righteousness of the saints bestowed in the form of a garment is a token of their acceptability to God and the divine recognition of their office and ministry as the priests of God. They have not defiled their garments as others have done in Sardis, and now they are promised that in the future they will have the heavenly white garment and will walk with Christ because they are judged as worthy. Further, it is promised, I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. This verse has troubled expositors in view of other promises of the scripture which seem to indicate that a person who has once received Jesus Christ as Savior is forever secure in his salvation. How then can his name be blotted out of the book of life? Cease interprets the expression I will not blot out his name out of the book of life as referring to the name of a believer as written in heaven. He writes, there is a celestial roll book of all those who name the name of Jesus. But it depends on the persevering fidelity of the individual whether his name is to continue on that roll or to be blotted out. Point 104. To make the continuance of our salvation depend upon works, however, is gross failure to comprehend that salvation is by grace alone. If it depended upon the believer's perseverance, the name would not have been written there in the first place. Other explanations of the meaning of the Book of Life have been given which are more satisfactory. Some have indicated that there is no explicit statement here that anybody will have his name blotted out, but rather the promise that his name will not be blotted out because of his faith in Christ. The implication, however, is that such is a possibility. 
On the basis of this some have considered the book of life not as the role of those who are saved, but rather a list of those for whom Christ died, that is, all humanity who have possessed physical life. As they come to maturity and are faced with the responsibility of accepting or rejecting Christ, their names are blotted out if they fail to receive Jesus Christ as Savior, whereas those who do accept Christ as Savior are confirmed in their position in the book of life, and their names are confessed before the Father and the heavenly angels. In either interpretation, the implication of the passage is that those who put their trust in Christ and thus overcome by faith have the privilege of being recognized as the saints of God throughout eternity even though they come from such a church as Sardis where the spiritual testimony was at a low ebb and much was offensive to their holy Lord. In keeping with the prophetic foreshadowing of the church age as seen in the other churches, some have held that the church at Sardis is a picture of the church in the time of the Protestant Reformation when a great mass of Christendom was dead even though it had a name that it lived. During those years only a small believing portion took their stand for true biblical revelation and trusted in Christ as Savior. The characteristics of the church in Sardis remarkably parallel those of the church in the period of the Protestant Reformation. This fact seems to confirm the judgment that the message delivered to this first-century church was prophetic of the future of the church at large during this period. The message is therefore a series of exhortations not only to the church of the first century but to those who need the same exhortations in every century. To such the commands are given to be watchful, to strengthen the things which remain which are ready to die, to remember the truth and experience of the past, to hold fast that which remains, and to repent in mind and heart. The message also includes the warning of the alternative of divine judgment. The promise of the benefits of eternal life is given to those who heed the invitation, who are represented here as a godly remnant within the church at Sardis. As in the other churches, the message closes with the individual invitation, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. The letter to Philadelphia, the church faithful to Christ, 3:7-13. The message to the church at Philadelphia is in some respects one of the most interesting of all the messages to the churches. Here is a church which was faithful to Christ and the Word of God. The city of Philadelphia itself, known in modern times as Elasir, is located in Lydia some 28 miles southeast of Sardis and was named after a king of Pergamos, Attalus Philadelphus, who built the city. The word Philadelphia, meaning brotherly love, is found six other times in the New Testament, Romans 12 verse 10, 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 9, Hebrews 13 verse 1, 1 Peter 1 verse 22, 2 Peter L 7 a b. Here the word occurs for the seventh and final time, but only here is it used of the city bearing this name. The city of Philadelphia had a long history and several times was almost completely destroyed by earthquakes. The most recent rebuilding was in AD 17. The land area around Philadelphia was rich in agricultural value, but had noticeable tokens of previous volcanic action. Grapes were one of the principal crops, and, in keeping with this, Dionysus was one of the chief objects of pagan worship. Through the centuries, a nominal Christian testimony continued in this city of Philadelphia and prospered even under Turkish rule. But all nominal Christians left the city for Greece after World War I. The message addressed to the church at Philadelphia has the unusual characteristic of being almost entirely a word of praise, similar to that received by the church at Smyrna, but in sharp contrast to the messages to Sardis and Laodicea. 3 7 And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth, and no man shutteth, and shutteth, and no man openeth. Christ the Holy and Sovereign God. The letter addressed to the angel of the Church of Philadelphia is introduced in verse 7 by the description of Christ as preeminently the Holy One and the One who is always true. Such a one is qualified to call the Christians of Philadelphia to a life of faith in him and a corresponding life of holiness, even as Peter wrote, But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, 1 Peter 1 verse 15. As the one who is true, Christ is the author of truth in contrast to all error or false doctrine. In the midst of so much that is false and perverted, Jesus Christ stands alone as the one who is completely true. This aspect of the person of Christ, linked with his holiness earlier in the verse, brings out the great truth that right doctrine and right living go together. There can be no holiness without truth. 
Christ is also presented as the one who has the key of David, the one that opens in such a way that no man can shut, and the one who shuts so that no man can open. The description of Christ as he is introduced to the Philadelphian church is less similar to the vision of Christ in chapter 1 than any of the other presentations to the seven churches. He is declared in 118 to have the keys of hell and of death. Here the allusion seems to be to Isaiah 22 verse 22 where, speaking of Eliakim the son of Hilkiah, it is recorded that the key of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulder, so he shall open, and none shall shut, and he shall shut, and none shall open. Eliakim had the key to all the treasures of the king, and when he opened the door it was opened, and when he closed the door it was closed. Christ, the great antitype of Eliakim, has the key to truth and holiness as well as to opportunity, service, and testimony. To the church at Philadelphia surrounded by heathendom and wickedness, Christ gives assurance that he has power to open and close according to his sovereign will. 3 8 9 I know thy works, behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it, for thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews, and are not, but do lie, behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. Commendation and Promised Victory Christ says to the church at Philadelphia, as to the other churches, I know thy works. The entire panorama of testimony and witness in Philadelphia was before him as he wrote words of commendation for their faithfulness to the Lord. In keeping with the description of his person in verse 7, he declares to them, Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. Ramsey explains the reference to the door as arising from the geographical situation of the city of Philadelphia. He states, The situation of the city fully explains this saying. Philadelphia lay at the upper extremity of a long valley, which opens back from the sea. After passing Philadelphia the road along this valley ascends to the Phrygian land and the Great Central Plateau, the main mass of Asia Minor. This road was the one which led from the harbor of Smyrna to the northeastern parts of Asia Minor and the east in general, the one rival to the great route connecting Ephesus with the east, and the greatest Asian trade route of medieval times. Philadelphia, therefore, was the keeper of the gateway to the plateau. Point 105. The testimony of the Philadelphian church was divinely ordained by God and assured by his power and sovereignty. It is significant that the testimony of this church continued through the centuries in evident fulfillment of his promise that they should have an open door. The church at Philadelphia is commended by Christ with the words, For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Some have interpreted the expression little strength as a word of rebuke rather than commendation. It is obviously short of a full commendation, but it is evident that the thrust of the passage is that Christ recognizes in the Philadelphian church at least a significant degree of spiritual power which comes from God, and this assured them a continuance of their testimony through the open door which he had set before them. Also they are commended for having kept his word, that is, they had guarded and kept the truth of God as it was committed to them and had not departed from the faith, that system of doctrine which was held by the apostolic church. Added to their other commendable qualities, the church at Philadelphia manifested a loyalty to the name of Christ himself and had made a public confession of their trust in him. In recognition of this fact he says to them, Thou hast not denied my name. As the result of their faithfulness and witness he promises that their adversaries, described in verse 9 as synagogue of Satan, will be forced to acknowledge that the Philadelphian church were true servants of God. The reference to the synagogue of Satan and to those who say they are Jews is to unbelieving Jews who are opposing the witness of the gospel in Philadelphia and making it difficult for the Christians to bear a good testimony before the pagan world. Tate observes, The most inveterate enemy of the Church of Christ were the Jews. We read of them in Thessalonica, in Smyrna, and here in Philadelphia, and in every case most hostile and embittered against Christians. In Palestine, they were the sole persecutors of the church, and, elsewhere, if they did not directly oppose the gospel, they instigated others to do so. In Smyrna, the same term, synagogue of Satan, is applied to them as here.106. Tate goes on to note, however, that their very opposition to Christ sometimes led them to faith. We have seen in the history of the church, 
Many who were its greatest enemies, who were infuriated against it, led to the feet of Jesus. Nothing is too hard for the Lord. Point 107. There does not seem to be any evidence that there was satanic opposition in all the churches, though it was found in Pergamos and Smyrna. The Philadelphian church overcomes this opposition and has ultimate victory over it. McCarroll observes. The Philadelphia letter reminds that any true church at any time, and especially during the last days, meets satanic opposition, through imitation, religious ritualism, and hypocrisy opposition strengthened by mixture of worldliness and religiousness, church and state. 108. Those in the church today who are experiencing such affliction and persecution may be assured that however violent the opposition and however direct the efforts to thwart and hinder the work of God, in the end there will be victory for the cause of Christ. 3 colon 10 11 Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world, to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly, hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Promise of Deliverance from Hour of Trial One of the outstanding compliments given to the Philadelphian church is contained in verse 10. Because of their faithfulness, the Christians in Philadelphia are promised that they will be kept from the hour of trial which will come upon the earth as a divine judgment. It should be noted that this deliverance is not only from trial but from a period of time in which the trial exists, the hour of temptation. If the expression had been simply deliverance from trial, conceivably it could have meant only partial deliverance. The expression seems to have been made as strong as possible that the Philadelphian church would be delivered from this period. Many have observed also that the preposition from, gr, ek, is best understood as out of rather than simply from. Other instances of the use of the same verb and preposition together, such as John 17 verse 15 and James 1 verse 27, would indicate that it is perhaps too much to press it to mean an absolute deliverance. In view of the context of the book of Revelation, however, as it subsequently unfolds the horrors of this very tribulation period, it is evident that the promise here to the church at Philadelphia is one of deliverance from this time of trouble. This conclusion has, of course, been resisted by all post-tribulationists as an unwarranted interpretation of this passage. If this promise has any bearing on the question of pre-tribulationism, however, what is said emphasizes deliverance from rather than deliverance through. As far as the Philadelphian church was concerned, the rapture of the church was presented to them as an imminent hope. If the rapture had occurred in the first century preceding the tribulation which the book of Revelation describes, they were assured of deliverance. By contrast, those sealed out of the twelve tribes of Israel in 7 colon 4 clearly go through the time of trouble. This implies the rapture of the church before the time of trouble referred to as the Great Tribulation. Such a promise of deliverance to them would seemingly have been impossible if the rapture of the church were delayed until the end of the tribulation prior to the second coming of Christ and the establishment of the kingdom. This passage therefore provides some support for the hope that Christ will come for his church before the time of trial and trouble described in Revelation 6-19. This time of tribulation will overtake the entire world, as God inflicts his wrath upon unbelieving Gentiles as well as upon Christ-rejecting Jews. The Philadelphian church is therefore promised deliverance from the time of trouble which will overtake the world but will not overtake them. By so much they are encouraged to bear their present suffering and to continue their faithfulness and patience as they bear witness for the Lord Jesus. The Lord's coming for them is compared to an imminent event, one which will come suddenly without announcement. In view of this expectation they are to hold fast to their testimony for Christ in order to receive their reward at His coming. The expression quickly is to be understood as something which is sudden and unexpected, not necessarily immediate. In this passage the rapture of the church is in view. The coming of Christ to establish a kingdom on earth is a later event following the predicted time of tribulation which is unfolded in the book of Revelation itself. By contrast, the coming of Christ for his church is portrayed here as elsewhere in the book as an event which is not separated from us by any series of events, but is one of constant expectation in the daily walk of the believer in this age. This promise was historically true as directed to the church at Philadelphia.
If the church at Philadelphia foreshadows a future period of church history just as other churches seem to do, the promises given to this church can be taken as given to all churches bearing a true witness for Christ even down to the present day. Many churches may fulfill the characteristics of the other churches mentioned in these chapters of Revelation and share the condemnation that is involved. It is also true that some churches like the church in Philadelphia are worthy of commendation and bear a true testimony for the Lord Jesus. Individual Christians living in expectation of coming deliverance from this present world can therefore anticipate the coming of Christ for them. In regard to the hope of Christ's return, J. N. Darby writes, That which characterizes the Church of Philadelphia is its immediate connection with himself, it is Christ himself who is coming. It is neither knowledge nor prophecy that can satisfy the heart, but the thought that Jesus is coming to take me to himself is the blessed hope of one who was attached to him by grace.109. 3 12 13 Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Invitation and Promised Reward To the Christians of Philadelphia promise is also given as it is in the earlier letters that salvation and blessing and eternity to come will be their portion. They are not only promised the implication of verse 11 that they will have a crown of reward if they are faithful, but they are promised in verse 12, Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. This is of course a figure of speech. The entire heavenly city is considered a temple. In keeping with the symbolism, the Philadelphian Christians will be permanent like a pillar in the temple and, speaking figuratively, they will stand when all else has fallen. This perhaps had peculiar significance to those who were in Philadelphia because of their historic experiences with earthquakes which frequently had ruined their buildings and left only the pillars standing. They are assured of continuance throughout eternity because of their faith in Christ as the one who enables them to overcome the world. Further, the promise is given, he shall go no more out. This seems to mean that they will no longer be exposed to the temptations and trials of this present life and will have their permanent residence in the very presence of God. In addition to this promise Christ gives them a threefold assurance that they will be identified with God, because, one, they will have the name of God, two, they will have the name of the city of God, the new Jerusalem, and, three, they will have a new name belonging to Christ. The expression New Jerusalem is a reference to the future eternal city described in Revelation 21 and 22. Some like Trench spiritualize the city and deplore the concept that the city will actually come down from heaven. The New Jerusalem, however, will probably be just as literal as the new heaven and the new earth. Point 110 Those who, like the Philadelphia Christians, are faithful in their testimony and sure in their salvation are promised these eternal realities attending those who receive Christ as Savior and Lord. As they have been faithful in receiving grace in the present age, so they will be rewarded by God with full tokens of their salvation in eternity to come. As in the messages to the other churches, the Church of Philadelphia is given the invitation to hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. The challenge to all who hear today is to receive Jesus Christ as Savior and, having received Him, to bear a faithful witness for the Lord. This will confirm their salvation and their possession of eternal life with God. Like those in Philadelphia, they can contemplate not only present but future deliverance from this world and the enjoyment of all the privileges of eternity because of the Lord's provision. The letter to Laodicea, the church with unconscious need, 3 14 22. The seventh and concluding message to the seven churches of Asia is addressed to the angel of the church in Laodicea. This city, founded by Antiochus II in the middle of the 3rd century before Christ and named after his wife Laodicea, was situated about 40 miles southeast of Philadelphia on the road to Colossae. Under Roman rule, Laodicea had become wealthy and had a profitable business arising from the production of wool cloth. When destroyed by an earthquake about AD 60, it was able to rebuild without any outside help. Its economic sufficiency tended to lull the church to sleep spiritually and though there is mention of the church as late as the 14th century, the city as well as the church now is in complete ruins. There is no evidence that Paul ever visited the church in Laodicea, 
but it is evident that he knew some of the Christians there from his reference in Colossians 2 verse 1 where he speaks of his great conflict for the Christians both at Colossae and at Laodicea and for others whom he had not seen. Salutations are also sent to the church at Laodicea in Colossians 4 verse 15. Some believe that the epistle to the Ephesians was also sent to the Laodiceans. In any event the church had had a long history, and at the time this letter was addressed to it by Christ it was a well-established church. 3.14 And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Christ the eternal and faithful witness. As in his introduction to other churches of Asia, Christ describes himself in an unusual way as the Amen in addressing the angel of the church in Laodicea, as the best texts read, instead of the church of the Laodiceans. The frequent use of Amen, meaning so be it, is a feature of the declarations of Christ and is usually translated verily, or used as an ending to a prayer. As a title of Christ it indicates his sovereignty and the certainty of the fulfillment of his promises. As Paul wrote the Corinthians, For all the promises of God in him are yea, and in him amen, unto the glory of God by us, 2 Corinthians 1 verse 20. When Christ speaks, it is the final word, and his will is always effected. Christ is called the faithful and true witness in contrast to the church in Laodicea which was neither faithful nor true. Christ had been earlier introduced as the faithful witness in 1 colon 5 and as he that is true in 3 colon 7. The fact that Christ is both a faithful and a true witness gives special solemnity to the words which follow. Finally, he is described as the beginning of the creation of God. As the beginning, gr, Archie, he is not the first of creation but he is before all creation. As Alfred observes, Archie out of this context could possibly mean that Christ is the first created being, see Genesis 49 verse 3, Deuteronomy 21 verse 17 and PROV 8 colon 22, 111 While Arians took it this way, the whole context of Revelation indicates that Christ is God the Creator rather than a created being. As Alfred states, in him the whole creation of God is begun and conditioned, he is its source and primary fountainhead, 112. No doubt the Laodiceans were familiar with the letter to Colossae which must have been in their possession for at least a generation. Their Christ is described as the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, Colossians 1 verse 15, and as the one who was the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, Colossians 1 verse 18. In a similar way Christ declares in Revelation 21 verse 6, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. As the Laodiceans had reveled in material riches, Christ reminds them that all of these things come from him who is the Creator. 3 colon 15 16 I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot, I would thou work cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. The indictment, neither cold nor hot. With this introduction of himself, Christ addresses his message to the angel of the church in Laodicea without a word of commendation and with the most scathing rebuke to be found in any of the seven letters. The letter is first of all addressed to the angel or minister of the church. Because of the mention of Archippus in Colossians 4 verse 17, some have suggested that Archippus may have been the angel or minister of the church in Laodicea. Paul had strictly charged Archippus, Take heed to the ministry which thou hast received of the Lord, that thou fulfill it, Colossians 4 verse 17. In verse 15 he had sent greetings to the church in Laodicea and stated in the following verse that the Colossians should also read a letter they would receive from the Laodiceans. Though it cannot be determined whether this is a letter now lost or a reference to the epistle to the Ephesians, there seems to be concern on the part of the Apostle Paul even at that time for the spiritual state of the church at Laodicea. It is improbable that Archippus was still pastor of the church, However, as thirty years or more had elapsed since the epistle to the Colossians was written. The state of the church, however, may well have stemmed from faulty ministry and leadership on the part of Archippus whether or not he was still pastor. The difficulty seems to be that the church was lukewarm rather than cold or hot. The word translated lukewarm, gr, kliaros, is used only here in the New Testament and refers to tepid water. It is obvious that in this portion of Scripture Christ is referring to three different spiritual states which may be enumerated respectively as a state of coldness, a state of warmth or fervor, and a state of lukewarmness. 
Christ had reference to the fact that many in the world are cold to the things of Christ, that is, the gospel leaves them totally unmoved and arouses no interest or spiritual fervor. Such were many who were later won to the gospel, but in their prior cold state they had no evidence of grace or of salvation. By contrast those who are described as hot are those who show genuine spiritual fervor and leave no question as to the presence of eternal life, the sanctifying power and presence of the Holy Spirit, and a fervent testimony manifesting to all that they are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. The normal transition is from a state of coldness to a state of spiritual warmth and is manifested in the experience of many prominent servants of God. The Apostle Paul himself at one time was cold toward Christ and bitter in his persecution of Christians, but once he met Christ on the Damascus Road, the opposition and lack of interest were immediately dissolved and replaced by the fervent heat of a flaming testimony for the Lord. The one whom he former, why persecuted then became an object of such affection that he would cheerfully die for Christ's name. Similarly Moses in the Old Testament, though not always identified with his people Israel, when faced with a choice of either going the way of the Egyptians or the way of the people of God, according to the scriptures chose to suffer affliction with his people rather than to enjoy the pleasures of Egypt for a brief season. It is obvious that he also manifested fervency in a real work for God. Such has been the pattern also of countless souls who have been won from spiritual deadness and coldness to fervency of Christian testimony. The third state, that of lukewarmness, is what characterized the church in Laodicea. This state refers to those who have manifested some interest in the things of God. They may be professing Christians who attend church but have fallen far short of a true testimony for Christ and whose attitude and actions raise questions concerning the reality of their spiritual life. They have been touched by the gospel, but it is not clear whether they really belong to Christ. Such was the case of the messenger of the church at Laodicea, as well as his congregation. Trench comments that Jeremy Taylor, in his Sermon of Lukewarmness and Zeal, urges well that it is the lukewarm not as a transitional, but as a final state, which is thus the object of the Lord's abhorrence. Trench cites Taylor as saying, in feasts or sacrifices the ancients did use apanir frigidam or calidam, Sometimes they drank hot drink, sometimes they poured cold upon their gravies or their wines, but no services of tables or altars were ever lukewarm. 113. To the angel of the church in Laodicea Christ therefore addresses this sharp word of rebuke. Both the messenger and the church are neither cold nor hot. They can hardly be classified with the worldly who are totally unconcerned about the things of Christ nor with those who unmistakably bear a true testimony for the Lord. This intermediate state of lukewarmness is the occasion for the extreme statement which Christ makes that he will spew them out of his mouth. Ramsey comments on the state of the church at Laodicea as follows. The ordinary historian would probably not condemn the spirit of Laodicea so strenuously as St. John did. In the tendency of the Laodiceans toward a policy of compromise, he would probably see a tendency toward toleration and allowance, which indicated a certain sound practical sense and showed that the various constituents of the population of Laodicea were well mixed and evenly balanced. 114. It is apparent that there is something about the intermediate state of being lukewarm that is utterly obnoxious to God. Far more hopeful is the state of one who has been untouched by the gospel and makes no pretense of putting his trust in Christ than the one who makes some profession but by his life illustrates that he has not really honored the Christ whose gospel he has heard and professed. There is no one farther from the truth in Christ than died one who makes an idle profession without real faith. The church at Laodicea constitutes a sad picture of much of the professing church in the world throughout the history of the Christian era and serves as an illustration of those who participate in the outer religious worship without the inner reality. How many have outwardly conformed to requirements of the church without a true state of being born again into the family of God? How many church members are far from God yet by their membership in the professing church have satisfied their own hearts and have been lulled into a sense of false security? In the history of the human race no one has been harder to reach for Christ than the religionist, the one who is quite satisfied with the measure of his devotion to God and with the items which to him represent religion. Far easier to win are the harlots and publicans than the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Especially sad is the fact that in the church at Laodicea the minister or angel of the church is here described as lukewarm. 
The indifference embodied in the term lukewarm in this passage seems to extend to their conviction respecting the central doctrines of the Christian faith, such as the necessity of the new birth and the need for a dramatic change in life and perspective required of a true Christian. If those who are shepherds of the flock never make clear the necessity of the new birth and do not proclaim accurately the depravity and sin of the human heart and the divine remedy provided alone in the salvation offered by the crucified Christ, one can hardly expect the church itself to be better than those who lead it. The result is churchianity, membership in an organization without biblical Christianity and without membership in the body of Christ accompanied by the miracle of the new birth. It is remarkable, however, that in the indictment of the church in Laodicea none of the sins mentioned in the preceding churches are itemized. On the one hand there are no works which are commended, but on the other hand there is no citation of departure in doctrine or morals. Perhaps such defection did not occur, or it may have stemmed from the sin of being lukewarm. In either case the quality of being lukewarm assumes the dimension of being utterly intolerable by God. 3 colon 17 18 Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with thyself, that thou mayest see. Their Poverty in Riches the lack of spiritual perception, devotion, and faith in God manifested in the lukewarm state is revealed in the exaltation of material wealth in contrast to spiritual riches. The Laodiceans were well provided for as far as material goods were concerned, and Christ quotes the pastor representing the church as boasting, I have need of nothing. Their lack of economic needs seems to have blinded their eyes to their dire need of spiritual riches. Christ points this out by saying that they do not know that they are wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. As in the other churches, the state of the pastor is the state of the congregation. They are wretched, a term Paul uses in reference to himself in Romans 7 verse 24. They are miserable, pitiable, an expression Paul also uses in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 19 of one who does not believe in resurrection. In describing the Laodiceans as poor Christ indicates that they are extremely poor, that is, reduced to begging. In addition to those indications of their need, they are described as blind, unable to perceive spiritual things, and naked, stripped of clothes, or without proper clothes. Their spiritual condition was the exact opposite of their supposed sufficiency in temporal matters. The church at Laodicea with their unconscious need were lulled into false contentment by their temporal sufficiency. Spiritually they were in a wretched state but did not realize it. Without the real joy of the Lord, they were miserable in spite of their temporal wealth. They were poor because they were without real and eternal possessions and were lacking the eye of faith that could ascertain the true riches which endure forever. They were blind to things which could be seen only by spiritual sight, and they were naked of spiritual clothing, the righteousness which comes from God, even though they were clothed with rich garments of silk and wool. The Laodiceans are typical of the modern world, which revels in that which the natural eye can see but is untouched by the gospel and does not see beyond the veil of the material to the unseen and real eternal spiritual riches. To these who were in such unconscious need, Christ addresses a word of admonition. He could command, but instead, with a touch of irony, he offers his advice, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear and anoint thine eyes with thyself, that thou mayest see. Barclay observes that the city of Laodicea was famous for two kinds of medicine, namely, an ointment for sore ears and an eye powder for sore eyes. He states, The tephra phrygia, the eye powder of Laodicea, was world famous. It was exported in tablet form, and the tablets were ground down and applied to the eye. This Phrygian powder was held to be a sovereign remedy for weak and ailing eyes. Point 115. There is gentle irony in the exhortation for them to buy these needed spiritual things. The fact was that though they were well endowed with the riches of this earth, what they needed they could not buy. The gold of which Christ spoke was not obtainable at their bankers. There may be an allusion here to Isaiah 55 verse 1 where the invitation is given, Ho, oh, everyone that thirsteth, Come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money, come ye, buy, and eat, yeah, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. 
It is obvious that Christ is referring not to the physical items which are mentioned but to their spiritual counterparts. They were to obtain gold from Christ, that is, the true riches and, more specifically, that which corresponds to the glory of God Himself. They were to have white raiment speaking of righteousness which God provides. The merchants of Laodicea were famous for their manufacture of a certain black garment which was widely sold. They grew their own glossy black wool used in making this garment. There may be a reference to the contrast between that which the merchants could provide, a black garment, and a white garment which God alone could supply. In any case, the white garment alone would be a satisfactory covering of their nakedness before God. Christ also advises them to anoint their eyes with eye salve. In this exhortation he states that they lacked spiritual insight. In the temple of Asclepios in Laodicea there was a famous medical school. Here again there may be relevance to what the Laodiceans were accustomed to doing, that is, using medicine for eye salve, in contrast to their real need of having their spiritual eyes opened. Both pastor and people seem to have been blind to the things of God. There are few passages in Scripture more searching, more condemning, more pointed than the message to this church, and few messages are more needed by the church today, which in many respects sadly parallels the spiritual state of the church at Laodicea. 319 As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, be zealous therefore, and repent. Warning to repent. To such in the Laodicean church as would listen, Christ says, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous therefore, and repent. Obviously, this verse is not addressed to those who are still cold, those who are still out of Christ, those who make no pretense of putting their trust in Him. It is directed rather to those who profess to follow Christ and who, in some sense, may be classified as belonging to Him. These are the objects of the love of God. If they are in a lukewarm state, short of what they should be spiritually, they are the objects of the rebuke and chastening judgments of God. God is not seeking to discipline those who make no pretense of following Him but rather deals with those who claim to be His children. If by faith they have entered into the fold, even though they still fall short of a true testimony for God, they become the objects of God's divine chastening just as children are corrected by a faithful father. The exhortation is addressed to as many as I love. The word used for love is not agapau as in 2 colon 4 but rather filio, a term for affection with less depth. Those who are the objects of his affection are also the objects of his rebuke and chastening. The word translated rebuke, gr, elecho, could also be translated expose, convict, or punish. It is not simply a verbal rebuke but is effective in dealing adequately with the person who is rebuked. Such are also chastened, gr, peduo, which means to train, discipline, or educate a child. It is evident that Christ has in mind here those few in the Laodicean church who are actually born again but whose lives have taken on the same lukewarm characteristics as those about them who are merely professing Christians. The fact that they are rebuked and chastened is evidence that they are true children of God, as such a program is not addressed to those who are unsaved, cf Hebrews 12 verses 3-15. Though the state of lukewarmness should never exist in those who have believed in Christ, Christians are often indistinguishable from those who are merely making an idle profession. God, however, knows the difference. Those who are truly His are the objects of His chastening judgment. The Scriptures faithfully warn us as in the words of Paul to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 11 verses 31-32, For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. In other words, the true believer has an alternative. If he will judge himself and put away his sin, God will not be required in that case to bring chastening judgment upon him. If he will not judge himself, however, it is clear that God will undertake to deal with him. As Darby observes, The immediate occasion, object, inner spring of all the terrible judgment which is coming, is the professing church itself. It ought to have been God's witness on the earth, Christ's epistle known and read of all men, but, having become corrupt, it is this professing church that primarily and definitely brings down the wrath of God. Point 116. 3.20-22 Behold, I stand at the door, and knock, if any man hear my voice, and open the door, I will come into him, and will sup with him, and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, 
even as I also overcame, and am set down with my Father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Invitation and Promise Having concluded the messages to the seven churches culminating in the message to the church at Laodicea, the invitation becomes a personal one to all who will hear the words of warning. The prophetic foreshadowing provided in the seven churches as representative of churches found throughout the entire history of the church has special application in connection with the church at Laodicea. Under this point of view the state of this church is typical of the church of the last days and is therefore an exhortation to self-judgment and dedication to the will of God especially appropriate for consideration in modern days. To all who will hear, Christ gives the invitation contained in verse 20. Christ is represented in relation to the church as well as to the individual as standing outside the door and awaiting an invitation to come in. This is, of course, true of any local professing church. Christ must be invited to come in and become the center of worship, adoration, and love, but it is also true of the heart of man. In this present age God does not force himself upon anyone. No one is saved against his will. No one is compelled to obedience who wants to be rebellious. The gracious invitation is extended, however, that if one opens the door, the door of faith, the door of worship, the door of love, Christ will come in and, having come in, will sup or dine with the one who thus permits him to enter. Morgan observes. The only cure for lukewarmness is the readmission of the excluded Christ. Apostasy must be confronted with his fidelity, looseness with conviction born of his authority, poverty with the fact of his wealth, frost with the mighty fire of his enthusiasm, and death with the life divine that is in his gift. There is no other cure for the loneliness of heaven, for the malady of the world, for the lukewarmness of the church than the readmitted Christ. Point 117. Some like Sweet consider the picture here to be eschatological. To them the opening of the door represents the joyful response of the church to Christ's last call, that is, his second coming. Contrast to this is afforded in Matthew 25 minutes and 10.118 seconds it is hardly true, however, that at his second coming Christ will knock at the door and invite men to let him in. The picture here seems more applicable to the present, when Christ remains on the outside unless he is welcomed. Some have found in this imagery a parallel to the scene in the Song of Solomon chapter 5 where the bridegroom stands outside the door and knocks in the middle of the night attempting to awaken the bride within to open the door and permit him to enter. A similar idea is found in Luke 12 verses 35 to 36 in connection with the second coming of Christ, let your loins be girded about, and your lights burning, and ye yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord, when he will return from the wedding, that when he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately. The point in all these illustrations is that Christ does not force himself upon any but awaits the human decision relative to the recognition of his person and the blessings that will come if he be admitted. What blessed condescension is revealed here in the attitude of God, the infinite creator and sovereign, who awaits the decision of his creature who is so unworthy of the least of divine blessing. The attitude of Christ throughout the present age is one of knocking at the door, waiting for men to decide to receive him. The day will come when this attitude will be changed. He will come in power and glory, leading the armies of heaven, no longer awaiting the decision of men, but then, by his own power and majesty, he will take control, judging those who did not invite him to come in and rewarding those who opened the door and received him unto themselves. The scriptures do not enlarge upon what constitutes the fellowship except that the word used for sup indicates that it is the main meal of the day, the one to which an honored guest would be invited. The significant thing is that the one who invites him in will sit down at the same table with him and partake of the same food. This undoubtedly represents things that are of mutual interest, the things of God, the things of salvation, the things of our hope, the present sustaining grace of God, and the blessings of God provided through salvation in Christ. Christ is to become the center of our fellowship and that upon which we feed. How rich is this feast, how representative of that fellowship which will be ours throughout all eternity to come. In keeping with the promises given to the overcomers in the other churches, the promise is made to the Laodicean church to sit with me in my throne. This promise like the others is not granted to those who are especially spiritual within the church but rather to all who are genuine Christians who overcome by faith and are victorious over the world, 1 John 5 verse 4.
to such as the promise granted that they will sit with Christ in his throne. What amazing condescension! To those who previously came under the condemnation of being lukewarm to such an extent that they were in danger of being spurred out of the mouth of Christ the promise is now given that they will share his glory. It is obvious that this hinges upon their separation from the lukewarm stale and their manifestation of true devotion to Christ. In this portion of Scripture as elsewhere in the New Testament, the present position of Christ is contrasted to his future millennial reign. Now Christ is sharing the Father's throne in glory, and this forms the basis of his promise to the overcomer. The day will come, however, when he will establish his own throne on the earth, Matt 25 31, which will be the fulfillment of the predicted throne of David, subject of Old Testament prophecy. Then he will rule with power and glory not only over the nation Israel but over all nations. In that future time when his sovereignty will be manifested to the entire world, those who put then trust in him will reign with him as his bride and consort, as the ones who have identified themselves with Christ in this present age of grace. In the church at Laodicea there was so much that was obnoxious to God and so little that was commendable. Yet Christ extended his personal invitation to them even as he extends to all who will receive it today. This invitation involves recognizing him as Savior and Lord and entering fully into the blessings of the Christian life. As in the messages to the other churches, the message to the church at Laodicea concludes with He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Taken as a whole the messages to the seven churches of Asia constitute a comprehensive warning from Christ himself as embodied in the exhortations to each of the churches. There is warning to the churches of today to hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. The church at Ephesus represents the danger of losing our first love, 2 4, that fresh ardor and devotion to Christ which characterized the early church. The church at Smyrna representing the danger of fear of suffering was exhorted, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer, 2.10. In a modern day when persecution of the saints has been revived, the church may well heed the exhortation fear not. The church at Pergamos illustrates the constant danger of doctrinal compromise, 2.14-15, often the first step toward complete defection. Would that the modern church which has forsaken so many fundamentals of biblical faith would heed the warning. The church at Thyatira is a monument to the danger of moral compromise, 2.20. The church today may well take heed to the departure from moral standards which has invaded the church itself. The church at Sardis is a warning against the danger of spiritual deadness, 3.1-2, of orthodoxy without life, of mere outward appearance, of being, like the Pharisees, whited sepulchres. The church at Philadelphia, commended by our Lord, is nevertheless warned against the danger of not holding fast, 3.11, and exhorted to keep the word of my patience, to maintain the little strength that they did have and to wait for their coming Lord. The final message to the church at Laodicea is the crowning indictment, a warning against the danger of lukewarmness, 3.15-16, of self-sufficiency, of being unconscious of desperate spiritual need. To contemporary churches each of these messages is amazingly relevant and pointed in its searching analysis of what our Lord sees as he stands in the midst of the lampstands. The present age is an age of grace, an age in which God is testifying concerning Christ and his work, an age in which those who wish to hear may receive Christ and be saved. The invitation given long ago to the seven churches of Asia to hear what the Spirit says is extended to men today. A loving God would have men hear and believe, turn from their idols of sin and self, and look in faith to the Son of God, who loved them and gave himself for them. The Invitation from Heaven, for, colon 1. For, colon 1 After this I looked, and, behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will shew thee things which must be hereafter. Beginning with chapter 4, the third major section of the book of Revelation is introduced following the divinely inspired outline of 119 and fulfilling the promise of revelation of the things which shall be hereafter. Bleak, almost a century ago, stated the futurist view of Revelation beginning in 4 colon 1 much in the fashion of contemporary futurists. Point 119 This section is in contrast to what John saw in chapter 1, his vision of the glorified Christ described in the clause, the things which thou hast seen, and in contrast to the revelation of chapters 2 and 3, messages to the seven churches designated as the things which are. 
Beginning in Chapter 4, things to come are unfolded which have to do with the consummation of the age. The concept that the Book of Revelation beginning with 4 colon 1 is future, from the standpoint of the 20th century, is a broad conclusion growing out of the lack of correspondence of these prophecies to anything that has been fulfilled. A normal interpretation of this section which understands these prophecies as literal events would require that they be viewed as future. The futuristic concept is supported by the similarity of the expression in 119, the things which shall be hereafter, gr, hamel genes time meta tauda, to the clause in 4, colon 1, things which must be hereafter, gr, had de genes time meta tauda. Chapters 4 and 5 are the introduction and background of the tremendous sweep of prophetic events predicted in the rest of the book. If chapter 4 and succeeding chapters relate to the future, they provide an important clue concerning the interpretation of the vision and the prophetic events which unfold in those chapters. One of the principal reasons for confusion in the study of the book of Revelation has been the failure to grasp this point. If Revelation has no chronological structure and is merely a symbolic presentation of moral truth, its prophetic significance is reduced to a minimum. If, as others hold, the predictions of this section of Revelation are already fulfilled in the early persecution of the Church, it also robs the book of any prophecy of the future. Point 120 For discussion of the various systems of interpretation of the book of Revelation, see the introduction. A literal interpretation of the prophecies beginning in chapter 4 is not fulfilled in any historic event and must therefore be regarded from the futuristic viewpoint if it is indeed valid prophecy. The events anticipated in the angel's promise to shoot the things which must be hereafter, for colon 1, should be regarded as a prediction of events which shall occur at the end of the age. C. A. Blanchard summarized the futuristic position in these words. What will follow the church age? Evidently in some form or other the time of the tribulation. Why must the time of tribulation follow the church age? Because when the church has been withdrawn, while Satan, godless governments and Christless religions remain in the world there must be tribulation, and such a time of tribulation as the world has never known in the mixed state which has been from the beginning until now. From the fourth chapter through the nineteenth, speaking generally, there seems to be an account of this time of trouble. Point one twenty one. The expression, after this, gr, meta tauda, with which verse 1 begins, identifies the revelation as subsequent to that of chapters 2 and 3. John, having been the channel of revelation to the seven churches existing in the first century, now is being introduced to a new field of prophecy. As he beheld, he saw a door opened into the very presence of God in heaven. The reference to heaven is not to the atmospheric heavens nor to the starry heavens, but to that which is beyond the natural eye which the best of telescopes cannot reveal. This is the third heaven, the immediate presence of God. John also hears a voice described as the first voice which I heard, that is, a reference to the same voice he heard in Revelation 1 verse 10 and following. It is described as the voice of a trumpet, cf. 1.10, and he understands it to say, Come up hither, and I will shew thee things which must be hereafter. The command does not anticipate any self-effort on the part of John to enter heaven, but is rather an announcement of the purpose of God to show him that which will be hereafter or, better translated, that which will be after these things. The implication is that the prophecies now to be unfolded will occur after the events of the present age. The invitation to John to come up hither is so similar to that which the church anticipates at the rapture that many have connected the two expressions. It is clear from the context that this is not an explicit reference to the rapture of the church, as John was not actually translated, in fact he was still in his natural body on the island of Patmos. He was translated into scenes of heaven only temporarily. Though there is no authority for connecting the rapture with this expression, there does seem to be a typical representation of the order of events, namely, the church age first, then the rapture, then the church in heaven. Though the rapture is mentioned in letters to two of the churches, cf. 225, 311, the rapture as a doctrine is not a part of the prophetic foreview of the book of Revelation. This is in keeping with the fact that the book as a whole is not occupied primarily with God's program for the church. Instead, the primary objective is to portray the events leading up to and climaxing in the second coming of Christ and the prophetic kingdom and the eternal state which ultimately will follow. 
From a practical standpoint, however, the rapture may be viewed as having already occurred in the scheme of God before the events of chapter 4 and following chapters of Revelation unfold. The word church, so prominent in chapters 2 and 3, does not occur again until 2216, though the church is undoubtedly in view as the wife of the Lamb in Revelation 19 verse 7. She is not a participant in the scenes of the tribulation which form the major content of the book of Revelation. The familiar phrase what the Spirit saith unto the church is found in 2 colon 7, 11, 17, 29, 3 colon 6, 13, 22 is significantly absent in 13 colon 9. It seems that the church as the body of Christ is out of the picture, and saints who come to know the Lord in this period are described as saved Israelites or saved Gentiles, never by terms which are characteristic of the church, the body of Christ. Saints mentioned from this point on do not lose their racial background as is commonly done in referring to the church where Jew and Gentile are one in Christ. At the beginning of chapter 4, then, the church may be considered as in heaven and not related to events which will take place on the earth in preparation for Christ's return in power and glory. The viewing of God's throne, for, colon 2-3. For colon 2-3, And immediately I was in the Spirit, and, behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he that sat was to lock upon like a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne, in sight like unto an emerald. From the beginning of verse 2 John finds himself in heaven in the Spirit in much the same way as he indicated in one ten. only this time his location is changed though actually on the Isle of Patmos, he is experiencing being in the presence of God and seeing these glorious visions. The first object which appears to his startled eyes is a throne in heaven with one sitting upon it. The primary impression received by John is that of color, and he describes the presence of the one on the throne as like a jasper and a sardine stone. The sight of a rainbow around the throne, like an emerald, further enriches the color scheme. Without reference to other portions of Scripture, this verse would be more or less meaningless except as a general expression of the glory of God. The details furnished, however, though not explained by John, undoubtedly have a deep significance. It is first of all important to note that this is a throne in heaven, a reminder of the sovereignty of God who is far removed from the petty struggles of earthly government. Here is the true picture of the universe as being subject to the dominion of an omnipotent God. The precious stones mentioned also seem to have meaning. The jasper stone is described in chapter 21 as a precious stone which is clear like crystal, which would seem to indicate that it may be what we would today call a diamond. The sardine stone, or the sardius, is a familiar stone in color like a ruby, a beautiful red. The significance, however, goes far beyond the color. Though the clear jasper might refer to the purity of God and the sardine stone to his redemptive purpose, according to the Old Testament these stones had a relationship to the tribes of Israel. Each tribe of Israel had a representative stone, and the high priest had stones representing each of the twelve tribes of Israel on his breast when he functioned in his priestly office before the altar. This symbolized the fact that he as the high priest was representing all twelve tribes before the throne of God. Significantly, the jasper and the sardine stone are the first and last of these twelve stones, cf Exodus 28 verses 17 to 21. The jasper represented Reuben, the first of the tribes, since Reuben was the firstborn of Jacob. The sardine stone represented Benjamin, the youngest of the twelve sons of Jacob. In other words, the two stones represented the first and the last and therefore may be regarded as including all the other stones in between, that is, the whole of the covenanted people. Furthermore, the names Reuben and Benjamin have significance. The word Reuben means, behold, a son. The word Benjamin means, son of my right hand. In both cases these terms seem to have a double meaning, first, the fact that though Christ is the representative of Israel, he is also the Son of God. Like Reuben, Christ is the first begotten Son. Second, like Benjamin, Christ is also the Son of my right hand in relation to God the Father. The person whom John sees on the throne looking like a jasper and sardine stone is, therefore, God in relation to the nation Israel. 
It is of interest that these same stones are used to describe the majesty of the king of Tyrus, Ezekiel 28 verse 13, where, in a list of nine precious stones, the sardius, sardine, is mentioned first and the jasper is sixth in the list. In the description of the foundation of the New Jerusalem in Revelation 21 verses 19 to 20, the jasper is first and the sardius is sixth. The emerald is listed as eighth in Ezekiel and fourth in Revelation 21 verse 19. It is evident that these stones have a peculiar significance of glory and majesty which are characteristic of God on His throne. Coupled with the brilliant reflections of the jasper and the deep red of the sardine stone, the rainbow described as olive green like an emerald forms a rich background for the glorious scene which John beheld. The question has been raised as to the identity of the one who is on the throne. In chapter 4 it appears that he is to be identified as God the Father because Christ is represented separately as the Lamb. Alfred states that the one seated is the Eternal Father, for he that sitteth on the throne is distinguished in ch 6.16.7.10 from the Son, and in ch 4, ver. 5 from the Holy Spirit, 1.22. The difficult problem of identification has been solved in various ways. Actually, both the Father and the Son are properly on the throne as Christ himself mentioned in Revelation 3 verse 21. One explanation would have Christ on the throne in chapter 4 and the Father on the throne in chapter 5. Another point of view is that both chapters picture God the Father on the throne in the special character of the God of Israel. The seeming contradiction may also be resolved in the doctrine of the Trinity as Christ expressed it in John 14 verse 9, He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. It is significant that God is not given an anthropomorphic figure in this revelation and does not appear as a man. Apart from the fact that he is said to sit on the throne, no description is given except the colors which impress John. It is evident that the glory of God was the intent of the vision rather than an anthropomorphic representation. The twenty-four elders, for, colon, for, for, colon, for, and round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. In addition to the glory of the throne and the one who sat upon it, John's attention is next directed to twenty-four thrones upon which the twenty-four elders are seated. The term seats is properly thrones. The elders are represented as in a situation of repose, sitting on their thrones, clothed in white raiment and having on their heads crowns of gold. Considerable discussion has arisen concerning the identity of these twenty-four elders, and three principal views have been advanced. Some regard them as a representative body of all the saints of all ages. Others regard them as representative only of the Church, the body of Christ. Still a third view is that they represent an order of angels. The fact that they are a representative group, however, seems to be clear from the parallel of the Old Testament where the priesthood was represented by twenty-four orders of priests. There were actually thousands of priests in Israel's day of ascendancy under David and Solomon, but they all could not minister at the same time. Accordingly, they were divided into twenty-four orders, each of which was represented by a priest. When these priests met together, even though there were only twenty-four, they represented the whole priesthood and at the same time the whole of the nation of Israel. In a similar way, the twenty-four elders mentioned in the book of Revelation may be regarded as a representative body. The text itself does not give a specific statement concerning the identity of these elders. In chapter 5 additional information is given, and our later study of this chapter will throw further light on the problem. Some help, however, is afforded in the description given here. The elders are described as being clothed in white raiment and having on their heads crowns of gold. There are two kinds of crowns in the book of Revelation, involving two different Greek words. One is the crown of a ruler or a sovereign, gr, diadem, which is a crown of governmental authority. The other is the crown of a victor, gr, Stephanos, such as was awarded in the Greek games when a person won a race or some contest. This crown was usually made of leaves. The word here is the crown of a victor rather than that of a sovereign. It was made of gold, indicating that the elders had been rewarded for victory accomplished. 
It is significant that the passage states the twenty-four elders already have their crowns of gold as victors. If this passage is regarded as chronologically before the time of the tribulation which succeeding chapters unfold, it would seem to eliminate the angels, as at this point they have not been judged and rewarded since their judgment seems to come later. For the same reason the elders do not seem to be a proper representation of Israel, for Israel's judgment also seems to come at the end of the tribulation, not before. Only the church which is raptured before chapter 4 is properly complete in heaven and eligible for reward at the judgment seat of Christ. In that case, the crowns of gold on the heads of the twenty-four elders would be fitting at this point and would seem to confirm the idea that these may be representative of the church in glory. Alfred states, these twenty-four elders are not angels, as maintained by Rink and Hoffman, Weiss, you are full. Page 325F, as is shown, not by CH5 colon 9, as generally argued, even by Eliot, Volume 1, page 81F, see text there, but, by their white robes and crowns, the rewards of endurance, CH3 colon 5, 210, but representatives of the church, as generally understood, point 123. Alfred continues with a long discussion designed to prove that the church includes the saints of the Old Testament. Point 120 for this, of course, is not taught here but rests on other grounds. Recent New Testament scholarship has tended to abandon the traditional interpretation in favor of identification of the 24 elders as angels. Typical is the discussion of N. B. Stonehouse who dedicates a whole chapter to this in his work Paul before the Areopagus. He offers several important arguments in favor of interpreting the elders as angels. Stonehouse holds that the revised text is definitely to be preferred and that the tendency to cling to the interpretation that the elders are redeemed and translated saints is largely because this view has been considered the traditional orthodox interpretation. Stonehouse concludes, the late expositors do not appear to do justice to the implications of the current critical text which records a psalm celebrating the redemption of a diverse multitude, but which evidently ascribes the psalm to beings who are distinguished from the redeemed. Point 125. Stonehouse supports his conclusion by endeavoring to prove that Revelation 5 verse 11 does not necessarily distinguish many angels from the elders, which would imply that they are not elders, and holds that unless it is clearly otherwise stated celestial spirits should be classified as some kind of angel. While Stonehouse does as well as anyone could to support the identification of the elders as angels, it is evident that he does not have any final or conclusive proof, and the controversy cannot be resolved. Identification of the twenty-four elders should not be dogmatically held, but such evidence as there seems to point to the conclusion that they may represent the Church as the body of Christ. See Chapter 5 for further discussion. The Seven Spirits of God, for, colon, 5. For, colon, 5, and out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. The all-inspiring scene described by John in this verse is in keeping with the majesty of the throne and the dignity of the twenty-four elders. The lightnings, thunderings, and voices which proceed from the throne are prophetic of the righteous judgment of God upon a sinful world. They are similar to the thunders, lightnings, and voice of the trumpet which mark the giving of the law in Exodus 19 verse 16 and are a fitting preliminary to the awful judgments which are to follow in the great tribulation as God deals with the earth in righteousness. John's attention is also directed to seven lamps of fire which are seen burning before the throne. These are identified as the seven spirits of God mentioned earlier in 1 colon 4 and 3 colon 1. These are best understood as a representation of the Holy Spirit in a sevenfold way rather than seven individual spirits, which would require that they be understood as seven angels. Ordinarily, the Holy Spirit is not humanly visible unless embodied in some way. When the Holy Spirit descended on Christ on the occasion of his baptism, the people saw a dove descending. If it had not been for the dove, they could not have seen the Holy Spirit. In a similar way on the day of Pentecost, the coming of the Spirit would not have been visible if it had not been for the cloven tongues like as of fire, Acts 2 verse 3. The seven lamps of fire therefore are the means by which John is informed of the presence of the Holy Spirit. 
The number seven is characteristic of the perfection of the Spirit and is in keeping with the revelation of Isaiah 11 verses 2 to 3. In the heavenly scene, it may be concluded on the basis of both chapters 4 and 5 that all three persons of the Trinity are in evidence, each in his particular form of revelation. The four living creatures, for colon 6-8. For colon 6-8, and before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal, and in the midst of the throne, and round about the throne, were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And the first beast was like a lion, and the second beast like a calf, and the third beast had a face as a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was, and is, and is to come. Occupying an important part of the scene before John is a sea of glass described as like unto crystal, and in the background are for living creatures. Apart from indicating that the sea of glass is like crystal, John gives us no explanation of the meaning of this sea. As in other portions of the book of Revelation, however, John expects the reader to draw conclusions from similar scenes elsewhere in the Bible. There seems here to be an analogy or comparison to the Sea of Brass in the Tabernacle in the Old Testament or the Molten Sea in the Temple. Both were lavers, or washstands, designed for the cleansing of the priests, and contained water used for various ceremonial rites. This may represent typically the sanctifying power of the Word of God. No sure interpretation of the sea of glass may be advanced. As Alfred states, all kinds of symbolic interpretations, more or less fanciful, have been given. 126 Alfred supports this by citing a long number of complicated and conflicting interpretations. He prefers the following view. The primary reference will be to the clear ether in which the throne of God is upborn and the intent of setting the space in front of the throne will be to betoken its separation and insulation from the place where the seer stood, and indeed from all else about it. Point 127. The fact is that no explanation is given in the text. John, however, is not occupied at this point with the sea of glass, but rather with the four living creatures described as in the midst of the throne and round about the throne. He records that they are full of eyes, before and behind, and each of them has six wings. Further, each of the four beasts is to be distinguished according to verse 7. They are described respectively as like a lion, a calf, a man, and a flying eagle. Their ministry before the throne of God is that of ceaselessly ascribing holiness to the Lord. The translation beasts is quite inaccurate and should be changed to writhing ones. In the Greek, the word used is zoon, which means living ones. An entirely different word, therion, meaning a beast, such as a wild animal, is used in Revelation 13 to speak of the beast coming out of the sea. The emphasis here is on the quality of life and the attributes that relate to it. There has been much speculation concerning the identity of these living ones and the significance of their presence and ministry in this heavenly scene. As Alfred states, in inquiring after their symbolic import, we are met by the most remarkable diversity of interpretation. 128 Four important explanations are among the possibilities. Some interpret the four living creatures as representative of the attributes or qualities of God presented to John here as living entities. This is probably the best interpretation. Just as the Holy Spirit is represented by seven lamps, so the attributes of God in general are represented by the four writhing ones. The fact that the creatures are full of eyes is taken as significant of the omniscience and omnipresence of God who sees all and knows all. In a similar way, the four beasts as respectively a lion, a calf, a man, and an eagle are considered different aspects of divine majesty. All of these are supreme in their respective categories. The lion is the king of beasts and represents majesty and omnipotence. The calf or ox, representing the most important of domestic animals, signifies patience and continuous labor. Man is the greatest of all God's creatures, especially in intelligence and rational power, whereas the eagle is greatest among birds and is symbolic of sovereignty and supremacy. Comparison has also been made of the four living creatures to the four Gospels, which present Christ in four major aspects of his person. 
As the lion, he is the lion of the tribe of Judah, represented as the king of Matthew. As the calf or ox, he is the servant of Jehovah, the faithful one of Mark. As man, he is the human Jesus, presented in the Gospel of Luke, and as the eagle, he is the divine Son of God presented in the Gospel of John. Alfred thinks that this has the least to commend itself of all of the many diverse interpretations. He states, after quoting at length Victorinus who championed this view, I have cited this comment at length, to show on what fanciful and untenable ground it rests. For with perhaps the one exception of the last of the four, not one of the evangelists has any inner or substantial accordance with the character thus assigned. Point 129. In support of his objection, he points out how many commentators disagree as to what gospel is represented by each of the living ones. Scott observes that ancient rabbinical writers declared that the tribes of Israel pitched their tents and standards on the four sides of the tabernacle in the same order, namely, the tribe of Judah, a lion, the tribe of Ephraim, an ox, the tribe of Reuben, a man, the tribe of Dan, an eagle 130, cf. Numbers 2 verse 2. The fact that there are four living creatures is also noteworthy. It seems to be indicative of the relationship of God to the material universe or the world in general. Point 131 taken in general, the four living creatures are representative of God, they are, as in the case of the seven lamps, a physical embodiment of that which would be otherwise invisible to the natural eye. Point 132 to John the scene was unmistakably one of majestic revelation. An alternative explanation is that the four living creatures are angels whose function it is to bring honor and glory to God. Angels as seen in the scriptures vary widely in their appearance, and this explanation is a plausible one. Angels are frequently seen in the Bible, especially in apocalyptic books of the Bible, such as Ezekiel and Revelation. The fact that the living creatures have six wings as do the seraphim of Isaiah 6 verses 2 to 3 adds weight to the interpretation that they are angels. The living creatures in Revelation 4 and the seraphim of Isaiah 6 have a similar function in that both ascribe holiness to the Lord of hosts, cf. Isaiah 6 verse 3. The ministry of the living creatures is designed to emphasize the holiness of God and His eternity, in that according to the scripture, they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was, and is, and is to come. Their presence in the heavenly scene contributed much to the overall impression of the majesty, holiness, sovereignty, and eternity of God. The worship of the living creatures and the elders, for, colon 9-11. For colon 9-11, and when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne, who liveth for ever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne, and worship him that liveth for ever and ever, and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Though it is stated earlier that the living creatures do not rest in their ascription of holiness to God, according to verse 9, periodically they give special glory and honor and praise to God sitting on His throne. On such occasions, according to verse 10, the twenty-four elders join with them in worship and fall down before God on His throne. In their worship, they cast their victor's crowns before the throne declaring that God is worthy of glory and honor and power because all things have been created by Him and for His pleasure. The closing scene of chapter 4 brings out several important truths. It is evident that the living ones are designed to give glory, honor, and thanks to God sitting upon His throne. The emphasis of their praise is on the divine attributes and worthiness of God. The worship of the twenty-four elders has a more particular note. They not only worship and recognize these attributes of God, but support their worship by recognition of the fact that God is the sovereign creator of the universe and, as such, is sovereign over it. In other words, they recognize not only the attributes, but the works of God which reveal the attributes. Further, in casting their crowns before the throne they testified that if it had not been for God's grace, salvation, and goodness, they could not have had victory over sin and death. Here the creature honors his Maker and accepts the dictum that man necessarily must be subject to his Creator. The world today does not give such honor to the Lord God. Though men benefit from his goodness and live in a universe of his creation, they tend to neglect the worship of God. 
One of the important aims of the Book of Revelation is to trace the divine movement of history toward the goal of universal recognition of God. This purpose of God, especially as related to the Son of God, is also spelled out in Philippians 2 verses 9 to 11. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven, and things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. As if anticipating the ultimate consummation where all will recognize the exalted name of Jesus whether in heaven or hell, Revelation 4 reveals this intimate glimpse of heaven where all created beings join in a symphony of praise and give their honor and worship to the Almighty God. The worthiness of God to receive such praise is related to His sovereign right to rule as the one who sits upon the throne. The twenty-four elders bear witness to His majesty and glory, His holiness and power, and the eternity of the One which was, and is, and is to come. All creatures owe their very existence to Him as their Creator, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. Chapter 4 is a fitting introduction to that which follows in the next chapter, where the glory of Christ as Redeemer, as the Lamb that was slain, is an added reason for praise. Wise is the soul who finds in the Scriptures the revelation of such a God and who bows now in this day of grace and faith and worship before the God whom you will serve in eternity. The Seven Sealed Book in the Right Hand of God, 5 colon 1 dash 4 5 colon 1 dash 4 And I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book, and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven, nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. Chapter 5 of the Book of Revelation continues the vision of the throne of heaven given in the preceding chapter. John is now introduced to an item of central importance, namely, a book which contains the prophecy of impending events to be unfolded in the book of Revelation. The book is actually a scroll, G.R., Biblion, which is given prominence in the scene by the fact that it is in the right hand of God who is on the throne. The importance and comprehensive character of the revelation contained is indicated by the fact that the book is written on both sides of the parchment. Further, the document is made impressive by seven seals, apparently fixed on the edges of the scroll in such a way that the seals must be successively broken if the scroll is to be unrolled and read. Stauffer observes that the Roman law required a will to be sealed seven times as illustrated in the wills left by Augustus and Vespasian for their successors. Point 133. John's attention is especially directed to this book by the pronouncement of a strong angel. The adjective strong, gr, iskiros, means mighty or powerful, and hence indicates that an important angel is selected for this pronouncement. J. B. Smith comments on the strong angel as follows. The vision opens with three notes of emphasis, a strong angel, only twice more is reference made to a strong angel in the book, viz. 10.1 and 1821, Greek. The angel proclaims, not merely says. The word signifies to announce as a herald. With a loud voice denotes urgency and great concern. Who is the strong angel making the challenge? The answer is, doubtless, Gabriel, the one who ordered the closing and sealing of the book to Daniel.134. The proclamation itself is given with a loud voice, literally, a loud sound, gr, phone. The angel raises the question who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? John then records in verse 3 that no one in heaven, in earth, or under the earth was able, gr, edinato, meaning have the power or authority, to open the book. It is evident that the contents of the book are impressive in character and require the power of God for their revelation as well as for the execution of their program. John records that he wept much because no one was found worthy either to open and read or even to look upon the book. The purpose of this dramatic presentation of the seven-sealed book was to impress upon John the importance of its contents and of the revelation contained therein. The Lamb declared worthy to receive the book, 
5 colon 5 dash 7. 5 colon 5 dash 7 And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book, and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which of the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. As John weeps because in all creation no one is found worthy to open the book, one of the elders is recorded in verse 5 as telling him that he shall not keep on weeping, for one is worthy to open the book, namely, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David. The allusion to the Lion is a reference to Genesis 49 verses 9 to 10, where it is predicted that the future ruler of the earth shall come from the tribe of Judah, the Lion tribe. Reference to Christ as the root of David stems from the prophecy of Isaiah 11 verse 1, And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Cf. Isaiah 11 verse 10. It is declared that he hath prevailed, gr, in Ixen, meaning to conquer. In the Greek the verb comes first in the sentence for emphasis. Hence, translated literally, it is, Behold, he has conquered, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. His victory is such that he has the right not only to take the book, but to open it and loose the seven seals thereof. The scriptures seem to distinguish between opening the book, which would involve beginning the process of unrolling the scroll, and the complete authority to break all the seven seals successively. It implies that Christ is completely worthy and has full authority and sovereignty in respect to the contents of the seven-sealed book. With this introduction, John fixes his gaze upon one portrayed as a lamb standing in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures. The lamb is described as having been slain and then raised from the dead and as possessing seven horns and seven eyes. As J. Vernon McGee contrasts the lion and the lamb characteristics of Christ, he states that the lion character refers to his second coming, since the lion speaks of his majesty. As lion he is sovereign, as lion he is judge. The lion speaks of the government of God. The lamb character refers to his first coming, for the lamb speaks of his meekness. As lamb he is savior, as lamb he is judged. The Lamb speaks of the grace of God. Point 135 as far as the book of Revelation is concerned. However, Christ is referred to as the Lion only once, here in 5 colon 5, in contrast to the many times he is identified as the Lamb. The purpose of the use of the term Lamb seems to be to identify the glorified Christ of Revelation with Christ the Lamb of Sacrifice in his first coming. The horns seem to speak of the prerogative of a king, C.F. Dan 7.24, Revelation 13, verse 1. The seven eyes are identified as the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth, C.F. Zechariah 3, verse 9, 410. Though this may be a reference to seven angels, the preferable view is that it is another reference to the sevenfold spirit of God. The Holy Spirit was sent by Christ into the world, C.F. John 16, verse 7. Taking the contents of these verses together, the Lamb is represented as one sovereign in his own authority, omnipotent in power, and worthy as the Redeemer who died. Merrill C. Tenney says that the title Lamb stresses particularly his redemptive aspects since it is modified by the phrase as though it had been slain, 5, 6, 9, 12, 13 colon 8. Never is the exact word lamb used of Christ outside of Revelation, although a similar word meaning sacrificial lamb occurs in four passages elsewhere, John 1 verses 29 and 36, Acts 8 verse 32, 1 Peter 1 verse 19, point 136. Walter Scott observes, the term lamb occurs in the Apocalypse 28 times. The word employed signifies a diminutive animal Arnian, not Amnos, as in the Gospel, chap 129, etc. The word lion is only once applied to Christ in this book, point 137. Consummating the revelation of his person and authority is the declaration of verse 7, that he takes the book out of the right hand of the one sitting upon the throne, who is clearly God the Father. 
In the act of receiving the book from God the Father, it is made evident that judgment and power over the earth are committed to Christ the Son of God. Daniel 7 verses 13 to 14 is a parallel passage. There Daniel reveals the ultimate triumph of Christ when the kingdoms of the world are given to Christ. Daniel declares, I saw in the night visions, and, behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven, and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion, and glory, and a kingdom, that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. In that future day complete authority over the world will be realized by Christ, an authority which he will exercise both in the judgments which precede his second coming and in his reign for one thousand years which will follow his second advent. Once again in the book of Revelation the focus is upon Christ, the central character of the book and the one whose glory is supremely revealed in the unfolding pages of its prophecies. The living creatures and the elders worshipping the Lamb, 5 colon 8 dash 10. 5 colon 8 dash 10, and when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book, and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain, and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred, and tongue, and people, and nation, and hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. The importance and significance of the scene which John saw in heaven are recognized on the part of the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders. By their obeisance and worship of the Lamb as recorded in verse 8 it should be clear that the Lamb is not merely a prophet or an exalted angel but none other than the Lord Jesus Christ in all the majesty of deity, even though portrayed in his sacrificial role as the Lamb who died on the cross. In connection with their worship of the Lamb, it is mentioned that the creatures and the elders have harps which are symbols and instruments of divine worship, and that they possess and pour out golden vials full of odors which are declared to be the prayers of the saints. The same Lamb of God who suffered the abuse of the soldiers and the scoffing of the crowd as well as the agony on the cross is here being given his rightful worship. Apart from the trumpet, the harp, lyre, is the only instrument mentioned in heavenly worship and was employed commonly in the worship of the Old Testament. There is no direct statement that they are played on this occasion, but this is the implication. The golden vials or bowls filled with sacred perfume or incense represent the prayers of the saints according to the text. Here in heaven the importance of prayer in the earthly scene is inferred. Later in the book testimony is made to the continued witness on earth of those who trust in Christ during the time of dreadful tribulation. Their prayers are said to be a sweet incense before the throne of God. The role of the elders seems to be one of sympathetic presentation, not that of a mediator of earthly prayers. The symbolism of bowls of incense representing the prayers of the saints is reflected in Psalm 141 verse 2 where David cried to the Lord, Let my prayer be set forth before thee as incense, and the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Along with their worship and the use of the harps and the incense, they sing a new song in which Christ is declared to be worthy because of his work of redemption and his transformation of men into kings and priests. Bloomfield expresses the wonder that someone has not written a great oratorio on Revelation. The references to songs, trumpets, and chants provide an important aspect of the moving scene of the book of Revelation. 138 Sweet believes that the reference to kings and priests, which occurs two other times in Revelation, 1 colon 6, 20 colon 6, may have been part of an early hymn which had the line, Thou hast made us a kingdom, priests to God and our Father, and we shall reign on the earth. 139. In the comment on Revelation 4 verse 4 it was observed that there is difference of opinion as to the identity of the 24 elders. In 5 colon 9 dash 10 additional light is cast upon their character. If the text of the authorized version is correct, the 24 elders in their new song declare that God has redeemed them by his blood out of every kindred, tongue, people, and nation and has made them kings and priests. 
If the 24 elders are actually redeemed by the blood of Christ, it is clear that they could not be angels but must be redeemed men. Some ancient versions of scripture give a different rendering. In keeping with this variation in text, the song herein recorded is translated in the American Standard Version of 1901 as follows. Worthy art thou to take the book, and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain, and didst purchase unto God with thy blood men of every tribe, and tongue, and people, and nation, and madest them to be unto our God a kingdom and priests, and they reign upon the earth. If this latter rendering is the proper one, it leaves undetermined whether the twenty-four elders are men or angels. It records only that they pay tribute to the Lamb, as the one who was slain and who purchased men from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. Such a song would be worthy of angels as well as redeemed men. The fact that there is a variation in texts in this passage, however, by no means determines beyond question that the text used by the authorized version is incorrect. This is still debatable, although most textual scholars of the 20th century prefer the revised text point 140 even if the revised text is accepted, however, though it removes absolute proof of the human origin of the 24 elders, it does not constitute specific proof that they are angels. It merely leaves the matter open. In view of the fact that the twenty-four elders are pictured as having crowns of gold and clothed in white raiment, as if they are already a complete people judged and rewarded, the weight of evidence still is in favor of considering them as representatives of the church, the body of Christ. The alternative suggestion that they are angels, however, is possible. Adherents of this view point out that the crowns could be representative of government of the universe in which angels participate, cf. Colossians 1 verse 16. Probably most New Testament scholars today interpret the elders as angels. The controversy over the text should not obscure the marvelous symphony of praise that is here ascribed to the Lamb. It is declared to be a new song, that is, a song which could not have been sung prior to his redemptive act a song over and beyond an ascription of praise to his person or a recognition of his attributes. Here he is declared to have the right to rule, not simply in virtue of his deity, but in his victory over sin and death in his act of supreme redemption. The right to the book has been secured by conquering death and providing a complete sacrifice for sin. The act of redemption is declared to be worldwide in that every kindred, tongue, and nation has been redeemed and has transformed sinners who once were under the wrath of God into kings and priests who will reign with Christ on the earth. The psalm of redemption recorded in this chapter would be entirely normal for saints, but would be rather unusual if the angels were involved. Nowhere else in the Bible are angels pictured as singing since sin entered the world. In the early joy of creation before it was spoiled by sin, Job refers to the time when the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy, Job 38 verse 7. The morning stars here are commonly identified with the angels. Since Adam's sin, however, there is no further record of angels singing. On the occasion of the birth of Christ, the angels praised God, but this seems to have been a recital of words of praise, not given in the form of a song. The fact of the wonderful redemption that is in Christ Jesus by which sinners of all kindreds, tribes, and nations can be redeemed and enter into the blessing of saints is the occasion for the new song of redemption, and whether sung by men or angels it is a worthy ascription of praise and worship addressed to the Lamb of God. The peculiar purpose of God for his church is intimated in verse 10 of the authorized version in that the 24 elders are declared to be kings and priests who shall reign on earth. Here again it is more natural to refer this to men than to angels. The peculiar privileges of the church are clearly indicated. The church is a priesthood rather than having a priesthood and is a royal family rather than merely being ruled by a king. The members will not be so much subjects of the kingdom as they will be reigning with Christ on the earth. Here again is intimated the purpose of God to consummate and fulfill the prophecies of an earthly kingdom in which Christ will reign as King of kings and Lord of lords. The phrase on the earth is significant as referring to the earthly millennial reign of Christ in which the church will participate. The Greek preposition ap is properly translated on or upon. 
In this glorious earthly scene to follow the dark hour of the tribulation, the church will share the glory of Christ as joint heirs with Christ and sharers of his sovereign rule. The Worship of the Angels, 5 colon 11 dash 12 5 colon 11 dash 12 And I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beasts and the elders, and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand, and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power, and riches, and wisdom, and strength, and honor, and glory, and blessing. John introduces the exaltation of the Lamb in verse 11 with the familiar words, And I beheld, and I heard. Forty-four times in the book he declares that he beheld or saw something and twenty-seven times he declares, I heard. The tremendous scene left a lasting impression upon John. In concentric circles with the Lamb in the center surrounded by the living creatures and the twenty-four elders, the angelic hosts are seen on every side numbering ten thousand times ten thousand, an innumerable throng in one mighty symphony of praise. They joined in saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power, and riches, and wisdom, and strength, and honor, and glory, and blessing. The sevenfold attributes ascribed to the Lamb sum up their worship and adoration. This great chorus of praise is a prelude to the mighty scenes which will unfold, when in succeeding chapters, the seven-sealed book is unrolled. The twenty-four elders sing, and the angels chant their praise in this impressive scene. The Worship of All Creation, 5 colon 13 dash 14 5 colon 13 dash 14 And every creature which is in heaven, and on the earth, and under the earth, and such as are in the sea, and all that are in them, heard I saying, Blessing, and honor, and glory, and power, be unto him that sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb for ever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth for ever and ever. To this mighty chorus in heaven is added the praise of every creature on earth and under the earth and in the sea. John hears them all joining in blessing and praise to the one on the throne and to the Lamb. Climaxing the scene of worship, the four living creatures pronounce their Amen, and the twenty-four elders once again fall down and worship. The closing expression of verse 14, that liveth for ever and ever, is omitted in some manuscripts, but the reference is clear in any case. With this tremendous awesome introduction, the ground is laid for the unfolding revelation beginning in chapter 6, when the scene shifts once again from heaven to the earth. The beauty and wonder of the scene in chapter 5 are in startling contrast to the dark clouds of divine judgment portrayed as falling upon the earth in the tribulation as revealed in the chapters which follow. The scenes of earth are always dark in comparison to the glory of heaven. The Christian engulfed by temptation, persecution, and trial can take heart in the fact that our Lord also suffered and was tried, and that he in triumph ascended on high having completed his earthly work. Those who follow in his steps while in the world may endure many afflictions, but they are assured that they will share with the Lord his glory and his grace throughout all eternity. The scene of chapter 5 can be considered as prophetic of future events in which the church of Jesus Christ bearing witness in the world today will be in the presence of the Lord in heaven. Those who have received Jesus Christ as Savior and who have entered into the blessings of His redemptive work will be numbered among the tens of thousands pictured in chapter 5 as giving their worship and praise to the Savior. That which John contemplated in prophetic vision will be an actual part of the future experience of the saints of God as they wait with Christ for the consummating events of the age and the establishment of His kingdom. With the introduction provided in chapters 4 and 5 which give us the heavenly side of the picture, the narrative in John's vision now turns to the earth in chapter 6. The same Lord and Redeemer who is the object of worship and praise on the part of the saints is also the righteous judge of the wicked earth and the one by whose authority the terrible events of the tribulation unfold. In the light of these future events, how important is the decision that faces every human soul? Today is the day of grace as the scriptures make plain. 
Those who hear and respond to the divine invitation have the promise of blessing throughout eternity and deliverance from the time of judgment which will fall upon those who neglect to enter into the safety of salvation in their day of opportunity. For many Christians heaven is an unreal place. Even Christians tend to be occupied too much with the things of this present world, which can be seen and touched and felt. Too often goals in life have little to do with eternity's values. Though to the ordinary Christian the privilege of a vision of heaven such as was given the Apostle John and the Apostle Paul is seldom granted, what they saw has been plainly written in the Word of God, and we can see through their eyes the glorious picture of the majesty which surrounds the Lord in heaven. By comparison to the heavenly scene, earth is revealed to be temporary and transitory, and its glory and glitter are tarnished. As far as the heavens are above the earth, so far the glory of heaven transcends what the natural eye can see in this world. Revelation puts earth and heaven in proper perspective, the scenes of earth ending in the tragic denouement of the great tribulation, and the scenes of heaven fulfilled both in the millennial glory and in the eternal state. The true occupation of the child of God should be one of praise and worship of the God of glory while awaiting the fulfillment of his prophetic word.